uh, with us as we follow uh, every moment of uh, the latest uh, details coming out of the uh, courtroom. Alex, you were actually saying right before the break that the uh, Arbery uh, parents are there, but no one from the McMichael camp, and you're seeing a lot less people in the courtroom today. That's right, Kira. So we knew that today, uh, with the jury not being here, there's not as much uh, energy around the courthouse today, not hearing testimony. But look, from the get-go, the parents of Ahmaud Arbery, Wanda Cooper Jones, also Marcus Arbery, have been invested. And even on a day like today, where you have this charge conference and all the talk is very technical. We were talking about earlier how they're arguing over conjunctions, right, and, 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 and how that can impact a trial. Uh, Wanda Cooper Jones is inside and taking all of this in. She's been uh, very, very uh, invested uh, throughout this entire trial, from the graphic images to the language uh, now being discussed by by attorneys in this case. Uh, and uh, in, in, in Marcus Arbery just, just entered. Uh, on the other side, uh, we, we have not seen uh, anyone from the Big Michael family. Uh, their bench is empty. You know, you've seen through the week those images of Lee McMichael, the mother of Travis McMichael, the wife of Gregory McMichael, two of the defendants, uh, usually sitting just a matter of feet, if not inches away from Wanda Cooper Jones in that pew right before uh, the, the the Arbery pew in the, in, in the back of that courtroom. And so, you know, that, that dynamic is not playing out today. Uh, and also outside of the courtroom, things have died down considerably. Uh, after yesterday, we saw that swell of hundreds of black clergy who descended upon Brunswick to show their support specifically for the Arbery family. Lots of prayer circles, lots of vigils. They held a march, rallies, uh, and, and also had fellowship. Uh, but all of that's sort of dissipated uh, now Friday heading into this weekend. Uh, Shauna, let me get you to respond to something that civil rights attorney Lee Merritt uh, came out and said today. He says that the prosecutors will make, quote, strong push, a strong push, uh, that defendants shouldn't be charged on a citizen's arrest defense, that they haven't established it in order to establish a citizen's arrest defense. You have to establish that you witnessed a crime or were in the immediate knowledge of a crime. Uh, and Merritt saying that he believes there's now going to be a huge debate uh, over this about whether or not the jury will be instructed on citizen's arrest defense. What do you think? So it's an interesting thing because it requires that you have the, reason, the reasonable suspicion that a crime has occurred or that this person has, has done this crime. The reason the citizen's arrest portion is going to be very important is because under Georgia's law, as it was at the time of the incident, it allowed people to detain people if they reasonably believe that they just committed this crime. Now, why does that factor in so important in this particular case is because these, these charges of false imprisonment require that you detain someone or rob them of their personal liberty without having a legal basis to do so. So if they're acting under the citizen's arrest law, they had the legal basis to detain him. Now, of course, if they were not, then they were deaf. It was false imprisonment because they were detaining him against his will. So that's how this citizen's arrest law is going to factor into this, because these are almost charges that are built on one another, because they have to first prove that they were either doing this citizen's arrest, and that will determine whether or not they had the lawful right to hold Ahmad Aubrey or whether they did not. So it's a very significant point, and I think you're going to see it heavily argued. Hmm. Is it unusual that all three defendants um, are, are charged with the same nine counts? Well, it, it, seeing as this happened in concert, it's not unusual. Each person actually, you know, did a part in containing him with these vehicles. Two of them were in one vehicle. Uh, Mr. Bryant was in another vehicle. But the objective, it seemed, according to their previous statements, were to corner him and to get him into one place where he could not go. So that's typically why you see that. And you see what the state did was they covered their basis with the attempted to commit a criminal felony, which would be the false imprisonment. She charged them with false imprisonment, aggravated assault with the uh, vehicle 
vehicles as well as aggravated assault with the shotguns. If the, any of those felonies are shown to, and the jury determines that they were actually, these three men are guilty of them, that then feeds into the felony murder charges that we see. Because felony murder requires someone to have died in while you were committing this felony. So that's why those underlying felonies are also vitally important to the state's case. Alex, do you want to weigh in on the charges, your thoughts? Well, I think something that was interesting, and we were talking about uh, this, uh, whether or not the defense of uh, these defendants uh, executing a citizen's arrest, well, the prosecution really kind of drilled down on this idea of probable cause uh, with Travis McMichael during cross-examination. You heard that it was two-part, right? Uh, number one, that you had to suspect that a crime had been committed, but also that the person that you were arresting is the person who was responsible for said crime. And so I suspect that that's something that the prosecution is going to lean on heavily as to why a citizen's arrest uh, defense is not not applicable here, right? Because you see that Travis McMichael during that altercation or before the chase never actually witnessed Ahmaud Arbery uh, coming from the home. He was going off of a point from neighbor Matt Albinzi and also seeing Ahmad running by. And to him, that was that was sig signal enough, but there was also never, never the witnessing that the person that he was looking to arrest had committed some sort of, of, of crime. And something else that uh, that uh, I'd like to, to, to update you with, we talked about how we heard that there was a, a, a plea deal rejected uh, by the prosecution uh, on behalf of William Roddy Bryan, attorney Kevin Goff, trying to strike a plea deal with the prosecution. Uh, we just uh, got word, a producer confirming inside the courtroom, that uh, with Wanda Cooper Jones, that yes, in fact, she too was notified, as well as her attorney, Lee Merritt, that there was a, uh, a, a plea deal proposed uh, that has been rejected by the prosecution. What's the range of penalties that we're talking about with these charges, Shauna? Some of these charges carry lifetime. They are looking at significant time, including the lesser charges, which typically you don't see. Some of them carry a maximum of 20 years. So this is a very weighty sentence for them. And going back to those charges, Kira, I'll also highlight this, is that when we talk about this idea of citizen's arrest, we have to remember that Travis has been asserting this self-defense. I had to shoot. I was protecting myself and my father. If he was not acting underneath the citizen's arrest with that self-defense, you have to consider provocation. So now they look at the actions he took prior to the self-defense to determine if he could have provoked them. So this citizen's arrest portion is going to be vitally important to some of the underlying defenses and some of the underlying charges as well. All right, uh, uh, the character in the courtroom uh, that always seems to be making news and creating to our conversation, uh, defense attorney Kevin Goff. Let's see what he has to say now. These two cases are our side. Well, let's go ahead and take it up then. Um, let's uh, get back to the charge in just a moment. I didn't realize I had no motion for mistrial, uh, which needs to be addressed on a timely basis. So if this is the first time I become aware of it. I'll go ahead and see Mr. Goff what you have. Your Honor, we cited Moore v. Dempsey and Frank v. Mangra. Uh, their cases cited a footnote in the Muslim Dean case, uh, but we're filing this motion for mistrial based on inherent prejudice in the proceedings in the case. Uh, I have recounted, uh, incorporated in all the previous issues that have been brought to the court's attention. I have added uh, information, I believe, since the last time we addressed the court on the related motion. Uh, and I have also added in a couple more articles uh, relevant to this matter, and I have attached the photograph that I took yesterday. I think that's exhibit one uh, of what the demonstration looks like, looked like yesterday on the lunch break uh, from the, the steps at the top of the foyer to this courtroom. Uh, <coughs> And you can see, Your Honor, that not only uh, are the, the individuals participating in this event well within the, the First Amendment perimeter that we had requested at the beginning of the trial, they're well within what I understood to be the court's parameters for that. Uh, you can see speakers 
I can't identify them from behind and their views obstructed, but they are the speakers at yesterday's event who are apparently some several well-known nationally revered figures in our country, speaking literally at the front door, at, I would guess five to eight feet, probably seven to eight feet beyond the front door to this courthouse. Uh, I, I see what looks like a microphone stand in between them. Uh, they are literally, uh, you can see the gentleman to the, the rightmost gentleman is literally standing next to the pillar of the courthouse, Your Honor. Uh, this is an event that is literally, literally at the courthouse door with more people than I can count outside. We have police barricades, but even the barricades themselves are ba barely go past the flagpoles. Your Honor, in, in the attached articles, it's two and three. We've got a black, we've got multiple black voters matter signs outside. We've got a t-shirt. I can't read in this picture, but I'm sure it's not, not, not flattering of, of Mr. Bryan. We have uh, another article that's attached, which has, uh, of course, we also have a bunch of folks that, here that have been referenced previously in, in this case. But in the uh, next article, we have the Black Pastors Matter sign uh, outside the courthouse in an article about the same event. We have another picture from a different angle. And again, you can see, Your Honor, that the police barricade barely goes behind the courthouse flagpole. And again, you can clearly see you've got people up on the courthouse steps during this event, literally standing. It looks like one of them's leaning against the middle courthouse pillar in this case, in, in this for this courthouse, Your Honor. And you have Pastor, and that's Exhibit 4, you have Pastor Jamal Bryant, <coughs> a revered figure uh, in, in both the, the liturgical community and the community at large, calling for a prayer wall against racism amid, amid the Arbery trial. Uh, I, I can't say that I was outside. I don't know if they completely ran around the courthouse as they intended, but clearly, again, there's a lot more going on here than ministry. This is advocacy, advocacy against our client, uh, and it's trouble. Directing your, your Honor's attention to Exhibit 5, this is a picture, which I don't know why the printer is not better than it is. It's brand new. Uh, but Your Honor can see, and I'm sure Your Honor has been seeing through the trial, the public gallery, we know that the first pew is, is cordoned off for security purposes. And then we have two other full pews or benches, and then we have a partial bench behind it. The picture is taken from the second seat on the front row of the jury box. I think it was yesterday. And it's very clear that that location, which is where juror 380 sat for much of the first week of the trial, I've lost track of where they all sit. They change from recess to recess. But it's pretty clear that pretty much everybody in the, in the jury box, which is depending on the time, nine or 10 out of the 12, have an unobstructed view of the gallery in this case. Now. You know, I have asked the court, and I understand, you know, there aren't a lot of cases on, on this issue. And the Supreme Court itself, although it's given an indication, several of the justices on the First Amendment issues, they are technically open. So it's not that I don't appreciate the struggle that the court has in dealing with all this. But we have several jurors who would seem to be subject to influence or intimidation just by the comments that were made during the jury selection process. And it's particularly, Your Honor, you know, we have, a, we have an issue with Juror 380 at this point. I don't know what to do about it. Well, I've read the motion. I've seen the facts in there. You don't need to go over it. Then I won't. Uh, but I have made it, uh, filed the motion for the record. Uh, I stand on the argument that was presented. I would ask the court to grant a mistrial of this case based on the inherent prejudice to Mr. Bryant. From the remaining defendants. Understand.
Yeah, I think what we were just discussing, Your Honor, is that the court has made us aware that you're checking in with the jurors, and you're doing that regularly. Obviously, you can't do that today. But by Monday, <clears throat> we would hope that the court would again check in with the jurors to make sure that nothing has happened over the weekend where they may have learned about this, got notified about this, and feel a certain way about it by simply reminding them to remind to, to, to talk with you should they have seen, heard, or gotten some information. And at that time, if the court reports back, then we might have something to talk about. Your Honor, on behalf of Greg McMichael, <clears throat> we take a similar position just expressed on behalf of Travis McMichael. Um, our position is that the, the First Amendment assembly of these people to say what they wish to say is nearly sacrosanct. We have no issue with it at all. Um, our concern, as just expressed, by both counsel for Mr. Travis McMichael and Ronnie Bryan is whether it is having any influence on our jury. And right now, I don't know if it has or hasn't. I, I take it that the, we're depending upon the jurors to self-report each day based on the court's instructions to them each evening. I hope that's sufficient. Uh, but if after the verdict comes in, if there is a verdict, and we find out that jurors were exposed and didn't report it, um, it could create problems then on appeal from any conviction. But right now, we don't have any facts upon which to base the motion for mistrial based on jurors being influenced by the public, uh, though it does concern us. So, the balance between their freedom to say what they wish, which we respect, and our right to a fair and impartial jur jury, uh, uninfluenced by outside forces, uh, is what's at stake here. And again, we, we just depend on the court's authority to inquire of them whether they have been exposed and influenced in any way by any of what's anything that's going on outside this courtroom. May I add one more question? Yesterday was the first day where there was, really the first and only day where there was a, a larger crowd and bullhorns. Uh, the idea that a juror could hear that during deliberations is of great concern to us. Uh, and so we are perhaps inquiring, if, and it doesn't have to be done here in open court, that the court also is aware that if those sounds could come into the courthouse that they'd be prohibited. So I'm not going to say where the jury deliberation room is uh, and because I think that just creates the possibility that um, folks could try to figure out where in the courthouse uh, would be appropriate. I will tell you that uh, whatever was going on outside yesterday, and I think you're right, yesterday was um, a significantly larger crowd than we've seen most days. Uh, I don't recall any disruption in the courtroom itself. Uh, where I was uh, for the day yesterday, uh, I did not hear what was going on. I'll make sure that we check and make sure that um, there isn't any outside influence um, that is uh, or could potentially affect the jurors during deliberations. I think that's an appropriate step, and I'll, I'll go ahead and do that uh, from the state. Thank you, Judge. We ask that you deny Mr. Goff's motion for mistrial. There's absolutely no evidence here that the jurors have been influenced in any way by the first and only larger crowd that came yesterday. Um, no evidence that they even knew it was out there. Um, no evidence that they have been intimidated or influenced in any way. Mr. Goff then says witnesses are subject to intimidation as well. Um, no evidence has been presented of the witnesses coming into this courtroom having been intimidated in any way, shape, or form. And then he brought up the court itself and intimated that the court might have been influenced by all of this. I object to that. The mischaracterization of the motion. It's on page six. Yes, I, I'm six aware. Seven. I wrote it this morning. It doesn't. It doesn't say that. It says that the concern is that people are attempting to influence 
the presiding judge. That's not saying that the judge is being influenced, but I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that when I have the last word. Your Honor, Mr. Goff is a brilliant lawyer. These briefs that he has filed are detailed, and he has filed a ton of pretrial briefs that the state has had to respond to. He is very, very smart. He is very, very calculating, and he's a good lawyer. Because on November 12th, he stood up in this courtroom, knowing full well he was on television, and made comments about Al Sharpton and then Black Pastors and Colonel Sanders, all knowing full well it was being broadcast on television. That was not ineffective assistance of counsel by any stretch of the imagination. That was strategic. He got the response he wanted because he has filed a motion a day based on a continued drumbeat of, well, see, people are coming and people are responding, but they're responding to what he did. They're responding to what he strategically, knowingly, intelligently did so that there would be a response so that he could then complain of it. That is good lawyering right there because now He's motioned for a mistrial based on something that he caused. You cannot insert reversible error into the case yourself. You can't go ahead and do something and then go, oh, well, it's reversible error when you're the one who did it. But he is attempting to go ahead and do that, which, by the way, once again, not ineffective assistance of counsel, brilliant lawyering, and we ask that you deny his motion for mistrial. Of all the things I've been called, all around the world of the last month. I don't think brilliant was any of them. But let's, let's take this up, Your Honor. <coughs> the motion was legitimate. I didn't ask for anything that wasn't done in federal court 30 years ago. <clears throat> it, it, because it was intuitively obvious then that it's a problem. It's intuitively obvious today that it's a problem, and it has been. The idea that a lawyer standing up to defend his client with appropriate motions made in a courtroom somehow can waive the client's rights by having raised the issue? That's a troubling concept, Your Honor. And, and let's be clear, this motion is not a motion to recuse. We have never filed a motion to recuse in this case. We've never even suggested that the court should do so. We've asked all the court officers in this case to disclose any basis that might arise and we assume that when we don't receive information, that there's nothing to discuss. That's not the issue. The issue is the attempt of people in the media or people using the media, particularly people that are associated with the Arbery family or their lawyers, whoever it's coming from, however it's coming, there is pressure being exerted on this on these jurors. There's pressure, consciously or unconsciously, being put on witnesses. There's pressure, conscious or unconscious, being placed on this court. That is the problem. It doesn't matter whether the jurors are being influenced. It doesn't matter whether the court is being influenced. It doesn't matter necessarily that the witnesses are being influenced. But it does raise serious questions about the propriety of the proceedings and the integrity of the process itself. It is unfortunate that this case raises in a way that maybe hasn't come up before. With the activities of third parties, now I'm not saying that the state had no role in any of the stuff that's going on in the media, friends here, the GBI from the beginning of this case, but obviously much of what's happened is the, the result of third party activity in this case, spectator activity, for lack of a better phrase. The state's fundamentally mistaken, and I think the court is not giving full credit to the argument that's being made here. Yes, if there's actual prejudice here, if the jurors are all standing up saying they can't be fair, if your honor were to say, stand up saying you couldn't be fair, if a witness were to stand up saying I can't feel like I can tell the truth, that would be actual prejudice. And we wouldn't be having this discussion. The court would, be on its own, sua sponte, be taking appropriate action to ensure the rights of, of these defendants. I have no doubt about that. The question here is inherent prejudice. That does not require any affirmative activity in the gallery. It doesn't require any affirmative statements of jurors or anybody else. The argument is that it is inherent prejudice. Now, this is not 1915. This is not 1923. There are not thousands of people outside with pitchforks in baseball bats. But I would respectfully submit to the court that this is the 21st century equivalent 
This case has been infected by things that have nothing to do with the guilt or innocence of these defendants, largely without the, 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 as far as I can tell, it's not like the state is out there during this trial giving press conferences or something, but still, third parties are influencing this case. They've been doing it from the gallery in this courtroom. They've been doing it outside. <clears throat> this is what a, a public lynching looks like in the 21st century, with all due respect. They don't have to have 10,000 people outside. They don't have to have 100,000 people outside. Perception is reality. We have, we have sealed these jurors off. We hope we have. We have sealed them off. And it doesn't matter how many people are outside. It doesn't how violent they, they appear to be. It doesn't take much. And you've got witnesses and you've got jurors who are worried about their careers and their livelihoods when this case is over. And they'll were aware of what's going on. They certainly were aware of it before they got here. They talked about it during the voir dire process. Just because they haven't put a, a gallery up, uh, uh, what do you, they haven't put a podium up outside with, with a hangman's noose on it, doesn't mean that this isn't a trial, despite the best efforts of this court. <clears throat> This isn't a trial that's been infected by mob violence of a woke left mob. And, and whether people realize that they participated in that or not, I'd like to think that the vast majority of the people outside this courthouse really have no interest in, in anything but justice. I, I want to believe that. I, from a lot of the people I know out there, I think that's true. But the perception is the reality. And the media have fed that perception and created a reality, whether it's true or not. Just like other people have created a false narrative, and the falsity of that narrative has been made very apparent through the trial of this case. That becomes the reality. This is what a mob-dominated trial looks like in the 21st century. And we're asking for the mystery. <laughs> All right, the uh, court, having heard from the move ant as well as the parties, uh, denies the motion for mistrial. Uh, I think the court's position has been accurately stated previously. I thought appropriate, given the mistrial filed, that um, we have it on the record. We're going to take a lunch break. We're going to be in recess for an hour. Thank you. Just when you thought it could not get more offensive, but no surprise, Kevin Goff again asking for a mistrial and the judge again saying, no, there's not going to be a mistrial. He cannot leave the issue of race alone out at, at, within this courthouse and outside this courthouse. You have heard Kevin Goff trial day after day after day bring race into this into this trial saying that black pastors are a threat that black pastors are intimidating uh, the jury and now he has pushed it to to just the ultimate offensive comment calling this a public lynching of the 21st century. Does he even understand what a lynching is? Let's bring in our Alex Prochet. He is outside of the courthouse. Also, Bernarda uh, Villalona. I know uh, Bernarda is going to have something to say about this. And Shauna, you too. I, 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 I can't even believe he went there, even calling a prayer wall a threat. I mean, this is this is just, he took it up another notch, Bernarda. I, I'm just, I'm astounded that he even had the nerve to call this a public lynching. Uh, uh, you Clearly, know, you're I'm, speechless. I'm speechless <laughs> because I cannot believe the amount of disrespect and racism that we just experienced coming out of the mouth of this man, an attorney, a person, a public figure that people look up to. He's in Glen County. He's part of that community. For him to have the audacity that the mere presence of a black pastor, of a black person inside of a courtroom is intimidating, is threatening, that is a shame. And that is clearly, clearly such a violation of our Constitution, just of our own aura. All of this is just so frustrating to me. And, it, oh, my God, I, I, I just can't. I'm just so disgusted and mad at the words that just came out of this man's mouth to call it a public lynching. You know, 
He is the only attorney from Brunswick. He's a local boy. I've been even seeing out on Twitter, they're calling him the Brunswick Bubba now. Uh, I mean, Shauna, it, 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 I, I don't even know where to go with this because he knows the judge is gonna deny a mistrial because he brings this up almost every single day. And then today, it, it was like it was his last hurrah, like the, 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 his last chance to get in the most offensive comments about this, uh, the, this trial and what this trial is centered upon. You know, it's already, he, he, he's already receiving backlash because hundreds and hundreds of black pastors have shown up with, by the way, he makes the sarcastic comment about black pastors matter. I mean, he, he's being sarcastic. He's throwing in, he had pictures up, trying to talk about uh, these black leaders leaning up against the, the courthouse and leaning up against the wall like they were some sort of predator waiting to pounce uh, on people uh, that were here supporting the Arbery family. I mean, Shauna, I, I really am, am astounded. You know, we've watched so many of these trials, but boy, is it just a reflection on, on, on what we're seeing here in so many different ways? I mean, I agree, Kira. This is exactly why these conversation and these national, you know, attention is being brought to these type of trials, because there are individuals of this same varietal everywhere. And I think that that is the bigger problem. The fact that as he went on and on, he started saying things again, just straight from brain to mouth, you know, it, it, it was appalling. The fact that he would even find a prayer wall threatening. I mean, even in war, clergy and religious leaders are seen as people that are exempt. They're seen as people that are neutral and to bring peace to environments. So the fact that he would even attack that on that level is mind blowing to say the very least. But let's not remember, there may be someone on that jury that feels the same way he does. Let's remember he is from this area. He may reflect some of the morale and thoughts of people in that vicinity. So all you need is a juror to say at some point in time, I felt intimidated. I felt like this was too much. I heard it. I saw it. It influenced my decision. And bam, you know, we're in trouble on appeal. So these are things that you have to look at. He's looking at as an attorney. And I think what he's doing is he's appealing to the people in that in that jury box. I don't think this is as much for the outside person as it is for his record to say that I knew that this was a problem. And I think that he's counting on one of these jurors possibly speaking up to say, yes, Yes, I feel the same way and to the judge and having that problem created. So I think that's a lot of his motivation um, for why he's saying the things he's saying. And, and deep down on some level, he must identify because if we notice anytime he gets on a roll, this is the type of words we hear, the type of verbiage we hear, the type of absolute wildly mind blowing things that come out of uh, Mr. Attorney Goss mouth. And Alex Perche, you are there outside the courthouse. You know, you you have been right there in the middle um, of these prayer vigils and these conversations and this gathering outside the courthouse. You know, Kevin Goff saying this type of advocacy against my client is troubling. Could you please put into perspective what you have seen and heard, and if it appears troubling in any way, uh, a prayer wall? a prayer vigil, a conversation, a national conversation about race. Well, first, Kira, he, he mentioned a, a prayer wall. He suggested that it was a ring that at some point surrounded the courtroom. We never saw any of that in our position yesterday at all. Uh, certainly prayer circles, uh, but nothing that, that circled this courthouse. Uh, and so, I mean, I think, I think that's, a, that's fact number one. Number two, yesterday was incredibly peaceful. And I think also, I mean, think about the, the, the folks that were coming here. It, it, was, it was an older crowd. And so, you know, he, he mentioned uh, folks leaning up against uh, some of the courthouse ra railing. Well, <laughs> yeah, maybe folks that actually kind of like needed a break or needed something to brace themselves with because it, there were a lot of, there was a lot of standing in, in and you know there, there there's not a, a lot of uh, places to sit uh, when you're, when you're at an event like that uh, yesterday. So I mean that's that's what kind of came to mind. But uh, look, the state troopers have had an incredible presence here. Uh, I got a chance to talk 
with the sheriff uh, a day ago, and he said that, look, things have been relatively peaceful, uh, and actually very peaceful, not relatively peaceful, very peaceful, and they haven't had any issues uh, and anything, any signs of concern. So, you know, whatever threat uh, that uh, Mr. Golf has has been referencing, uh, I, I we haven't witnessed anything outside and have no reason to believe that there was actually ever any sort of threat. But I, I, I do think there was something that uh, the prosecution brought up in in the rebuttal of his motion for mistrial, and that that look clearly at this point Kevin Golf has some sort of of a uh, playbook here. And he knew that he was going to be on camera when he made those initial statements about black pastors, when he misidentified Jesse Jackson, when he then made the Colonel Sanders uh, moment. And I mean, I, I, I equate this to, you know, anytime as a reporter, if you're in front of a TV lens, you know that there's somebody, whether it be in the control room in New York or whether it actually be out over the airwaves, somebody is watching you. So if you're a lawyer inside a courthouse with our courtroom that has cameras, you know that you are being broadcast and you're very aware. It's, it's always in the back of your mind. Same thing with open mics. Uh, and Kevin Golf knew what he was doing and certainly came back the next day, uh, made that apology, but then doubled down and made the, the courtside Laker comments. He knew that this was going to be the response and and as was brought up before, maybe this is his strategy at some point, maybe someone on the jury sees something and somewhere down the line says that that possibly impacted uh, their decision on this case and maybe that is his Hail Mary. But I mean, I think at this point, uh, the, his continuing to bring this up, his continuing to double down and make these types, types, these types of comments, uh, you know, it, it seems like this is very much uh, a, a strategy of his. Um, Bernarda, since you're just uh, joining us now, they I am told, I'm looking, that they are in uh, a lunch break uh, for, for about an hour. So let's just talk, Bernard, about what's next. Um, how long do these charge conferences usually go? What, what will we see happening over the weekend? And then uh, potentially what could we see if closing arguments do start on Monday? So closing arguments will definitely go forward on Monday, uh, granted that hopefully nothing happens over the weekend. So today they'll continue with the charge conference. They started early this morning, and from what I got from the charge conference, they were up to close to 25 to 30 pages of instructions to be given to the jury. The judge is going to be finishing up in terms of all the motions that defense counsels may have prior to closing arguments on Monday. They want to finish that up today, but they also want to tidy up the exact jury instruction that's going to be given to this jury because, number one, all three defense attorneys, including the prosecutor, is going to need the exact language of the jury instruction so they can prepare themselves for their closing arguments as to how to argue this. So, for example, the citizen's arrest as well as the self-defense justification. Those are two crucial instructions that both parties must be in, in, inside and out of it in terms of how do I break this down to the jury. So we'll be done today in terms of the charge conference and we'll be done in terms of the motions. And I'm sure this judge, Judge Wamsley, he's very efficient and definitely wants to start closing arguments on Monday. My understanding is that he may cap the closing argument. I believe it's two hours per counsel, but then again, he'll address that again today to let counsel know this is how long you can go on for. But we're going to expect all attorneys, especially the prosecution, they are going to bring the pain. They are going to bring the fire because these are closing arguments, unlike opening statements. They are going to argue this case. Look, not only assumptions and driveway and driveway decisions, let's see if they actually go with that. Those assumptions were based on race because neither of these three parties saw Ahmad Arbery committing any crime. What they saw is an outsider entering this neighborhood that they thought he did not belong, and they chased him, chased him to the point that they cornered him, cornered him to the point where they took him out. And that right there is a modern-day lynching. I think we just got the definition, uh, the proper definition uh, of a lynching. Um, Shauna, your thoughts? 
I agree with everything that was said. I think that what you're going to really see now is them tying this all together, right? This is the moment that they have been waiting for. The jury wants to see all these little points that the state made that the defense feel like is their case. You're going to see them pull it all together. I think the state is going to refer back very clearly to those moments. I think Travis, his testimony is going to be very key in their, their summation. The inconsistencies, all of these things, this idea that they were just going to go in and make the citizens arrest when no one mentioned it, you're going to see them highlight those points because they want the jury to walk away with a very clear, succinct idea and theory of the case that they can take into deliberation. Now, with the defense, you're going to see them highlight their, what they feel are their best points and the holes in the state's case. Because let's remember, this is a state burden. The, the, the defense has no case. They don't even have to put on a case. So this is all about the state and what they actually showed the jury. So I think you're going to see them poke holes in what they believe is the state's case. Shauna and Bernarda, Alex, thank you so much. Uh, we are going to take a quick break while they are in a lunch break, but it doesn't mean we're going to stop our conversation. You are watching ABC News Live and we will be back right in a moment. This is what being live is all about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by people no squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Let's go. Streaming straight to you anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? <laughs> I you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3. What you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. This is American history, a violent white mob, a brutal attack, 300 black Americans killed right here in America. Now, it is time to uncover Tulsa's buried truth, the gripping story brought to light in a new podcast from ABC News, available now on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. Sex, gambling, fraud, betrayal, and murder. Cutthroat Inc., the podcast. Me the a family truth. on a mission to find their son. A year's worth of conversations with the killer. Cutthroat Inc., subscribe for free now on your favorite podcast app. Assault on the Capitol, the ABC News original, exclusively on Hulu, now streaming. Now with so much on the line, more Americans are turning to David Muir and ABC's World News Tonight than any other program across all of television. The straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Good Morning America, number one in the morning, nine years running. World News Tonight with David Muir, number one in the evening with America's most watched newscast. 2020, the number one news magazine on Friday nights. Nightline, number one in late night versus the competition. The View, the number one daytime talk show. And ABC News Live, number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news. And welcome back to ABC News Live. I'm Kira Phillips. We are following the court proceedings in the trial of those three men charged in the death of Ahmad Aubrey. And just before the judge took a lunch break, we heard some pretty astonishing comments from defense attorney Kevin Goff. He represents William Roddy Bryan, the man who took the cell phone video of that fatal day. Take a listen. The argument is that it is inherent prejudice. Now, this is not 1915. This is not 1923. There are not thousands of people outside with pitchforks in baseball bats. 
But I would respectfully submit to the court that this is the 21st century equivalent. This case has been infected by things that have nothing to do with the guilt or innocence of these defendants, largely without the, the, the as far as I can tell, it's not like the state is out there during this trial giving press conferences or something, but still, third parties are influenced in this case. They've been doing it from the gallery in this courtroom. They've been doing it outside. <clears throat> this is what a, a public lynching looks like in the 21st century, with all due respect. They don't have to have 10,000 people outside. They don't have to have 100,000 people outside. Perception is reality. We have, we have sealed these jurors off. We hope we have. We have sealed them off. And it doesn't matter how many people are outside. It doesn't how violent they, they appear to be. It doesn't take much. And you've got witnesses, and you've got jurors who are worried about their careers and their livelihoods when this case is over. And they'll were aware of what's going on. They certainly were aware of it before they got here. They talked about it during the voir dire process. Just because they haven't put a, a gallery up, uh, uh, what do you, they haven't put a podium up outside with, with a hangman's noose on it, doesn't mean that this isn't a trial, despite the best efforts of this court. This isn't a trial that's been infected by mob violence of a woke left mob. And, and whether people realize that they participated in that or not, I'd like to think that the vast majority of the people outside this courthouse really have no interest in, in anything but justice. I, I want to believe that. I, from a lot of the people I know out there, I think that's true. But the perception is the reality. And the media have fed that perception and created a reality, whether it's true or not, just like other people have created a false narrative. And the falsity of that narrative has been made very apparent through the trial of this case. That becomes the reality. This is what a mob-dominated trial looks like in the 21st century. Mm. And Goff has been asking for a mistrial every day, complaining about the presence of those black pastors inside the courtroom and outside of the courthouse. And every single time, the judge has denied a mistrial. We are joined now by Rashad Robinson. He's the president of a racial justice organization, Color of Change. Mr. Robinson, so good to see you. I have to get your immediate reaction to those comments which just happened about 20 minutes ago. I wish it was surprising. I wish it was surprising that this is the strategy that's being deployed. But this is the strategy that's being deployed, um, to be clear, because it's a strategy that sometimes works, oftentimes works, because we have a system that is deep, deeply unequal. We have a set of structures that time and time again do not produce reality. The lawyer talked about uh, reality. The reality was that the defendants um, were not arrested for over two months, even though the video surfaced. We watched as the, the then district attorney tried to find all sorts of reasons not to um, press charges. We found, we watched as police and others did not hold these men accountable in the beginning. So the idea that people are watching this case closely, recognizing all of the ways that time and time again, um, our system proves itself not to be broken, but to be operating exactly the way it was designed, which is to not deliver justice um, when black people are harmed and hurt, even on video. Um, you know, his um, sort of plea, um, those words that may seem outrageous to so many of those listening are really tailored and designed to get one or two of these jurors to um, sort of raise um, um, some concern, to um, sort of um, align themselves with what he is saying. And this type of strategy um, only works because we have a system um, and we live inside of a culture in which um, racism and which which um, killing of black people is okay. So taking all that in, absorbing everything you just said and what we just witnessed in that courtroom, what we've been witnessing every day in that courtroom, specifically by defense attorney Kevin Goth, how do you think this trial will be looked upon in history? And, and how will the verdict impa impact that? Well, it's up to all of us to determine how we 
tell the story and tell the true story of this moment. Regardless of what the verdict um, produces, all of these antics in court should once again sort of help us recognize the ways in which our legal system does not produce fairness, is not designed to produce fairness, and why we have to continue to work for structural change even while we work to um, get convictions. So of course we want a conviction here, but recognizing that a conviction alone does not change the fact that the reason why there is so much news coverage of this case, the reason why there is so much attention is because of um, the fact that time, so many times before this, and so much um, uh, data points leading up to this gives us this idea that we might not actually see justice. We might not see justice delivered on something that so many of us saw with our own eyes. And so to the um, extent that um, as we sort of look forward, um, I hope that this will be continue to be a data point in the work to fight for and push for systemic change. Um, changes in how um, we actually deliver justice in this country, that we have a, a jury that is deeply unequal in this case, that we have um, other cases that are happening right now, um, like the Rittenhouse case, it also once again proves how our system is not designed to actually deliver justice and not deliver fairness. And I hope that that is one of the sort of data points that comes out of what we are all seeing here. I hope we're also um, seeing and also witnessing how there's so many other things that wrap the legal system, right? All of the ways in which we have seen the rise in white nationalism and the sort of um, um, ability for so many in power to turn their backs on this, whether it's social media companies, whether it's some politicians, and sometimes enable this in many ways, profit from it in many ways. There are so many folks um, that sort of created this hostile environment that allowed this situation to happen happen because racism is not just about the individual interactions between the defendant and the defendants in Ahmaud Arbery. It's also systemic. It's systemic in that a culture is created that made these men, that allowed these men to not only think they could do it, but then to believe that they could actually get away with it. And then for a while, almost actually be in a place to get away with it, unless there had been activism, engagement, uprising. Why is it in a situation like this that people even had to speak out? Why did we have to push back? The system did did not work on its own. And I think that's another thing that we need to take from um, all of this. As I look over your left shoulder until justice is real, you know, the impact is not just going to take place here in Georgia. It's already taking place there in Georgia, but nationally, Rashad. Absolutely, you know, and um, and the fact of the matter is, is justice isn't about a conviction. Um, that's accountability. And accountability is incredibly important, but you know, nothing will bring Ahmaud Arbery back. Nothing will bring him back to his family um, and his loved ones and his community. Um, and in and, and all of the sort of money and time and energy that's been wasted, all of the energy that is being used to have to fight for justice in this situation, the, the talent and brilliance and fight of people that could be used for other things, the sort of opportunity cost that comes with us um, having to constantly stand up in these moments, right? And then to watch, um, you know, this lawyer stand in front of this um, court and you and talk about lynching um, and to talk about lynching, which is what happened to Ahmaud Arbery, um, to talk about lynching, which is um, a deep, painful and unforgivable legacy in this country and to throw it around so casually um, because it does not hold any weight to him because it's all sort of a game um, and and to think that um, it could work um, is a recognition of you know how so much of this is just too close to call and how we all have to do the work to actually make justice real. Mm. You know, in a recent New York Times article, uh, you said when the public sees such incidents with their own eyes, it helps to form their understanding of real world harms and to strengthen the demands of civil rights movements. Such a powerful statement, Rashad. Do you think when white people see the video of Arbery being killed, that they see it the same way as black people? And I ask that, I mean, it is, 
perfect timing to, to ask that question after just seeing and what you said clearly Kevin Goff and his idea of a lynching um, is quite different from the reality of what a lynching really is. Yeah, well, I think it's important to understand that all white people are not the same, right? We, we're different um, in different ways and we have different opinions. And I think about all of the people that came out and spoke up and stood up um, in the summer of 2020 after the murder of George Floyd, the people who raised their voices and took to the streets, made demands in their workplace for racial equity, um, all sorts of things that we've seen. I think about um, the white people in a Starbucks in Philadelphia who took out their interact, took out their phone and film that police interaction because they thought something might not be right, who maybe a couple of years before might have looked at that same interaction and been like, what are those guys doing? I believe we have made so much progress um, in this country just because we have moved to sort of uh, seeing racial justice as a majoritarian issue doesn't mean our systems and our government and our structures are governed that way. It doesn't mean that we can fully deliver on all those things yet. But I think it's important to recognize that I think that there are a whole lot of white people that do not want to associate, associate themselves with the, that statement, who feel um, ashamed that it was said and feel outraged that someone could be so cavalier and so, um, you know, and say something with such, you know, um, you know, such a disregard for its impact um, and don't want to associate. And I guess to those folks, for those of us that do this work in racial justice, we want to invite more people of all races to stand up and speak out. We don't change systems by only certain communities working. And these systems that are broken right now, the systems of justice, the rise in white nationalism that we're seeing all around the country is not just hurting black and brown people, it's hurting white people, the folks that uh, Kyle Rittenhouse went out and shot on the streets were, not, were white folks. And so, you know, this level of, um, of pain that we will continue to see unless we create real accountability and new norms for all sorts of institutions that have enabled this rise from, like I said before, social media platforms, which have largely remained unaccountable and allowed these groups to um, organize on their platforms, um, district attorneys and other elected officials, police, police departments, which have allowed white nationalism to sort of thrive inside of their departments. And that's not me saying it. Those are reports coming from the FBI that is talking about the rise of white nationalism and white supremacy inside of police departments. We need more people of good faith of all races speaking up, standing up, against this and working to change the rules to create real accountability. Real accountability is the road to justice, but the road to justice is gonna require rule changes. And so I just wanna welcome and recognize that I know that there are many white people that are watching this, that are outraged by it as well, and are wondering and hoping that some level of accountability is served. And what I hope people recognize that accountability is not justice. Changing the system, making the system work fairly, making sure that black people and people of all races don't have to stand up and protest in order to make sure um, convictions are actually, convictions actually happen. That gets us closer to having a system that works. So I, I could listen to you for hours, Rashad, I have to tell you. I mean, just so, so eloquent in, in how you are guiding this conversation, um, which, which leads me to the, the makeup of this, this jury. As we know, there's only one person of color on this jury. So when you think about um, the jury delivering uh, its verdict, um, is that, are you concerned about about that verdict because of the racial makeup of the jury? I'm concerned for the racial makeup. I'm concerned because of the strategies that this uh, lawyer has, um, you know, that the defense has, uh, you know, uh, you know, moved. I am, I'm nervous because time and time again, we see situations like this where justice is not served, even when there's video, even when there's a sort of preponderance and overwhelming amount of evidence. And so, you know, I, I, I am nervous about this. And I think that 
Um, um, I think that it's, you know, something that why we're, why we're all here, why so many people are watching, why so many people are paying attention, because they recognize what we all saw, what we all know happened. And then they recognize that this thing goes into a, a system and a structure that is oftentimes not designed uh, to deliver justice. And that I think is very important for all of us to recognize that the sort of nervousness around this is absolutely something that we should be having. And we should use this nervous energy, translate this nervous energy into the work to actually change the system. What were your takeaways from the testimony, testimony of Travis McMichael uh, yesterday? Uh, and how do you think race and perception uh, factored into his actions? Well, you know, he wasn't nervous. Um, and, um, you know, and so the, the idea that they thought, that he knew that, um, you know, he could go after someone that he felt like didn't belong um, is, um, is something that, you know, black people struggle with. Um, black people struggle with, you know, I am the, um, you know, I come from a legacy of, of black folks who were enslaved in this country, who built this country for free, um, who were sharecroppers. My grandfather used to take me into the voting booth um, with him and um, ask me to pull the levers. He couldn't uh, read or write. Um, and I didn't know this till after he died. He never got an education as a, as a sharecropper. Um, I, that is right inside of, you know, the experiences that so many of us have with being inside of a country where that is full of opportunity, yet we are sent constant reminders and messages about us not belonging um, and having systems designed to constantly send us messages that we don't belong, regardless of how long we've been here, regardless of what the contributions have been to this country, none of that actually matters. And so, you know, as I listened to that testimony, as I sort of thought about the sort of underlying impacts of uh, being, um, continuing to sort of uh, watch um, and listen uh, to more and more of these stories about um, folks feeling the power and the privilege to send us messages about where we belong and where we don't belong outside of any authority, outside of any sort of system, outside of any rules is a just, it's a reminder about how unsafe we are. But I hope that um, people of all races who are watching are recognizing that this unsafety is untenable for us all in society. It makes all of us more unsafe when we can't trust our systems to deliver justice because they're not designed to deliver justice. It doesn't help any of us. And so um, we have to get out of the zero sum game around race in this country and do the work in recognizing that the more we build justice and the more oppressed people can win justice and the more we change systems, we change rules. The final thing that I think I really sort of from that um, testimony from the, you know, on the witness stand was just all the ways in which there are written rules and there are unwritten rules. There are written rules in how society is supposed to work and rules on the books. And then there are the unwritten rules. Um, and that once again goes back to belonging and power and who has rights and who doesn't and who's going to get the benefit of the doubt in our society and who doesn't get the benefit of the doubt. And once again, that does not make for a society to work, especially a democracy that is increasingly becoming multiracial. How do we actually make this work? How how do we live together and work together and do so where we can have rules and we can have systems that truly produce safety for all of us and truly produce justice for all of us? Rashad Robinson, president of Color of Change. What an honor to have you with us today. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. You bet. We'll be right back with some of the other day's top stories. Is what being live is Three all packages. about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by people no squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not them. afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Lift off. <laughs> Streaming straight to you anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us.
It was an extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed to report to prison to begin a 17-year sentence. They let him turn himself into jail with no escort. No one thought he would run. How do you evade capture for 25 years? How do you do that? Now, join the search, following the U.S. Marshals as they uncover new leads in a global manhunt. Can you help catch this fugitive? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Listen and join the all-new hunt wherever you get your podcasts. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. The ladies you love. The hottest topics happening now. There's only one place to find it all. You guys are having the hard conversations. I love The View. The most watched number one daytime talk show is The View. Now streaming on ABC News Live. Choose ABC News, America's number one news source. Is that the gun? That's not the gun. What is it? I won't ask you again then. Are you a Nazi? <laughs> the deeper you go into the black market, you put people to your life like this. The darker it gets. Why hasn't anyone come out and spoken? It's about the money, that's all we do. Kira Phillips, thank you so much for streaming with us. We have been following the trial in the death of Ahmad Aubrey. The defense rested its case yesterday in court right now. Attorneys are spending the day in what's called a charge conference where they're going over the wording they will present to the jury when they give them charging documents after closing arguments. That could begin Monday. They will use these docs to make their verdicts. We'll continue to keep you updated from there. We're also following the Kyle Rittenhouse homicide trial. It's day four of deliberations there in Kenosha, Wisconsin. The pool reporter says the courtroom clerk believes the jurors have ordered lunch. We'll bring you live coverage as soon as there's a verdict. And an early Thanksgiving blessing for House Democrats and the Biden administration. On this vote, the yeas are 220, the nays are 213, the Build Back Better bill is passed. That's right, House Dems passing the Build Back Better Act. The vote falling largely along party lines, 220 to 213. The roughly $1.75 trillion social and climate spending package generates the largest expansion to the social safety net in 50 years and includes $555 billion for climate and clean energy investments. And breaking news in the fight against COVID, the FDA authorizing Pfizer and Moderna's booster shots for all fully vaccinated adults. Now we're awaiting that final sign-off from the CDC. Vice President Kamala Harris is acting president of the United States today, at least for a short time, while President Biden is put under anesthesia for a routine colonoscopy just shy of his 79th birthday. The White House expected to release results of his physical later today. Well, athletes around the world, even the United Nations, demanding to know the whereabouts and well-being of missing Chinese tennis star Peng Shuai, who hasn't been seen in public since accusing a Chinese official of sexual assault. And the WTA even taking a bold move now, threatening to cancel events in China if they don't hear from the player. Kaylee Hartung has more for us. 
outrage growing over the disappearance of Chinese tennis star Peng Shuai. Serena Williams, just the latest in the tennis world to voice her concern, tweeting, I hope she is safe and found as soon as possible. This must be investigated and we must not stay silent. Oh, what a shot. The Grand Slam doubles champion has not been seen publicly in more than two weeks. Shuai's social media going dark after alleging she was sexually assaulted three years ago by this former high-ranking Chinese government official. He has not commented on the allegations. We've uh, been trying to reach, reach Peng since the, the day the initial allegations came forth. But to date, we've had no success in speaking to her directly. The head of the Women's Tennis Association now questioning Shuai's safety after receiving a suspicious email, supposedly from the athlete, in which she called the allegation of sexual assault not true, adding, I'm not missing, nor am I unsafe. I've just been resting at home and everything is fine. Thank you again for caring about me. I just find it very difficult to believe that woman who exhibited the courage that she did to come forth with these serious allegations against a very powerful political figure that all of a sudden has changed that tune completely, as was, was reflected in her email. And Kira, Chinese officials have been pressed for answers by foreign media, but they've repeatedly dismissed the question, saying this is not a diplomatic or a foreign affairs matter. And just yesterday, after a news conference for the Chinese foreign ministry, any mention of Shuai's name was scrubbed from that official transcript. Kira. Well, we are definitely not going to scrub her name. We'll continue talking about it. Kaylee, thank you so much. And now to our exclusive from inside the National Security Agency, the top secret arm of the Pentagon responsible for electronic spying and stopping hackers from causing mayhem. Our chief justice correspondent, Pierre Thomas, was given extraordinary access to NSA's nerve center where TV cameras have never been before. Here's a look. You're looking at one of the most sensitive and secretive rooms on the planet. This is military, civilian, contractor, this is Department of Defense, this is intelligence community, this is other agencies of our government. And unlimited reach? Unlimited. The NSA Integrated Cyber Center. ABC News is the first network ever allowed to bring cameras inside. Uh, I did want to show you just kind of the layout here. General Paul Nakasone oversees the world's most powerful electronic spy agency. This room is the nerve center of the NSA and U.S. Cyber Command, agencies supercharged with the world's most advanced spyware and most creative hackers to peer overseas into virtually anything that has wires. If you think about uh, what time means in cyberspace, the advantage goes to those that have speed and agility. We conducted our interview in what's known as the Battle Bridge, the place the general goes in a crisis. Uh, that's our floor. That's where we just were. I don't mean to be humorous, but it feels very James Bond. With cyber threats spiking, Nakasone says he's seeking to have his agencies evolve, step out of the shadows, and engage more with other federal agencies and the private sector. What we don't want to have is a failure to imagine what's happening. Who is the enemy? Nation states such as Russia and China and Iran uh, we also have a series of what we call proxies, and then clearly we have criminals. Nakasone says there are millions of attempted hacks against the military every day, and the battlefront at home is no less challenging. Welcome to Dreamport. This is uh, one of two labs that we have in the facility. The U.S. Cyber Command has developed a Dreamport facility, in part to foster innovation in hacking defense and offense. Dreamport built this miniature city to practice real-world attacks, to investigate better ways to keep us safe. Dreamport's hackers showing they can turn off city lights, cause a water park to flood, disrupt traffic lights, halt the city's ports. All of the devices that power this model city are real, actual devices that you would find out in the real world. In recent months, so-called ransomware attacks have been exploding. Schools, hospitals, even a food supply chain have been hit. Well, if you would have asked me that a year ago and said, hey, uh, Paul, what about ransomware? You know, I probably would have said something defective. That, that's really a criminal matter. It's not something we do. The general agrees that the Russian-based ransomware attack, the shutdown colonial pipeline, which is responsible for 45% of the East Coast fuel flow, was a seminal moment for the American public. When you saw uh, people pulling up to stations that said closed, what were you thinking? I think at that point in time, I was like, we need to surge on this issue. What do we need to do to make sure that, that we can assist in any way possible? The NSA and Cyber Command are trying to be even more aggressive. They now have special Hunt Forward teams that travel to other nations to identify hacks and report back to the U.S. 
And they're now routinely reaching out to critical U.S. companies like Microsoft if their overseas spying or their research operations turned up anything of concern. Kira. Pierre Thomas from the NSA there in Annapolis, uh, Junction, Maryland. Thanks so much, Pierre. Well, changing gears a bit and talking about the album that every Adele fan is simply obsessed over, 30 dropping overnight, and she's not going easy on any of us with this emotional roller coaster of an album. Our Juju Chang has all the details on what the critics and fans are saying this morning. Adele's highly anticipated album, 30, dropping, tackling touchy issues like divorce and drinking away despair. Far from going easy on us, her muscular musicality only matched by her raw and complex emotions. The superstar's first album release in six years, critics already raving, hailing 30 as her best album ever. Adele is one of those singers who feels like as, as the old Roberta Flack soul song goes, where it sounds like she's taking your diary and reading each page out loud. So in each song, there's a different emotion that she's bringing all the way to life. The songs capturing the searing emotions behind her recent split with ex-husband Simon Konecki. Throughout My Little Love, Adele sharing poignant voice notes, conversations with her nine-year-old son, Angelo. And I feel like I don't really know what I'm doing. In an interview with Vogue last month, Adele revealing that the voice notes were suggested by her therapist as a way to heal. Her new album, Holding Nothing Back. Adele sitting down with Oprah earlier this week for an intimate one-on-one. -on -one. Nothing is as scary as what I've been through over the last two, three years behind closed doors. The singer performing her soul-searching new song, To Be Loved, for her 45 million Instagram followers. Adele leaving nothing unsaid and fans are raving, reacting to the album on Twitter overnight. Every song has an overshare moment where it's like, oh, Adele, did you mean to say that? Clearly, what makes her feel brave is the presence of these listeners who she knows are with her all the way. And it's a beautiful case of an artist and her audience lifting each other up higher. The song Hold On, diving into her struggles post-divorce and becoming a single parent. So this is a song that sounds like a, a late night secret doubt and fear moment you wouldn't even tell your best friends about. And yet Adele knows that everybody around the world will be singing this song by the millions all weekend long. And our thanks to Juju Chang. And it is quite the album. We're gonna take a quick break. We'll be right back. An extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed to report to prison to begin a 17-year sentence. They let him turn himself into jail with no escort. No one thought he would run. How do you evade capture for 25 years? How do you do that? Now, join the search, following the U.S. Marshals as they uncover new leads in a global manhunt. Can you help catch this fugitive? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Listen and join the all-new hunt wherever you get your podcast. World News Now. And America This Morning. The best new video. The breaking news overnight. Emergency crews called to the town of Surfside. U.S. airstrikes hitting targets in Iraq and Syria. The stories people are talking about. If you don't want to shave your legs, don't. I was gonna say, oh my. Got it. And what to expect in the day ahead. ABC World News Now and America This Morning. Starting at 2 a.m. Eastern. Up all night to keep you up to date. Right now, with so much at stake, Sunday mornings, this is the place. Taking on all the tough questions, straightforward reporting, no spin, no hype, no bull. See why Sunday mornings, more and more Americans are now turning first to ABC's This Week with George Stephanopoulos. Welcome to This Week.
what being live is Three all seconds. about. Rise, this is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by people so squeezing so into this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Lift off. <laughs> Streaming straight to you, anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. The straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Good Morning America, number one in the morning, nine years running. World News Tonight with David Muir, number one in the evening with America's most watched newscast. 2020, the number one news magazine on Friday nights. Nightline, number one in late night versus the competition. The View, the number one daytime talk show. And ABC News Live, number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news. And welcome back to ABC News Live. All month, we're taking a closer look at how climate change is affecting our world. And earlier this year, we saw Hurricane Ida's path travel all the way from New Orleans up to the Northeast, causing devastating damage to cities and towns with infrastructure unprepared for the onslaught of the rain. But extreme weather, made worse by climate change, can impact every city, not just the ones on the coast. Chicago is one city now facing the consequences of extreme weather, including the threat of rising waters from Lake Michigan. Our Alex Perez has more. Chicago, the gem of the Great Lakes, now being tested like never before by the unprecedented impacts of climate change. Angry storms drenching that famous skyline. More and more extreme weather pounding the Windy City like this destructive flash flooding last year. Or this record high flooding back in 2013, snarling traffic turning basements into swimming pools, swallowing even the earth in some places, and raising Lake Michigan to levels never imagined. Those directly in the path of these sometimes destructive waves find themselves confronting a stark realization the climate is harder to predict and the adored shoreline in some areas is vanishing. Sometimes we're worse standing, you have water. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. This, as I said, this was our patio. This was all grass. Jer Slaughter lives here on the south side of Chicago, overlooking the city's famed Lakeshore Drive. Believe it or not, her backyard here used to be a 25-foot-long beach. Some people talk about, you know, climate change is this theory. It's in books. But is this climate change in oh, action? Oh, baby, you better know it is. It, it, it absolutely it is. Chicago was built on swampland, early residents elevating the city to build and stay dry. But the changing climate is putting that foundation to the test, creating serious problems. The ground beneath them, the shoreline, all slowly eroding, in some areas disappearing. If you look to the north of us, that was our beach and 25 feet of, of sandy beach, and now it's about to hit our parking lot. Now, it's, that's all underwater now. It's the all beach, underwater. The, the beach, beach is, is underwater. The beach is completely underwater. University of Chicago environmental economist Amir Gina notes the effects of climate change, including more frequent heavy rainstorms and more stifling heat, are as much a threat in the middle of the country as they are on the coast. When it does rain, it's getting more intense. And I think in terms of the impacts of that, it's straining the aging infrastructure of the city. Uh, a city that was built to not deal with these really intense bursts of rainfall is suddenly having to deal with, you know, a few days worth of rainfall falling in an hour. And what does that do to the sewers? What does that do to people's basements? These once in a hundred year events are now happening more frequently, not only threatening lives, but also straining local governments and budgets. It's a very expensive problem to deal with, to try and to some extent rebuild the city. The city has been playing catch up and is trying to repair some of this damage, but because of the long-term changes to Chicago's weather landscape, the city's engineers say Chicago's infrastructure must adapt. It appears that things are changing and the climate is changing and we're looking towards uh, evaluating that, predicting what the extremes will be in the future so that we can prepare for those conditions and design resilient 
structures. Millions are already being spent to climate proof some of Chicago's existing infrastructure and massive expansions to these sewage systems. The reservoir here, the world's largest, officials say. Now, I want you to take a look behind me here. This is the older portion. And if you look way on this side, this is the newer portion they're still working on. Once combined, the massive hole could fit up to 22 soldier field stadiums and hold some 10 billion gallons of water. These quarries are the last line of defense for Chicago sewers to help manage rain runoff. And just recently, it was all the way up at the very top there, you said. Yes, right? it was just all the way up uh, just uh, a couple days ago. Kevin Fitzpatrick is the assistant director at the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District, the organization charged with the Herculean task of keeping drinking water clean, treating sewage, and making sure the city doesn't end up underwater. Just one inch of rainfall leads to about 16 billion gallons of water. Those sewers have finite capacity and weren't designed to handle some of the storms that we're seeing today. He says these tunnels and expansions are expensive, take years to build, and are not a long-term solution. So the goalpost is, is moving. We need to, to always be prepared for what, what could be coming. And what could be coming are more drenching storms. May 17th, 2020, it went to a level we never expected to see. Tyrone Valley is lockmaster at the Chicago Harbor Lock, which controls how much water moves between the Chicago River and Lake Michigan. These gates are key to keeping floodwaters out of Chicago during heavy rain. For now, he trusts the system to work as intended, despite climate change. I have trust in our system. I have trust in the uh, McCarm uh, McCook Quarry. And I know what we can do here. But others who've come face to face with climate change aren't so optimistic. It is worrisome to us. As it is, we spent this gravel and all the stuff that you see in preparing to ward off the storms cost us over $500,000. That was money that was earmarked for repairs to the building. Back in Slaughter's neighborhood here on Chicago's south side, the fight is already at their doorstep. It's a battle. It, seems it like is it. a battle. It is, that's exactly what you can call it. it. It is a battle. Us against Mother Nature. Alex Perez, ABC News, Chicago. All right, and our thanks to Alex Perez for that report. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. It's an extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed to report to prison to begin a 17-year sentence. They let him turn himself into jail with no escort. No one thought he would run. How do you evade capture for 25 years? How do you do that? Now, join the search, following the U.S. Marshals as they uncover new leads in a global manhunt. Can you help catch this fugitive? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Listen and join the all-new hunt wherever you get your podcasts. Powerful stories of our time, anytime. Nightline. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues. The hunt. True crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know? need to know to help you not just get through your day but to make the most of it feel smarter feel better feel happier well how about a third hour of good morning america gma3 what you need to know now streaming on abc news live it's all about you i know what happened and i'm not guilty why the fascination with criminal trials figure out what's really out there she revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart that he did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it. This is what being live is all about. This is ABC News Live. 
right, we're gonna move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this is by so people squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Lift off. <laughs> Streaming straight to you, anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. The mysterious boyfriend. What does he even do over there? Tell me everything. You'll be okay. No one knows about us. He's the chief executive and she's a kid. You have committed multiple federal crimes. I want to talk to my lawyer. The White House disposed of me like a piece of trash. And they will do the same to you. Impeachment American Crime Story, Tuesdays at 10, only on FX. Available now on demand. The hottest news in daytime are happening right here. We talk about things on this show that people don't talk about. That I can't wait to see. Honest takes from strong women. We need all hands on deck, and we need it right now. This is the time to speak out unafraid to get real. We stick by our points of view. We're all seeing it differently, and that's the beauty of The View. And that's why the most watched number one daytime talk show is The View. Now streaming on ABC News Live. Please begin. This is the testimony of Elizabeth Holmes. The Stanford dropout who appeared poised to change the world, but did her fall from grace was spectacular. Elizabeth is finally going to trial. This case will probably go down in Silicon Valley history. But to this day, Elizabeth maintains her innocence. We'll take you inside the courtroom. If history is any indication, Elizabeth Holmes is not going down without a fight. Follow the dropout Elizabeth Holmes on trial wherever you get your podcasts are incredibly safe places. A crime will happen. My wife had fallen in really critical condition. At that time, I thought it was just a tragic accident. There's still a lot of questions we need to ask. There were small things that didn't totally add up. This is two lives for Harold that have died now. I was shocked. Something's not right. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? <laughs> I you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. The straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Good Morning America, number one in the morning, nine years running. World News Tonight with David Muir, number one in the evening with America's most watched newscast. 2020, the number one news magazine on Friday nights. Nightline, number one in late night versus the competition. The View, the number one daytime talk show. And ABC News Live, number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number Number one news. This is an ABC News Live special report. Kyle Rittenhouse on trial. The verdict. And we're taking you straight inside the courthouse now in Kenosha, Wisconsin. That is right. After four days of deliberations, we are now hearing there is a verdict in the trial of Kyle Rittenhouse. You'll remember the jurors there pro uh, deliberating for four days. Uh, this is centered around a very high profile homicide trial at a time where racial tensions and police brutality have shaken our communities and this country. You see Judge Schroeder there on the stand. Let's go ahead and listen in. That's it. 
All right, so once again, uh, we thought we were going to hear uh, from the judge. Uh, as soon as he does start to speak, uh, we will take you. Uh, we will bring up the audio, but right now, this is what we can tell you. We have confirmed there is a verdict. Uh, Kyle Rittenhouse, you can see there live inside the courthouse in Kenosha, Wisconsin. We are told the police presence has beefed up. Also, Kyle Rittenhouse's mother has arrived to the courthouse. Uh, clearly, uh, Kyle Rittenhouse, uh, hands held tight, looking down, uh, getting some technicalities worked out uh, there inside the courtroom. The fate of Kyle Rittenhouse uh, now about uh, to be read. The 18-year-old charged with intentional homicide and reckless homicide after the shooting. You'll remember of those three men uh, killing two of them back in August 25th of 2020 there on the streets of Kenosha, Wisconsin, as those social justice demonstrations uh, erupted following the police shooting of Jacob Blake. You'll remember Kyle Rittenhouse, just to give you some background, was 17 at the time. He was able to get that assault rifle uh, from uh, uh, Dominic Black, a friend of his, uh, and made it clear he was coming down to the streets of Kenosha, Wisconsin, for what he said to protect his community. Uh, as we know, as we have watched this unfold, we have seen the video, video playing a huge role in this trial, specifically uh, cell phone video, video brought on by live bloggers, and indeed that drone video that jurors even came back this week and said they wanted to see it again. At that point, uh, we realized jurors were getting close to a verdict. Uh, the judge told them they could review that drone video again. It was about 46 minutes that the members of the jury uh, looked at it once again. Uh, we don't know if that's because somebody might have been on the fence, if it was a split jury at that time. But this week, after looking at that video once again, it looks like that might have been one of the key moments that helped this ju jury decide uh, where they are going to go as we await to hear uh, this verdict. We talked about the increased police presence. We've talked about National Guard troops uh, being called in to Kenosha, Wisconsin, because there is tremendous concern about this verdict uh, and what it means for that community. In a time after the death of jo George Floyd, the racial reckoning we have seen in our country, there is concern about possible violence. Let's listen in. No, it doesn't need to be. Um, there, there, there can't be any reaction at all, no matter how strongly you may feel. And it's understood that many people do have strong feelings. But uh, we can't permit any, permit any kind of a reaction to the verdict. And uh, as you can see, there's quite a bit of law enforcement here. And you will be whisked out of here if there is any. So just be aware. This is an ABC News special report. I'm Whit Johnson in New York, and we're coming on the air because the jury in the Kyle Rittenhouse trial has reached a verdict. Jurors making that decision on their fourth day of deliberations, the trial being closely watched and scrutinized across the country. Yes. Rittenhouse charged with shooting and killing two protesters and wounding a third man with an AR-15 in Kenosha, Wisconsin. That was back in August of 2020. And there you're looking at a live picture right now. Kyle Rittenhouse in the courtroom. The judge has called everybody back with that information that there has been a verdict. Rittenhouse was 17 at the time. His attorneys claiming he acted in self-defense. Prosecutors describing him as an active shooter who provoked the situation, confronting people protesting the police shooting of Jacob Blake. The jury made up of five men, seven women. It's been deliberating since Tuesday morning. Jurors focusing on videos of the shootings during deliberations and even asking for copies of the judge's instructions. Rittenhouse faces life in prison if convicted on the most serious charge. That's first degree intentional homicide. He faces five charges in all. The judge dropping a misdemeanor weapons charge before deliberations began. The governor activating 500 National Guard members to help police just in case of possible protests following the verdict. Once again, you're looking at live pictures right now. There is Kyle Rittenhouse in the dark suit, the maroon shirt, 
The judge has called people back into the courtroom, and we are expecting a verdict to be read at any moment. While we wait, though, let's bring in our Dan Abrams, our chief legal analyst here for ABC News. Uh, Dan, four days of deliberation. Right, members of the jury, have you know what? You, Bear uh, with me, Dan. Stand by. Person? Would you um, ask, um, give your juror number, please? 54. 54. And uh, has the jury reached a verdict as to each count of the information? Yes, we have, Your Honor. Uh, one verdict and one verdict only? Yes. Would you hand all of the paperwork to the bailiff, please? This is the ones that we did in the office. Yeah, everything. Okay. Yeah, thanks. May I see that too, please, uh, Mrs. And you're listening to Judge Bruce Schroeder right there getting the instructions uh, from the jury, saying that they have, in fact, reached a verdict. And as Judge Schroeder gets organized here, we can review some of the charges here. Once again, facing five different charges from first degree reckless homicide, first degree recklessly endangering safety, first degree recklessly endangering safety. The defendant will rise and face the jury and hearken to You can see verdicts. the charges there up on the screen. The most serious first degree intentional yeah, homicide, and the judge did count. allow some lesser charges yes, to be the considered by the jury. Joseph Rosenbaum. We, the jury, find the defendant, Kyle H. Rittenhouse, not guilty. As to the second count of the information, Richard McGinnis, we, the jury, find the defendant, Kyle H. Rittenhouse, not guilty. As to the third count of the information, unknown male, we, the jury, find the defendant, Kyle H. Rittenhouse, not guilty. As to the fourth count of the information, Anthony Huber, we, the jury, find the defendant, Kyle H. Rittenhouse, not guilty. As to the fifth count of the information, Gage Grosskreutz, we, the jury, find the defendant, Kyle H. Kyle H. Rittenhouse, not guilty. Members of the jury, are these your unanimous verdicts? Is there anyone who does not agree with the verdicts as read? No. Uh, would you wish the jury pulled? No. Okay. Uh, okay, folks, your uh, job is done, and uh, we started just about three weeks ago. And I, uh, I told you it could last two weeks and two days. This is two weeks. This is three weeks. Uh, you were a wonderful jury to work with. You were punctual. You were attentive. Um, and the forgotten six over here who had a, a very difficult job of uh, keeping from discussing the case during the time that they were sequestered as well. All of you, you just I, I couldn't have asked for a better jury to work with. And uh, it has truly been my pleasure. Uh, you've, I think, uh, without commenting on your verdict, the verdicts themselves, just in terms of your um, the attentiveness and the cooperation that you gave to us, uh, this justifies the confidence that the founders of our country placed in you. So. Um, I dismiss you at this time. You're never under any obligation to discuss any aspect of this case with anyone. You're welcome to do so as little or as much as you want. Uh, the media have requested, a number of media sources have requested the ability to talk to you and uh, they have been uh, allowed to present uh, presentations to you that you'll get in writing. And it's entirely up to you whether you want to contact, contact them. They are not to contact you. Um, if anyone does contact you and just you know, tell them you're not interested in discussing it, if that's the case. And if anyone persists in doing so, uh, report that to us and it will be addressed, I assure you. Uh, at the beginning of the trial, uh, there was some concern about uh, information and, uh, uh, and your safety. And I assure you that we will take every uh, measure to ensure that that is, uh, your concerns are addressed and respected. Um, and um, I'm gonna talk to you for just a minute, not about anything to do with the case, but just about that sole issue. And um, um, you, as I say, you're welcome to discuss the case as little or as much as you want. Um, and uh, any questions, anybody? 
Thank you so much. And uh, you're, um, you're, after four years, you're eligible for service again. <laughs> it would be my pleasure to work with you. Thank you. I, yeah. There yes. you have it. The jury finding Kyle Rittenhouse not guilty on all counts. Well, maybe it will be. We saw the camera on Rittenhouse yeah, for a period of time there. He was clearly emotional, even bracing himself on the desk. We're also told that his mother, Wendy, was in the courtroom in tears. Also close to Kyle Rittenhouse's sisters as well. All three of them huddled in the courtroom. That's that video from earlier when the verdict was read. Rittenhouse hugging one of his defense attorneys. Once again, not guilty on all counts in the trial of Kyle Rittenhouse. Let's bring in ABC's senior national correspondent, Terry Moran. Terry, you've been on this case from the beginning here. Walk us through the significance of this verdict today. Well, it's very significant. First, for the community of Kenosha, uh, this city was traumatized uh, by the police killing of a black man, Jacob Blake, then by the demonstrations, which turned into riots over the succeeding days, and then Kyle Rittenhouse showed up with his rifle and took the lives of two of those demonstrators, maiming another. This has been a traumatic time for this community. For a broader, this case came to stand uh, for two things in the country. For one, the concern among people on the left uh, that there are young people, people with guns who have political leanings and that they might use those guns to exercise those leanings. On the other side, uh, this was seen as a young man who was out on the streets trying to protect businesses from being destroyed in a riot, uh, and he was caught up in what the jury eventually agreed. And let's remember the jurors heard all the evidence, which most people who are commenting on it didn't. They got to look at the witnesses, they got to read the law, they took four days to come to this verdict, and they decided that Kyle Rittenhouse on that street may have been exercising bad judgment. Maybe he shouldn't have been there, but he was lawfully there, and uh, he was running for his life. And that is why they allowed him to raise the defense of self-defense, and they believed that the prosecution failed to prove uh, that he was not uh, acting in self-defense. That's the way the law works. So it's significant legally, but really it is significant on this debate we're having in the country over guns and over who's carrying them. And certainly this was a Black Lives Matter protest. Uh, uh, Kenosha has about 10, 12 percent black community uh, here, and they are no doubt disappointed in this verdict because this came out of the protests that were sweeping the country last year, uh, and it was also seen in that context as well. So it's a very significant verdict. And, and Terry, you made that key point about self-defense there. I want to bring in our chief legal analyst, Dan Abrams, because that's entirely what the defense was all about here. And the prosecution tried to point out that it was, in fact, Rittenhouse who was provoking the situation, going into a volatile situation with an AR-15. But at the end of the day, through testimony, through videos, uh, w time and time again, the defense made the case that these people, these protesters, were pursuing him and Rittenhouse saying that that was a threat to his life. You know, Terry made a point there that I think is the single most important thing to remember when looking at this case, and that is that the prosecution had to disprove self-defense beyond a reasonable doubt. So that means that if you're a juror on this case and you've looked at the videos and you say to yourself, you know, I don't really think that this is self-defense, but it's close, that's a not guilty verdict. You have to be convinced beyond a reasonable doubt that, that the prosecution has proven that case such that self-defense simply is no longer on the table, so to speak. And that legal standard is critical. I think we, we talk a lot about sort of the lesser included offenses and the provocation and all. That issue, singularly, on the question of the prosecution having the burden to disprove self-defense beyond a reasonable doubt is the most important one and i think probably was the reason that this didn't end up being that hard a legal case for these jurors so remember this is not a judgment by this jury on whether kyle rittenhouse did the right thing it's not a judgment by this jury on whether he should have been there at all whether he should have had that weapon this is simply a legal judgment on whether he should have his freedom taken away based on legal standards that they were told, instructed to apply by this judge. Dan, thank you. I do want to bring in our ABC uh, contributor and legal analyst, Shauna Lloyd, as well. She's joining us on the phone. And, and Shauna, I wanted to ask you about uh, 
Rittenhouse, we see him there again. These are from moments ago, his emotional response to the verdict. But the fact that he testified uh, in his own trial, for those who supported him, they thought that he showed remorse and perhaps uh, showed that he never intended to hurt anyone. Uh, for those who opposed him, there was very much this idea that maybe it was a performance, alligator tears, but put public opinion to the side. How significant was his testimony in his own trial? I think, you know, for these jurors, it was quite significant. What they wanted to see was why he felt like he needed to be in this posture of self-defense. And I think that's what they got from him. I think these jurors heard his story and felt like he was in a mode where he had to defend himself, that he had no other choice. That was what he conveyed on the stand through his testimony. And I think that is what the jurors did identify with. Because in these self-defense cases, they want to hear it through the eyes of the person that was there, because that is our legal standard. Shauna, thanks. And, and stand by. I want to bring in Matt Stone, our ABC News producer. He was inside the courtroom. He was sitting next to Wendy Rittenhouse. That's Kyle's mother uh, and his sisters. Matt, just give us a sense. We've been seeing the video of Kyle's response to the verdict. But what was the mood like in the courtroom? When in the moments before, very tense, obviously, just waiting for that verdict to come in. Wendy Rittenhouse was sitting next to Kyle's spokesperson, David Hancock. She was praying a little bit before the verdict had come in, had her arms locked with Mr. Hancock and Kyle's two sisters also sitting next to mom. Uh, both kind of had their hands shaking, very nervous. And that, you know, you saw obviously that relief once the verdict was announced is very emotional for the Rittenhouse family. All right, Matt Stone for us once again, uh, giving us a sense of what it was like in the courtroom. Uh, Dan Abrams, want to bring you back into the conversation here. So much of this revolving around video evidence. Um, this was recorded from multiple angles, cell phone videos, live streams, drone video. How significant was that video evidence uh, in coming to this verdict? I, I think it's absolutely critical. I, I think this is one of those incredibly rare cases where the defendant taking the witness stand may not have been the singular most important issue in the case. Most of the time when a defendant takes the witness stand, the case comes down to that. Do the jurors find them to be credible? But in a case where you have video evidence, in this case, you're going to have that become the most important evidence in the case. And there were numerous videos. Remember, there were effectively two scenes here, one where Joseph Rosenbaum is shot, and then they move forward to this other scene uh, where the other two were shot. And there is video, different videos, different angles of these scenes. And I think that when these jurors were evaluating the case and they asked to have it back, they wanted to see it again before they came to this verdict, it shows you how important that video was in this context. And again, when you're thinking about beyond a reasonable doubt, if there's ambiguity, if there's uncertainty on that video, that works to the defendant's advantage. Dan, thank you. I want to go back to Terry Moran out there because, Terry, tensions, emotions running so high surrounding this case. We, we mentioned earlier that the governor uh, activated the National Guard to be ready for protests or any potential incidents. Do, do we have any sense of what we might expect today? Well, so far, the, the protests in front of the courthouse during the co course of this trial have been very, very small, far more reporters than protesters. This verdict could change that. Uh, it could indeed. The, the shooting of, Joseph, of Jacob Blake last year, who I misspoke, he, he survived. He's paralyzed. He did not die. That was an eruption of emotion on the streets of, of Kenosha. It was an eruption at the time. The whole country was on the streets, it seemed, after the killing of George Floyd. It's a somewhat different situation right now. It's colder out. It tends to discourage people from, from doing that kind of thing. But we will see that the schools have gone to all virtual education over the past couple of days in anticipation of this verdict. The governor has, uh, has the National Guard on standby. But I don't get the feeling at this point that, that you would see the same kind of eruption. Let's see what happens tonight. And, and finally, this sense that this case did come to stand for more. A, a lot of people are concerned about the gun culture in this country. And Kyle Rittenhouse uh, and the others who were on that street, after several nights of protests had turned violent and businesses had been destroyed, it looked as if the country was coming apart, uh, perhaps with some people armed on one side. And that is why so many people on the left 
are upset uh, about this case and probably about this verdict. It remains a problem in this country. We can't solve problems through violence, whether with uh, burning down businesses or with guns. And I think that is the lasting impact of this case. All right, Terry Moran, thanks once again for your coverage throughout this trial. Kyle Rittenhouse, not guilty on all counts. Our coverage will continue on ABC News Live and abcnews.com, and you can get breaking news alerts on the ABC News app. David Muir and the entire team at World News Tonight will have a full wrap-up later on this evening. For now, I'm Whit Johnson in New York. Have a good day. And hello, everyone. You are continuing to watch breaking news coverage here regarding the Kyle Rittenhouse homicide trial. Kyle Rittenhouse found not guilty on all charges just moments ago, actually collapsing as the news was read. Jurors making that decision on their fourth day of deliberations. Hello, everyone. I'm Kira Phillips, joined by my co-anchor, Kenneth Moan. A major development, and again, on all counts, Kyle Rittenhouse, this Teen was 17 at the time of the shooting, now turned 18 inside that courthouse. You mentioned those dramatic images, but these are also dramatic images happening outside of the uh, Kenosha courthouse right now. People gathered there. This trial closely watched and scrutinized across the country. Rittenhouse charged with shooting and killing two protesters and wounding a third man with an AR-15 in Kenosha, Wisconsin, back in August 2020. And also, as we look at that scene, we go back inside that courthouse moments ago when that verdict was read, not guilty, not guilty, not guilty, not guilty, not guilty. All five counts there for Kyle Rittenhouse. His knees seemed to buckle. He fell back into that chair. His lawyers, Kira, tried to tell him to breathe, to breathe, because obviously this is a moment uh, that he had been waiting for uh, since that incident happened. Of course, at the crux of their case and at the center of their case was a self-defense argument there. Uh, as uh, Terry Moran, our Terry Moran just mentioned in our special report on ABC News, uh, there were many protests happening in the streets across the country, uh, but that was a case where everyone was watching because there was video. And his mother, right at that moment, you can see his mother crying, his sister with her hand on her mouth as uh, those not guilty uh, verdicts were read. You can see his two sisters next to his mother uh, crying in tears. They were brought into that courtroom before the verdict were even read. Um, they were holding hands. They were praying clearly for that family. Their prayers uh, were answered. Again, another shot of Kyle Rittenhouse. You could see, as you pointed out, his knees buckling, shaking, dropping to the ground, having to be lifted back up, uh, holding on to his defense attorney there. Before that verdict was read, the judge, Judge uh, Bruce Schroeder, actually said, we're going to whisk you out of here fast, uh, depending on what the verdict is. And if it was not guilty, he was gonna be rushed out of there, and he was. The moment after that, uh, we saw him leave that courtroom pretty fast uh, with law enforcement presence around him. For more, let's bring in senior national correspondent Terry Moran, former homicide prosecutor Bernarda Villalona, and trial attorney C.K. Hoffler, the former president of the National Bar Association. Thank you all for joining us. Let's get right to our Terry Moran, um, who was in that courtroom um, during some of these days of the trial, um, outside of the courtroom now. Terry, what can you tell us? Well, when I was inside the courtroom, uh, you could tell that the jurors were leaning in to this case. That this was not a jury where people were falling asleep or, or, or dawdling in, the, in their duties. They were certainly focused on this case, and, and that was good to see. They took their time with it. Uh, this was seen by a lot of people around the country as kind of a slam dunk for the defense after Kyle Rittenhouse test, uh, testified. And, in fact, the prosecution had major problems in this case. Some of their witnesses kind of blew up on them on the witness stand and opened the door for some evidence helpful to Kyle Rittenhouse to come in. But in his submission, uh, in his closing argument, Prosecutor Thomas Binger did manage to pull this together and, and paint a picture of, of a young man out on the street with a gun uh, who was not under control and not at critical moments truly threatened with great bodily harm or or that he would be killed. The jury didn't buy it at the end, but they sure did think about it. And it's clear from their requests, they went methodically through first the law and then the evidence. And at the very end, it was the first shooting, it seemed. Their last request was for the video of the killing of Joseph Rosenbaum, who was the first person uh, that Kyle Rittenhouse shot that night. A and it was that one that they seemed to go over at the end. There were no questions or requests for evidence or the law exp explanations on the law yesterday. So that was where they went. One more legal note, which is that Kyle Rittenhouse, 
is free now. He will not face criminal sanction for what he did that night, but he could be sued civilly uh, by, for wrongful death, for injuring uh, Gro uh, Gage Grosskreutz. So his legal problems may not be over uh, because the, that will be a different standard. It might be harder for him to raise the self-defense issue. But on this instance, where he faced life imprisonment, uh, he is acquitted on all the counts. Bernarda, clearly uh, the prosecution could not disprove uh, that self-defense case. Yeah, so the jury has spoken, the state of Wisconsin, the jury has spoken in the trial of Kyle Rittenhouse, and they determined that he is not guilty. They have acquitted him. They have determined that on August 25th of 2020, Kyle Rittenhouse was actually the victim and not the vigilante. Unfortunately, prosecution was not able to bring a strong enough case to disprove beyond a reasonable doubt that Kyle Rittenhouse did not act in self-defense. That wasn't reasonable, his actions. And that's why you have the verdict that you have. But we've been seeing that this would be the verdict for the last couple of days based on how all the evidence went in. And as well as after Kyle Rittenhouse testified and he put on that performance. And as you can see, the jury bought it. And C.K. Hoffler, is this a just verdict? You know, I, um, I will answer by saying this. The jury has spoken. I think that the prosecution failed, obviously, in presenting the evidence. During its case in chief, they brought it in closing, but it was a little too late. I'm not surprised by this verdict. Is it just? I'm concerned about the ramifications of this. And that leads me to believe that it's not just that this young man will not be held accountable and that others will feel that they can do just what Kyle Rittenhouse did and get away with it and not be held accountable. And so in that sense, I think it's not just. But this is how our system works. And the jury has spoken. And once a jury has spoken, it's over. It's done. Certainly you can appeal it, but it's done. And so I define justice by the jury speaking. There are a lot of appealable issues in this case. I am concerned about the ramifications of this verdict and what it, the signal that it is sending to the country and to the world indeed, that you can break up a protest, parade with a shotgun or an assault ref, rifle, an assault weapon, even if it is illegal for you to do so because you're 17 and you will not be held accountable. That's going to be the ultimate message. And I think this really, really is a, a very devastating result for probably the civil rights community, because after all, this was a march, this was a protest in honor of Jacob Blake, who was shot as a young black man by a white police officer. So I think that the jury spoke, I respect the jury, I, ex I respect that system, is it just I have a sense of not feeling good about this outcome because of what it could mean in our society? And it's a reminder of all the work that we have to do to level the playing field in this country. Bernardo, let's let's expand on that because there was definitely a turning point uh, in this trial when Kyle Rittenhouse took the stand. And we can't forget that moment when he was describing shooting uh, Joseph Rosenbaum and, and he started hyperventilating. He started crying. He broke down. The, the judge had to hand him a bottle of water. They had to take a break. Clearly the PTS taking hold there. And we, we found out in this court proceeding, proceeding that he was going through a therapy for PTS. Do you think that moment uh, played a part in these uh, uh, not guilty uh, reads that, that the jury at that moment saw Kyle Rittenhouse in a different way. Absolutely. I think the performance that was given by Kyle Rittenhouse had a huge impact on the jury verdict, a huge impact on the thinking and the deliberations of this jury. Because you have to think, I think, number one, it left you with an image that you can't take out of your mind. And just imagine that jury was experiencing it right there, front and center. So it's something that they took with them as well as the image of the mother crying as well. But also what was more important about Kyle Rittenhouse's testimony when he testified is that the jury had to decide in regards to self-defense. 
they needed to know, not just from the video, not just from his actions about what happened, but rather what was in his mind when he decided to pull the trigger of an AR-15 rifle that contained 30 cartridges. And I think by him testifying and giving them that piece of evidence that that gave him some kind of doubt as to the charges in this case. And again, when we're talking about proving your case beyond a reasonable doubt, if you have a doubt that is reasonable based on facts that have been presenting at trial, then technically what you have to do, not technically, by law, you have to acquit him. And that is what the jury did in this case. In regards to them focusing on Joseph Rosenbaum, I thought if the prosecution had any count that they can win on, had any chance of prevailing on, I thought it was with Joseph Rosenbaum. All right, let's bring in former NYPD chief of detectives and ABC News contributor Bob Boyce into this discussion. And Bob, I have to ask you, as a former law enforcement officer, do you think this verdict gives people a license um, in their communities when there's a Black Lives Matter demonstration happening um, that could potentially get violent for them to take up arms and to go in the street and to, quote unquote, protect their communities? Absolutely not. Uh, this is a this is a jury system that went through four days of deliberation, um, a lot of uh, testimony, uh, both pro and con, uh, prosecution and and defense. So no one gives the right to burn down buildings. No, this is our system, our system of justice. Whether you like it or not, doesn't give you any right to go out and start burning buildings and throwing rocks and all kinds of aberrant behavior. So hopefully now the the uh, national guard is deployed into the business sector there, so they won't have the same things uh, they had this uh, August of 2020. So hopefully that won't happen, but we'll see how, how on point the police will be as well as the National Guard and, 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 and stemming any violence attributed to this case. No one has the right to do that. Uh, they do have a right to peacefully assemble, which they will, uh, but not violence ever. Terry Moran, let's talk about the video e evidence for a moment. Clearly, there were two very pivotal pivotal uh, moments uh, during this trial. One was when Kyle Rittenhouse took the stand and, and he broke down, as Bernarda said, gave uh, uh, quite a performance that clearly made an impact on this jury. But the video evidence, um, there was a turn of events uh, this week when the jury uh, had two questions for the judge, one being, uh, could they review the video if they wanted to and could they do that in private or would it have to be in the courtroom? The judge saying by law they would have to view it in the courtroom and they wanted to see that drone video again and they watched it for about 46 to 49 minutes I believe I can't remember the exact time but what what did you make of that? Do you think that's because there was somebody in in among those jurors that wasn't quite sure if they thought you know he had had provoked the situation Kyle Rick Rittenhouse had provoked uh, the violence and the killing of Joseph Rosenbaum at that moment. Um, go into a little bit of detail about, about that time this week when they wanted to review that video specifically. Well, that may, Kira, be what happened inside that jury room. That's my own reading as well. If you look at the way they asked the judge questions, five questions, they said, can we have first the law, the first six pages or so of the jury instructions, which dealt with the law of self-defense and how you cannot raise it if you provoke the attack, provocation. That's what they wanted to look like and the first uh, look, look at and the first count uh, against the, about the killing of, of Joseph Rosenbaum. And then they wanted the video evidence, uh, a lot of it. And then at the very end, the last thing they want was the video evidence about the killing of Joseph Rosenbaum. That was before Kyle Rittenhouse was chased down the street. It was, it was just him and Rosenbaum at that point. And so it, and it does seem to me there was a juror who said last night she wanted to take the jury instructions home. The judge allowed her, perhaps, and this is total speculation, you know, she, she wanted to satisfy in her own mind that she was doing the right thing because clearly that jury was moving towards acquittal. And what the video evidence did here and, and, you know, so much of our lives is now on video that it is kind of changing uh, the courtroom behavior. Now, we, uh, we, uh, fake video is, is next, right, those deep fakes. But this was not. This was ordinary cell phones, that drone video. And what it does is it allows jurors 
to go out on that street themselves in an experiential way. So they don't have to really just say, this person says he felt threatened, this person says he wasn't threatened, this person said he ran at him, this person says he doesn't. It, uh, the credibility contest, it still is a huge part of being a juror. But because they had those videos, they could A, back up one side, one version or another, and B, get some sense, secondhand but vivid, would I be in fear for my life or great bodily harm? That's the standard in the law. Would a reasonable person put in the same situation feel uh, fear for their lives or fear that they would uh, suffer great bodily harm. That's, that's the law. So they have to imaginatively project themselves into Kyle Rittenhouse's situation. And the video helps you do that. We can all do that. And, and I think that made it a harder case for prosecutors, frankly, because when you've just got uh, a defendant on the stand saying, I feared for my life, you can tear him apart on cross-examination and raise questions about his credibility. But with the video, you can see. He gets kicked in the head, right? There are people throwing things at him, bashing him with the skateboard. And you can't say on cross-examination, well, so you say. Well, you don't have any proof of that, because there is proof. And I think the video evidence was absolutely critical, whether or not, you know, if people who watched it believe that it, it, it backed up what Kyle Rittenhouse is saying is one thing. This jury still did, and it also shows that that time they wanted in the courtroom to go over it themselves, after they discussed it for a couple of days, this jury worked exactly the way we want jurors to work. It seems to me, methodically, carefully, together, reaching a conclusion. You know, on social media, everywhere else, everybody's 100% certain of what the verdict should have been, one way or another, but certainty on Twitter is, is cheap. In the jury room, it is hard-earned, and this, this jury seems to me to have earned it. All right, our Terry Moran, please stand by as we look live outside uh, the Kenosha, Wisconsin courthouse there after Kyle Rittenhouse acquitted on all five counts there in those charges. Um, a lot of reaction is coming in right now. Uh, we also want to get into the political element of this verdict as well. Uh, we're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we'll get into all of that. Stay with us. is what being live is Three all about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by no people squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Lift off. <laughs> Streaming straight to you anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. This is American history, a violent white mob, a brutal attack, 300 black Americans killed right here in America. Now, it is time to uncover Tulsa's buried truth, the gripping story brought to light in a new podcast from ABC News, available now on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. Sex, gambling, fraud, betrayal, and murder. Cutthroat Inc., the podcast. The a family truth. on a mission to find their son. A year's worth of conversations with the killer. Cutthroat Inc., subscribe for free now on your favorite podcast app. Assault on the Capitol, the ABC News original, exclusively on Hulu, now streaming. Now with so much on the line, more Americans are turning to David Muir and ABC's World News Tonight than any other program across all of television. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? 
hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. The Straightforward Facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Good Morning America, number one in the morning, nine years running. World News Tonight with David Muir, number one in the evening with America's most watched newscast. 2020, the number one news magazine on Friday nights. Nightline, number one in late night versus the competition. The View, the number one daytime talk show. And ABC News Live, number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news. We are continuing our breaking news coverage here on ABC News Live regarding the Kyle Rittenhouse homicide trial. Rittenhouse found not guilty on all charges just moments ago. First count of the information, Joseph Rosenbaum. We, the jury, find the defendant, Kyle H. Rittenhouse, not guilty. As to the second count of the information, Richard McGinnis, we, the jury, find the defendant, Kyle H. Rittenhouse, not guilty. As to the third count of the information, unknown male, we, the jury, find the defendant, Kyle H. Rittenhouse, not guilty. As to the fourth count of the information, Anthony Huber, we, the jury, find the defendant, Kyle H. Rittenhouse, not guilty. As to the fifth count of the information, Gage Grosskreutz, we, the jury, find the defendant, Kyle H. Rittenhouse, Kyle H. Rittenhouse, not guilty. Members of the jury, are these your unanimous verdicts? Is there anyone who does not agree with the verdicts as read? Uh, would you wish the jury pulled? No. Okay. And as you saw uh, there in the courthouse, Rittenhouse collapsing as the news was read. Jurors making that decision on their fourth day of deliberations, more than 20 hours. Hello, everyone. I'm Kira Phillips, joined by co-anchor Kenneth Moten. Yes, yeah, 26 hours roughly that the jury deliberated here and to find um, not guilty on those five counts. There, You're looking live outside that Kenosha courthouse right now. People gather there, a lot of media as well. Rittenhouse, again, charged with shooting and killing two protesters and wounding a third man with that AR-15 in Kenosha back in August 2020. He was 17 at the time. His attorneys claiming that he acted in self-defense. Prosecutors describing him as an active shooter. We know the national conversation that was had uh, when it came to this shooting uh, and what has happened since then. We do want to bring in our incredible panel, including our Terry Moran, who is there outside that courthouse, um, along with former homicide prosecutor Bernarda Villalona, trial attorney C.K. Hoffler and the former, who is the former president of the National Bar Association and Bob Boyce, former NYP chief of detectives. Terry, let me start with you. Um, I mentioned that political element before we went to break. Um, we know that Kyle Rittenhouse was seen as this adopted son of the MAGA movement because of his support for president and former President Trump. Um, we saw that once that money for his bell, his con considerable uh, bell was raised. Uh, he was out in bars. He was wearing shirts that said free as expletive. Um, a few conservative news outlets obviously gave him very favorable coverage. Can you talk about the political element here when it comes to, again, this adopted son of the MAGA movement being found not guilty on all these charges and the way he was found not guilty? It, it is a big moment politically, but l let me say a couple things. First, you know, I would narrow it. Is he the adopted son of the MAGA movement? Uh, certainly, th there was a lot of that. But I actually think it was it, it was much more significant that the kind of armed wing, if you will, of the of the conservative, the far right nationalist movement in this country, which is narrower than the everybody who voted for Donald Trump, they adopted him. And the concern is that his acquittal and the lionization the, the, that he's become a hero on that side could incentivize other young men to bring guns you know, into places where they think there might be trouble that they don't like the other side. That, that is the concern. And if on, you're on the other side, what's the lesson? Bring a gun to a protest. I mean, the, the incentives flowing from this could be very, very bad indeed. But I, I think that for, the, for Kyle Rittenhouse, he, he shouldn't be punished because he became a symbol. Now, he did at one point after he was arrested, when he was released on his own recognizance, he was seen in a bar with a bunch of the Proud Boys, that far-right 
armed wing, if you will, of the nationalist movement in this country. And uh, he was making those allegedly white supremacist symbols and was photographed. The judge kept that evidence from the jury, he thought it'd be too prejudicial. So he may have welcomed this adoption into that group. But there's no question that this became a debate uh, about the value of, of protests and, and property and also guns and who gets to use them and when it's appropriate to use them. And I think that those, those forces let loose in our society, they already are, but uh, if this fuels more of that, I think there, there is genuine concern for that. However, the jury can't be blamed for following the law here. And, and as I say, Kyle Rittenhouse, whatever you think of him, terrible judgment. He shouldn't have been doing what he was doing. The jury found beyond a reasonable doubt uh, that he had not committed crimes out on that street, that he was, in fact, acting in self-defense, or the prosecution failed to prove he wasn't. And so they let him go. And C.K. Hoffler, you made it very clear uh, that you respect the court and you respect uh, the, the, the judicial process here. But that is where your true concern lies and that is the message this sends across the country and and terry just made made a very valid point as kenneth brought it up as well the political aspect here the social asset aspect here the talk the the the, the national conversation about race and the fact that his acquittal sends um a sobering message, uh, um, you could say a nerve-wracking message to others out there that believe in these militias and believe in what Kyle Rittenhouse did um, from a political side and aspect. No, no, absolutely. Again, I want to underscore, the jury has spoken, and that's what we have to do. The jury's spoken, we've got to abide by that. But the message that's sent from a social justice standpoint, from a civil rights standpoint, can be very troubling. There are people that will take this acquittal across the board and that will use it as an, as an excuse to when there are protests to, to inject another element of danger in protest and do exactly what Cal Rittenhouse did. And that is where there's, that's where I have some uneasiness about the message that could be sent. Not about the jury doing what it was supposed to do, deliberating and rendering a verdict, but more about the message of this verdict. And, and I think that is what is of concern to many. In addition to the fact we know, of course, that had Kyle Rittenhouse been African-American, black and brown, perhaps the outcome would have been different had he survived the encounters. So I think there's a lot of work here that can be done, that must be done in this country to level the playing field. A lot of work on social justice surrounding uh, protests, what it means. There should not be a any um, quieting a protest when, because frankly, the whole civil rights movement is born out of protest. That's how we've been able to put in place laws that benefit all people, all Americans. So this should not be a setback for the civil rights movement. It should not be a setback for those who believe in, in peaceful protests. It's when you inject an element of danger, as was the case here, that we have a lot of concern about what this could mean Hopefully, it will not mean that, but I do have a concern, honestly, and I think that's the social justice component of this verdict. And just in a response from the parents of Anthony Huber, who was shot and killed there in Kenosha by Kyle Rittenhouse, uh, Karen Bloom and John Huber um, said, quote, today's verdict means there is no accountability for the person who murdered our son. It sends the unacceptable message that armed civilians can show up in any town, incite violence, and use the danger they have created to justify shooting people in the street. We hope that decent people will join us in forcefully rejecting that message. And Bernarda, this statement also says, make no mistake, our fight to hold those responsible for Anthony's death accountable continues in full force. So essentially, this is not over for the uh, victims' families. So what's left for the victim's family is, of course, they can still sue him in civil court for wrongful death. Not sure whether they will prevail. However, the standard is completely different. It's not beyond a reasonable doubt. It's more of a preponderance of the evidence. So they can seek some kind of justice in that regard. They can also try to see, we don't know whether the federal government 
had an investigation and issued any findings in this case, but I highly doubt that the federal government will choose to bring charges against Kyle Rittenhouse. Unfortunately, you know, I feel for the families in this case. I feel for the families of those that have love, Joseph Rosenbaum, as well as Anthony Huber, because all they were holding out for is some bit of justice some bit of accountability, and they did not get that through this criminal trial. And we have to respect the decision by the jury. Kyle Rittenhouse decided to be tried by a jury of his peers, and he did. They heard the facts, they heard the evidence, and they applied that evidence to the law and determined that he was not guilty. Matt Stone, our producer who was inside uh, the, the courtroom when we heard those uh, five uh, not guilty uh, calls uh, from, from the jury. Describe to us, Matt, what it was like inside um, the courtroom. Uh, I know you could see uh, Wendy Rittenhouse, Kyle's mother, two sisters right next to her, praying, holding hands. Uh, give us a feel for how it was. It was very quiet in there until, and the judge warned to keep things quiet as well. But just kind of take us back to that moment before we heard uh, the jury's decision and then right after. No, you could hear a pin drop right before the verdict was read. Uh, the courtroom was as packed as it could be. Sitting right behind me was, as you mentioned, Wendy Rittenhouse. She was sitting next to Kyle. Rittenhouse's spokesman, David Hancock, they had their arms interlocked. Both of Kyle's sisters were sitting next to Wendy. Their hands were shaking. And after the verdict was read, you know, just they had that huge relief of emotion, it kind of poured out. Uh, on, on both sides, you could see Kyle's lead attorney, Mark Richards, kind of have that oomph, uh, you know, noise and that grunt of just, you know, after all of, you know, the deliberations totaling over 25 hours, I believe, to, to get, obviously, the verdict that they wanted. It, it was a very intense courtroom and uh, obviously a huge disappointment for, for the prosecution. Bob, boys, when it comes to policing and um, keeping a check on these demonstrations that happen, whether they be Black Lives Matter or um, any far right groups uh, who gather, especially those who take up arms, uh, what challenges do law enforcement, you know, either in Kenosha or nationally, face? Well, I think what they have to do is keep those two entities apart, both being able to get their word out to, to protest to march or whatever the case may be. But once you have them mixed together, you're gonna to ask for trouble. Now, I just saw in the steps of the, uh, of the courthouse, two different signs, very disparate. One, killer Kyle, the other says free Kyle, right next to each other. You don't want that, you want to get this separated. So everybody, so there's no interaction, so there won't be any back and forth that will spur violence. Also, wooden poles um, that, that flags are posted, so that all has to be removed as well. This police department has not done a good job as far as civil disorder on this case. Hopefully tonight they'll do better with the uh, with the National Guard there to uh, further uh, secure the area, especially the business districts in that city. I'm hoping they, they, they do a better job. You have people in bullhorns. You have chaos. In New York City, we would not let anybody on the on the steps of the uh, of the courthouse. They're personally free to go on the sidewalks, but still have to allow traffic in between. But now it looks somewhat chaotic right now. So hopefully that gets better as we go into the nighttime tonight. I am concerned about that. I want people to get out their word. We all do. Um, they're either outraged or they're supportive him, whatever the case may be. Keep them separated and do a better job than you did last year. All right, our Bob Boyce, along with uh, Bernarda uh, Villalona and also our Terry Moran there uh, just outside uh, the courthouse, along with our C.K. Hoffler. Before we go, Terry, uh, just a final thought as we look at the live pictures uh, right now. You know, we've been inside that courtroom and outside the courtroom, but it's the first time we're actually able to see all of those that have gathered there since the, the uh, not guilty uh, verdict uh, was read on all counts. Uh, fingers crossed it will stay as peaceful as it looks uh, right now. Absolutely. You know, we'll be here and, and see what happens uh, through the day and into the night. But it, it does feel there is something important to say here, which is that a lot of people followed this trial closely. They had a lot invested in on both sides. But there is something about a jury verdict that seals justice, if it's seen as reasonable, if it's obviously jury nullification or, or jurors just, just going a, a way that seems wacky or against the law. But it's clear this jury 
uh, did a careful job. A lot of people got to see the evidence themselves. Uh, people had differing opinions. But the people who swore the oath to do justice and every day walked into that jury room and had the whole court stand up for them, a, a, a message to them that they were the important ones. They did their job. And I think that that can also help uh, bolster confidence, not necessarily in what is happening on the streets, not necessarily in the issue that gave birth to this, which is, you know, the police relations with the black community in America, the, the operation of power on the black community in America that sparked the protests uh, last year, but in the way we can resolve things through the jury system, through the court. Uh, I, I think people may be upset about this verdict. There are some who will be angry, maybe a, a small number who, you know, are wanting to get violent. But I think for most people, this jury verdict confirms that this is the way we do it. This is the way we do things. And that Kyle Rittenhouse, because a jury of his peers says he did not commit crimes on that street, prosecution failed to prove it, he can go home a free man. All right. A big thanks to our Terry Moran there outside the courthouse in Kenosha, Wisconsin. Terry, again, thank you. And for Terry, Bernard, uh, CK, and Bob, we appreciate your perspective as well as we cover this major development here that's happening not only there in Kenosha, but across our country. Of course, here at ABC News Live, we've been following two major trials and gavel to gavel coverage. And now we turn our attention back to the trial of Travis McMichael, Greg McMichael, and William Roddy Bryan for the death of Ahmaud Arbery down in Brunswick, Georgia. The defense rested their case yesterday, and today attorneys and the judge are in the courtroom hearing motions and discussing jury instructions. Let's listen in. Kind of hearsay, meaning if Travis talks to Rash and Rash says there's been burglaries in this house or break-ins or trespassing or whatever, or is the court saying, and, and the court would sanction the state arguing to the jury, the court's going to charge you. Travis can't rely on a statement given to him by Rash because that's hearsay. Well, if that, or Travis can't rely on his mother because that's hearsay. Is that the court's going to allow the state to make those arguments, which leaves then what? Unless Travis was in the house at the time the stuff was taken and he saw it himself happen, then he's got no evidence about a burglary because he wasn't in the house at the time it happened? No, that's not. That's what I'm concerned about. No, and I understand that. That's not what I understand. So hearsay, not, so hearsay alone would be, for example, if there, was, there were no videos, they weren't looking at things. If someone just came up and said, oh, I saw a video and he acted upon it, that's hearsay, but if he, there, there's discussion this like about this video and he's seen it, yeah. then that, that, I mean, that's the circumstances that we get in some of these cases that are out there, where, yeah, he's, the, the individual's being told what was seen on the video, they looked at the video and acted. So I think there's a subtlety there. I understand where you're going with it. I don't think we're using a legal definition necessarily of hearsay. This is, this fits in my mind, to the facts of the case, given the case law that's out there, because what we're talking about here is there's no argument, I think, from the state that um, Matt Benzi was out on the street and pointed down the street and simply based on him yelling or pointing down the street or whatever it is, that's what the defendants acted upon. There was more information there that the defense wants to talk about. If it was just Albenze pointing down the street or making some comment, I'm just talking hypothetically, that's what this is trying to avoid. That's what this language tries to avoid, because I think that more tailors itself to the cases that are out there. Is hearsay the proper word? Well, that's the word that was used in the case. May, may, I, may I just jump in for a little bit on the, the point I think I'm hearing uh, Mr. Sheffield make, if, if it's an excellent one, because there are two different uses of hearsay being used. Unsupported statements of others alone. That's probably right. what we're talking about here. And just, Judge, just to correct the record, Mr. Sheffield just said the state's nodding its head. The state was not nodding its head in agreement with what Mr. Sheffield was saying. The state was nodding its head in understanding of 
in my mind I was thinking, okay, I understand where the defense is going to go in their closing argument. So I don't want it to be on the record that I was nodding my head as if I was in agreement with what Mr. Sheffield was saying as he threw that comment out. Let's remove the legal term hearsay. It's going to be a private person may not, not act on the unsupported statements of others alone. And, and just to be clear, what we're talking about is a, the court defining the first sentence of the citizen's arrest statute terms within that. I'm person. not prepared to go, I'm not prepared to adopt Mr. Hope's interpretation of the statute and hold that we can get to that. The, the, the only cases that, that that define in his presence and within his immediate knowledge at our, that, our, that they are synonymous are the misdemeanor cases, the first sentence cases. There are no second sentence cases that define that. I'm just pointing that out. Okay. You know, I, I say the first and second sentence thing that we're talking about is one reason why I think the citizen's arrest statute was a mess before it got changed. It's the mess that we are living with, but those two sentences are applying to two different scenarios, and it just wasn't ever real clear until you re read every single case ever reported on those statutes. And then you see the pattern develop that, as Mr. Rubin just said, all of these presence and immediate knowledge cases are usually misdemeanor shoplift shopkeeper cases. And then there's very few cases involving fleeing felons, very few. I understand that. And the, and the few cases previously, felony cases previously cited to the court, the presence and immediate knowledge requirement obviously did not and could not apply. Well, let's get past where we are. I understand the defense then takes exception to what is going to be charged, but I've explained what's going to be charged. Thank you, Judge. I want to say the defense, both the McMichaels defendants and the Bryan defendants. Okay. All right, so next, um, one is must make the arrest contemporaneously, and that is the state's position. The state is basing that on McWilliams versus Interstate Bakeries Incorporated, 439 F. 2nd, 16, a 1971 case, but out of the state of Georgia. And what we have here is we have a guy who goes into the bakeries and does indecent exposure, and a woman sees it. He shows up four days later, and she's like, there he is, and they arrest him and detain him for the indecent exposure four days beforehand. He then filed suit saying, you know, they falsely imprisoned me because you can't do a citizen's arrest. It's for exigent circumstances. It's for the emergency. It's for the immediacy. If you've got an issue, you know, call the police, have them do the investigation. They take out a warrant. They do what they're supposed to do. And that's basically what Interstate Bakeries said. A private citizen's warrantless arrest must occur immediately after the perpetration of the offense. If the observer fails to make the arrest immediately after the commission of the offense, his power to do so is extinguished, and a subsequent arrest later is illegal. I threw in the word later. That's not actually in the charge. And a subsequent arrest is illegal, and that is actually what we're asking for because that's what the case law says in McWilliams versus Interstate Bakeries. I believe the defense is going to argue, well, that was a misdemeanor case. It's indecent exposure. So that only applies to the misdemeanor. But here's the problem. If the, fel if the, if the offense is a felony, meaning the one you just saw <laughs> is a felony, and the person's escaping, then on probable suspicion, you can go ahead and arrest them. Um, so I'm trying to come up with a really good illustration of a factual basis. Does the court even want me to try and do that right now? Nope. Okay, I won't. I'll just say we'd like this uh, state's request to charge number 55, which is must make the arrest contemporaneously. Your Honor, McWilliams versus Interstate A agrees uh, is clearly limited to misdemeanor offenses. Um, it, it's... It is merged with Adams versus Carlisle, which is really the footnote that the state is citing out of McWilliams. And in that instance, the holding is a private person can only arrest for misdemeanor offense when that offense occurs in his presence. It must, and, it, and the arrest must occur immediately after the perpetration of the offense. 
So it's not applicable to the case that it, at bar. It's a first sentence. Well, the state disagrees with this first sentence, second sentence distinct, distinct distinction that they're making. The first sentence applies to misdemeanors and felonies. The only time the second sentence applies is when someone's escaping. You have to also be escaping. So the first sentence does apply to misdemeanors, and it applies to felonies. And I think Mr. Hogue even stated that and made that very, very clear. So this weird distinction where it only applies to misdemeanors, that is not at all true. You have to, if it's a felony and the person's escaping, then you get to do these other things. Then, then you can go ahead and chase them down. You can't chase down necessarily someone who's committed a misdemeanor, but you can chase somebody down if they're escaping. So that's really the distinction here between the first sentence and the second sentence. Not that the first sentence is only on misdemeanors. It's misdemeanors and felonies. The second part applies when you're escaping. So I just want that distinction to be made. And here in McWilliams, you know, there was no escaping. And it doesn't matter whether it's a misdemeanor because the first sentence, immediate presence, if you don't arrest the person who's committed the felony right there and then in front of you, your ability to arrest him later is extinguished. And here's the thing. If the guy's pumping gas, you notice how Mr. Hoke said, well, if he's pumping gas and you would go up and say, hey, you're the guy from the other day, and the guy runs off, all of a sudden he's escaping from something he did four days earlier because you've confronted him. Mm, how, how many minutes of how many days is he escaping? So it, it begs that question, and I think we're all going to be arguing that. But we ask that this, which is good law, be given to the jury because it applies to both felonies and misdemeanors, because the second sentence only applies under certain circumstances. This, uh, as my understanding, though, this entire case is the question of chasing for the purpose of detaining for an arrest. So the question of whether or not it's a misdemeanor or a felony and morphing them all together is just not accurate for the jury and in their assessment. Otherwise, we would not have two sentences in this statute. If I could just one more, well, I'm sorry, Kelly. Oh. You wouldn't need the second sentence, reasonable and probable grounds of suspicion, if it occurs in your presence or immediate knowledge. You have probable cause if it occurs in your presence. The reason there is a second sentence is because when it's a felony and the man's a, or person's attempting to escape, there's a lesser burden. It doesn't have to be in your presence or immediate knowledge. You have to have probable cause. If you, and probable cause does not require presence or immediate knowledge. Police officers get warrants for probable with probable cause for events that occurred days earlier, weeks earlier. They get arrest warrants and search warrants under those circumstances. It, it would render the second sentence superfluous if the, de if the definition is as stated by the state. Your Honor, I, I, I don't know. I guess it's the opposite of flattery because, you know, I, I, I filed stuff on this a long time ago, and it seems like as Ms. Dunikowski standing here, she had, had read it, Your Honor. We're conflating two different issues here. The fleeing felon part, Ms. Dunikowski makes a valid point. You can't go back a year later when someone's sleeping in their house and, and arrest them as a fleeing felon. There has to be some flight. And just because you have probable cause to believe someone committed a felony doesn't mean you can arrest them. But in this case, if there isn't a fleeing felon in this case, then there never could be. This is the very definition of a fleeing felon. It doesn't have to be fleeing immediately after the crime, but he's fleeing nonetheless. And what Ms. Donikowski is trying to do here, I, I may take that back. I should not say what she's trying to do. That's not fair. What her argument is trying to do is conflate the issues on the first and second sentence with whether they're escaping or not. Escape has nothing to do with the first sentence, which respectfully has nothing to do with this case. The escaping part has to do with the felony arrest. The, does it mean that the felony has to have taken place right then, that the person is escaping then? It means that there has to be an exigent circumstance, which is what the court has already adopted that part of the language, and the exigent circumstance for the felony arrest is the flight or escape. For example, if Greg McMichael and 
where Travis McMichael and Mr. Arbery were bowling buddies or on the golf team together, and he could look at the video and know who he is. Well, he, then at that point, he's got to arrest him or not. He can't come back three years later. But in a situation where the perpetrator is not identified and is fleeing, that's an exigent circumstance because you can't go back and get him later. You got to get him then. And that's the reason that the McMichael defendants are authorized in this case, and Mr. Bryan to assist them in doing that, if that's what the evidence suggests. The, the, there is fleeing here in the sense that if he is allowed to escape, there's no guarantee that he is going to be discovered subsequently any more than he wasn't discovered the first time he went in the house, the second time he went in the English residence, or the third time or the fourth. I mean, that's the personification of flight. And that's why this charge should be allowed. But to go back and say that that's got anything to do with whether it's the first sentence or the second sentence, that's a separate matter. And I think it's confusing for the state to present it that way. All right. Y'all have argued my brain into mush. <laughs> So we're going to take a short recess. I'm going to clear my head and figure this out. Thank you. You are watching our live coverage of the three men charged in the death of Ahmaud Arbery, that trial happening down there in Brunswick, South Georgia. I want to bring in our C.K. Hoffler and Bernarda Villalona. Also, our Alex Brache is outside that courthouse as well. Um, C.K., you heard the judge there moments ago saying, you're turning my brain into mush. Uh, I think that may be true for all of us, so help congeal it all. <laughs> Make it solid again for us. Tell us exactly what's been happening there as they go through those jury instructions and, and work it all out between the state and the, the, between the prosecution and the defense. Well, this is the charging conference. And Kenneth, you know, I've been in so many charging conferences or charge conferences when you're actually going through the language and the jury instructions with the judge. And it is a process that causes you to sometimes not know whether you're coming or going. But an issue here is the citizen's arrest. Because arguably under Georgia law, for there to be a citizen's arrest, there has to be knowledge or knowledge by, by those who are definitely trying to effectuate a citizen's arrest of a crime being committed. So the evidence that we hear have heard during this trial, thus, well, during this trial, because the, both sides have rested their, their case, was about perhaps Ahmaud Arbery being seen earl, earlier, um, other dates, not that day, him doing something earlier, but none of the defendants could say for a fact that he was committing a crime, that he was in the middle of committing a crime. So if you're going to effectuate a citizen's arrest under Georgia law, there's got to be a predicate. And so the issue is going to be whether that predicate, whether the elements have been met. The prosecution says no, the elements have not been met. So you can't have a citizen's arrest. And by the way, you didn't announce a citizen's arrest. Ahmad, you didn't say anything to Ahmad Arbery about a citizen's arrest, that you thought about this after the fact. You didn't even say anything to the police on the scene right after you shot and killed Ahmad Arbery. So you weren't even thinking citizen's arrest. That's an after the fact made up claim because now, you know, you've been caught, you've been arrested, and you're being charged. So that's an issue. That's at the heart of this. And the judge is just saying, you know, I don't know whether I'm coming or going because he's heard so much argument on that point. He's going to hear a lot of argument because that's a critical point. Without the ability to have a jury charge relative to citizen's arrest, that's going to gut part of the defense's ability to defend the actions of the defendants in this case. Just think about it. There's that they're saying we were we were in our right. We could have done this under Georgia law at the time. You may not like it, but that was the law. So that's why you're hearing arguments back and forth. But they've been going at this charging conference for a very long time. And I followed most of it. And it has been pretty it has been very intense because there's a lot at stake. And the charge that go back to the jury could make a, all the difference in the world, particularly on a self-defense case. We just saw the verdict in the Kyle Rittenhouse case, so we know how important it is to have those, those um, jury instructions reflect exactly what you want them to reflect, depending upon which side you're on. Yeah, if we want to compare uh, the Kyle Rittenhouse 
trial to this one, if I remember correctly, the judge in Rittenhouse, I think he had those jury instructions ready to go, and he said, I'm going to send them to you, um, you, to the state, to the defense, and then we can tweak them however you would like. Uh, Bernardo, does it seem that Judge Wamsley is taking more of an approach of getting everyone, getting both sides involved in this charging conference and the drafting of these jury instructions? We can't even compare the jury instructions and the scheduling conference that Judge uh, that Judge Wamsley had compared it to the judge in the Rittenhouse case because when Judge Schroeder was given those jury instructions, you know it was a hot mess. They had an entire jury instruction conference on Friday, but yet on Monday, minutes before they were about to do closing arguments, they were still tweaking it, tweaking it to the sense that, look, they lost one of the charges because, remember, the dangerous weapon, the dangerous instrument charge was actually dismissed, taken away from that. So in regards to what Judge Wamsley is doing right now, he's doing and approaching this the way you're supposed to approach it. Jury instructions are so crucial crucial to the point that the missing of one word can cause a conviction to be overturned. Especially in this case, when the defense is arguing about citizens' arrest, that's their entire defense here. That's their defense here. So what they are trying to bring in, they want the judge to be able to allow that it doesn't have to be contemporaneously the, the knowledge that they believe that Ahmad Arbery had committed a crime. And that's going to make the huge difference from them from an acquittal to a conviction. So, yes, both parties are going to be fighting about it. Yes, both parties are going to be fighting at nausea about it because it makes the huge difference. Bernarda, we heard CK mention, you know, how long they've been going, you know, at it on these jury instructions during this charging conference here. Again, a reminder, the jury has the day off. They will return on Monday where we do expect for those closing arguments to begin. Um, and then they will get handed down this case. But I want to talk about, Bernarda, these fireworks that happened this morning during this um, during this charging conference, and much of it came from defense attorney Kevin Goff. Uh, Kevin Goff, who is again representing William Roddy Bryan, uh, apparently he really once again pushed for a mistrial. Uh, again, mentioned the presence of pastors in the courtroom and protests going on outside there in Brunswick. Uh, he said, quote, that uh, this is what a public lynching looks like in the 21st century there. And actually, let's take a listen to Kevin Goff, and we'll talk about it on the other side, Bernarda. As far as I can tell, it's not like the state is out there during this trial giving press conferences or something. But still, third parties are influenced in this case. They've been doing it from the gallery in this courtroom. They've been doing it outside. <clears throat> this is what a, a public lynching looks like in the 21st century, with all due respect. Bernardo, the state argued for denial, saying that the activity outside that courtroom was the result of golf's own doing. Let's have a moment of silence for Kevin Goff, because he's about to get slaughtered in the news and in the media. For him to have the audacity, the audacity to say that this is a modern day public lynching, just the mere presence of black pastors inside of the courtroom or the mere presence of black people peacefully assembled outside of the courthouse and he's calling it a public lynching are you serious mr goff where are we going with this you know the thing is that kevin goff regardless of what happens in this case one thing we can say is that he will never be forgotten by his racial overtone comments that have been made throughout the trial. And the one thing I got to give Kevin Goff, thank you for your honesty. At least you're, you're up front with your feelings. The sad part about this, though, is that Kevin Goff is the only attorney from Glenn County, and the case is being tried in Glenn County, and the jurors are from Glenn County. So I really hope that those jurors that are listening to this case don't have the mind frame of Kevin Goff. As much, let's just bring it somewhere else, as much as Kevin Goff has been complaining and all day and he's calling it a public lynching, how about you talk about the fact, Mr. Goff, that you reached out to the prosecutor yesterday and you asked for a plea deal. So all this crying and stomping and saying he's not getting a fair trial and my guy is innocent, you asked for a plea deal last night. Let's talk about that. Let's talk about that. Uh, when it comes to that plea deal, uh, C.K. Hoffler, were you 
surprised by that late development or any, we learned about it actually early this morning about this potential plea deal? I was not surprised at all. I mean, there are always discussions going on throughout a case. What's interesting is that both sides said, no, 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 it didn't happen. But can I just say one thing, Kenneth, about the, mo the modern day lynching? What Please. happened to Ahmaud Arbery, what happened to Ahmaud Arbery, arguably is the modern day lynching period, end of discussion. I don't have enough words to express what, you know, Mr. Goff is saying. All I can say is just the racial animus coming from his mouth and every orifice of his body is most unfortunate. Having said that, I hope that this charging conference will continue to be as animated as it is because both sides have to fight to the bitter end to get the jury instructions to be correct. What we saw in Kenosha was just a hot mess in terms of the charging conference. Even the judge got confused when he was reading the jury instructions. But the judge controls that courtroom. So if he was confused, the confusion was of his own making. But here, with this case, the judge is taking his time. This is more in compliance with charging conference that, that we're accustomed to seeing. And as for Mr. Goff, he's going to continue to be Mr. Goff. I mean, we should expect no less. And they're going to continue to deny that that he he's going to continue to deny that he was seeking a plea for his client. But I'm very certain I feel very certain that those discussions have been ongoing from the beginning because he's felt very strongly that his client should not be tried in the same way or considered in the same way as the McMichaels. Let's go live down there to Glen County where we find our Alex Perche outside that courthouse in Brunswick where he's been since day one of this trial. And Alex, please set the scene for us about, obviously again, the jury not there. Um, we are not in any type of, I guess, active um, trial, I mean, both sides have, uh, have closed and um, have rested their cases. Uh, so what's the scene there today? Well, Kenneth, I mean, it's, it's the polar opposite of what we saw yesterday, right? I mean, it is, it's, there's nobody right now um, looking behind me. There is nobody uh, outside the courthouse steps right now. And, and, and quite frankly, I mean, throughout the day, it's, it's, been, it's been pretty sparse, even with supporters for the Arbery family. Usually there have they're, they're been a, a handful, but, uh, but, but, but not a ton. And yesterday, you know, you saw those images. Uh, I think it's a conservative estimation of 300, probably more, but folks who descended upon this courthouse steps to show their support to the Arbery family. It's the opposite today. And it was interesting uh, because we heard those statements from, from Kevin Golf. He handed out the pictures today uh, during this charging conference talking about how he believed that the, the support that descended down here in Brunswick was uh, preventing his client from getting a fair trial. Well, we also, during lunch, got a chance to speak with defense attorney Jason Sheffield, who represents Travis McMichael in this trial. Uh, Sheffield saying essentially what he saw yesterday was beautiful and while he is representing one of the defendants uh, he completely supports the First Amendment right of those supporting the Arbery family to be here uh, and that what transpired yesterday was absolutely well within their bounds and it's something that 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 even he supports and even before uh, we took that lunch recess we heard those same sentiments put forth by the hoax who are representing Gregory McMichael so clearly uh, you know with regards to any support that the Arbery family is getting outside of court uh, those objections that you're hearing from Kevin Goff he's kind of on his own little island there and Alex, how much have we been hearing from those defense attorneys or any of even from the state side? I assume the state hasn't been speaking much or if at all. Um, have we heard much from the defense outside the courtroom? Well, you're right, Kenneth. The state hasn't talked at all uh, to us. But I will say uh, the defense attorneys, they've spoken sporadically. I think uh, since this trial has started, we've only heard maybe a few times uh, from Jason Sheffield. He spoke once the day after Kevin Hogue first or Kevin Golf first made uh, those comments about black pastors in the courtroom, vehemently uh, putting his position out there that he thought those comments were asinine. And then the second time that we've heard uh, from Jason Sheffield, 
Field was again today backing up uh, what he saw yesterday, calling it beautiful. It's 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 interesting whenever he does choose to speak with us. I know he's had like some one on ones and some pull asides, but whenever he decides to come in front of the podium, uh, that that makeshift podium that's been established there, usually it is to battle back some of the comments uh, that have made been made by uh, uh, other defense attorneys, namely Kevin Goff. All right, Alex Perche outside that courthouse there in Brunswick, Georgia. Thank you so much. We really appreciate it. And, you know, we are following, obviously, the major developments that are happening out of Kenosha, Wisconsin, too. And let's go back, and we will continue to monitor that case in Kenosha, Wisconsin, after the not guilty and the acquittal of Kyle Rittenhouse. But we want to take you back into the courtroom in Brunswick, Georgia, for the Ahmaud Arbery case. And the judge is speaking. Let's take a listen. fails to make the arrest immediately after the commission of the offense or during escape in the case of a felony, his power to do so is extinguished. That's what the court intends to charge. I understand there's an exception from the, uh, the defendants. Judge, if you charge the jury the way you're, you're contemplating, you are directing a verdict for the state. You are, and you are rendering the second sentence in which it describes reasonable and probable grounds of suspicion meaningless. It's in there, presumably, for a purpose. It's a different burden than immediate knowledge or presence and so I would I would urge the court to reconsider and and eliminate this let the state argue what they're going to argue we have built this whole case around the probable cause the second sentence last phrase that Travis McMichael and Greg McMichael had on February 23rd for events that happened previously <clears throat> and you are gutting all of it if you give this particular charge May I ask, Your Honor, if, uh, and it were Friday at 2.30, if over the weekend we were able to email to you or your staff uh, a full, complete with citations argument for, for what position we're arguing for here, that you, this contemporaneity of the offense for which you are fleeing and being chased. Why don't we do this? This is what I intend to charge. I'm not going to reopen all of the charges. I understand the, the significance of the charge that is presented. Uh, I will, if I'm provided something, at least on a timely basis over the weekend, where I can digest and the state then have an opportunity to digest and respond, um, this charge I will remain. Um, it, it, the intent is as I've described. But if I'm provided different authority than I've already been provided, I will go ahead and reconsider upon the presentation of um, any additional authority that may come. Could I shoot for, say, midday tomorrow? I'll, get, I'll be working on it all morning, tonight in the morning. Not Sunday, but sometime tomorrow, I'll get it to the court. And we want to take you now to a press conference in Kenosha, Wisconsin, where that not guilty verdict was reached today for Kyle Rittenhouse. This is attorney Mark Richards. The jury Let's did take a to listen. Him today. Um, he wishes none of this would have ever happened. But as he said when he testified, he did not start this. And we're thankful in more ways than one that the jury finally got to hear the true story. And when I say the media, I'm talking about social media and things like that. The story that came out from the beginning was not the true story. And that was something that we had to work to overcome in court. Um, and we think we did that. You said that you were both at times doubtful and confident. Did the length of the deliberation time uh, instill more confidence or was that instilling a little bit of uh, work? No, doubt. Um, I, I never predict how long a jury is going to be out, but it was the longest jury deliberation I've ever been a part of. I had an 18 hour and a 17 hour in one was a federal and one was a state case. Um, it was torture. And this might sound like a small thing, but the judge wanted us to be within 10 minutes. Obviously, my office isn't within 10 minutes. So we had to sit in that room on the third floor and it was hell. What did you talk about the decision to put Kyle on the stand? Was that a close call for you? Do you think that made the difference in the case? You want the truth? Yes. Yeah. Had to put him on. 
It wasn't a close call. Um, at certain points, we wondered whether we would put him on. Um, we did. Uh, we had a mock jury, um, and we did two different juries: one with him testifying, one without him testifying. It was substantially better when he testified. I mean, to a marked degree, and that sealed it. But in Wisconsin, if you don't put a client on the stand, you're going to lose. Period. What do you see as the crucial moment in the trial? There were a lot. I, 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 I mean, I think, I think it, it's at the beginning. But when Attorney Binger gave his opening statement and said those things that Kyle chased Rosenbaum down. I, I don't know where that came from to this day. It was ridiculous. Um, and that gave me something to really show and argue to a jury that this isn't fair. It's it's not a game. And I think that was huge. Corey, you know, my co-counsel, and I stress the word co-counsel, he was not a second chair, was incredible. Um, we fought over who got to cross-examine Gage Grosquitz. Um, he won. Um, and he did a better job than I would have. This case has gotten caught up in issues of racial justice, the Second Amendment, self-defense. What does Kyle, what does your team want this verdict to be remembered for, his case to be remembered for? You know, it, when I took this case, um, I was hired by the two first lawyers. I'm not going to use their names. Um, they wanted to use Kyle for a cause and something that I think was inappropriate. And I don't represent causes, I represent clients. And the only thing that ended up mattering to me was whether he was found not guilty or not. Is that what Kyle feels as well? Is that what Kyle wants or does he? I believe that's what he wanted. And I had, you know, I told him when I first met him, when he was in custody, that if he was looking for somebody to go off on a crusade, I wasn't his lawyer. Martin, what Martin, you, throughout the week, you said, you know, I caught you in between court. You, you said, I never talked to you. <laughs> no, uh, <laughs> that you were nervous, that, you know, you didn't know what the heck was going on in that jury room. Uh, looking back on, you know, all that time waiting nearly, you know, 27 hours to uh, this afternoon, uh, can you kind of walk me through sort of those I, range of emotions? I mean, I expected we kind of picked amongst ourselves, our wives, our friends, my associates in the building. And I had Tuesday at 4.30, so I was way wrong. Um, nobody had it going past Thursday. And, you know, there was talk today about whether they were going to deliberate on Saturday. I've never seen a jury, and I don't mean this as a slight to them, I, but they didn't have a lot of questions. We had no information that they ever fought. Um, they were just working through the issues. And, you know, so it didn't... It, it was the time that made me nervous. There wasn't any information coming out. They submitted five questions over that whole time. They never asked to rewatch the videos, you know, beyond those five questions. Was that concerning or puzzling question, you know, for you? I, you know, I was afraid of a compromise. You know, I know it's been reported that we asked for lesser included. We objected to all lesser included. Um, Kyle was questioned on lesser included because he has to be, but that wasn't our wish. That wasn't Kyle's wish. And we, as time went on, were afraid that there would be some horse trading in the jury room. Um, and that's what really concerned us. And Mark, you've been visibly frustrated with the prosecution multiple times. No. <laughs> I was a prosecutor. Corey was a prosecutor. And I never went after somebody like they did. And when they put on the Kandiri brothers, knowing that they were lying, that is a problem. This isn't, as I said, my closing argument, I'm not going to, you know, it's not a game. And you're playing with an 18-year-old kid's life. And they were willing to put those guys on. Detective Howard and Detective Andrew Amian had both interviewed them and in their police reports said, we know you're lying. I can't ask that question when they're on the witness stand of the detective because one witness can't comment on another. So they put them on. They knew they were lying. 
and that's garbage. And I'm, I'm thankful we're never going to have to litigate the issue regarding the drone video, but they kept saying we stipulated to it. We let it in. We agreed to let it in because we saw the quality we were given and the jury couldn't see anything. And then they're saying, well, his first lawyer had it because it was on Tucker Carlson. John Pierce never had that video. We've talked to Fox News. We've talked to Tucker Carlson's show. The video that was on Tucker Carlson's show started right when Rosenbaum threw the bag. It did not start with the part that they showed at the beginning. It's a huge difference. That's what they built their whole case on with that garbage photo. And, you know, maybe you don't expect everything in a trial, ever. And that program that they used and the expert from the crime lab specifically says on the company's blog, artificial intelligence enhancements are not to be used for forensic evidence. And they did it. And our research after it, it would have been the subject of a huge motion. We don't have to do it. And you said going into this trial, you didn't want this to be about a cause. But in your opinion, what do you think this verdict says about the second amendment? You know, I don't, I don't know that it says... I mean, there's... I personally don't like people carrying AR-15s around. You know... There was so much anger and so much fear in Kenosha on August 25th that people did arm themselves. And, I, I, you know, we knew from the beginning that if you read that statue correctly, I know everybody thought I was crazy. If you read the statue correctly, he was legal in having that firearm. And obviously, once the evidence came in, the judge threw the charge. Um, they threw the curfew. And... Those were things that the state wanted to, you know, kind of hang their hat on so they could argue he couldn't be there, he couldn't own the gun. What was the first thing that Kyle Rittenhouse told you after the arrest? Thank you. Mark, with the surviving victim, Dave Gross Kreutz, uh, said in an interview in recent days that watching Kyle testify, it looked like a, a kid who got caught doing something wrong, I'm paraphrasing. Uh, what does Kyle want the families of the, the two men killed to know about how this all played out? Because he repeatedly talks about feeling like he had no choice. But clearly there was... There's if if Mr. Grosquitz and some of the other people had let Kyle go to the police, there would only be one individual dead. Um, they referred to him, and I talked about it as an active shooter. Anybody can look up the definition of an active shooter from the FBI, law enforcement. He didn't meet it. But the way that those words are so charged, that's what they used. They wanted to paint him as that. Um, you know, I wish nobody died. I wish I never met Kyle Rittenhouse. And I don't mean that because he was a bad client. I just mean because then this wouldn't have happened. Whether or not he feels he had to do it, is he remorseful? Does he feel bad about for those families? I, I think he does. We've talked about it. Um, he, there's been so much talk about whether the tears were um, genuine. All I can say is when we prepared Kyle and we worked on his testimony, there were things we couldn't talk about in my office because it got too emotional and he couldn't handle it. He's in you know, counseling for PTSD, so he doesn't sleep at night. Um, it, it, Remorse, I think, manifests itself some other ways. I don't think he can ever walk out here and say that um, because of the situation. But I know Kyle Rittenhouse, and I know what he feels. Mark, along those lines, where does he go from here? I, he has to get on with his life the best he can. I think eventually some anonymity will come back to it. Um, I don't think he'll continue to live in this area. Um, I think it's too dangerous. He's had 24-hour security since this happened. We're thankful that the judge protected his address. Um, it, everybody in this case, and when I say that, I mean prosecution, defense. To me, it's scary how many death threats we've had. You know, I was answering my phone on the way back from court in Kenosha. I don't, my office isn't that far. After the third death threat, 
I could answer on the phone. And Mark, what do you say to people who may look at these words and still think that you have no business being in commercial battle? What do you say to the people who are He had as much business being there as any of the demonstrators or the rioters. Um, that's all I can say. I mean, there's going to be people who will never agree with that statement, but you know, if we all would just mind our own business a little bit, I think we'd all be better off. And it's a hard lesson to learn, but Could, couldn't that have been said about Kyle? It, it, it could be. He was asked to be there. He wanted to help the community, and you know, that's the narrative that the state went with. He shouldn't have been there. Um, he was asked to be there by Nick and Dominic, um, and the Kandiri brothers wanted security. And, it, you know, I'm not trying to br blame anyone. I wish he'd never been separated from Ryan Balch, and we would, wouldn't be here. Does he regret coming here to Kenosha? I, I don't believe he does. I, believe, I mean, you know, if he had to do it all over again and you said same thing is going to happen and you're gonna, life is going to be put in a living hell, for a year and you're going to not know if you're going to be a free man, he would say, I wouldn't go. Um, but we can't undo time. Mark, the, president, the president was just asked about the verdict. He says, I stand by what the jury has to say. The jury system works. I, <laughs> and I'm not laughing at President Biden. What I'm laughing at is it, it, a friend of mine who's a lawyer said, he goes, and him and I had done a big case together seven, eight years ago. And he said, do you think this Rittenhouse is going to be bigger than that case? And I said, you know, I do. And he said, why do you say that? And I said, I've never had a case, and I don't think I ever will, where within two days or three days of one another, you know, the president and the presidential candidate comment on it. And both of them had such different beliefs. Um, President Biden said some things that I think are so incorrect and untrue. He's not a white supremacist. I'm glad that he at least respects the jury verdict. And if the government had any information regarding his cell phone or anything that he'd been to any of those websites or been online doing that kind of stuff, it would have been introduced in evidence. It wasn't. We were the individuals who released his cell phone, which couldn't be cracked by the FBI because we had nothing to hide. For those of us that got here a little bit late, can you just kind of reiterate or go over his reaction immediately? After no, this? I'm not, I'm not you doing reruns. Do you plan to represent him in, civil, in any civil actions? What's that? Do you plan to represent him in civil actions? I, I'm a criminal defense attorney. I don't do civil stuff. You're a, veteran, you you're a veteran criminal defense attorney. Talk about what's the one thing you learned if you had to say the biggest takeaway from this case, what you learned? Every case is different, and every case has surprises. Um, you know, hey, I learned I could wait 24 hours for a verdict. What about, uh, what happens to the $2 million bond? I expect there will be a fight over that. Um, you know, John Pierce is the person who posted the bond. Um, all of that money was raised on behalf of Kyle. Um, Lynn Wood and Fight Back say that they're entitled to it. Um, there was, and when I, I'm using round numbers, but there was half a million dollars, I think, that came directly from Wendy Rittenhouse from money she had raised. So there's gonna be a fight over that. And I'm just thankful that there will be a fight over that because if he had lost, it wouldn't have mattered. You know, Kyle had aspirations to be a first responder. Is that still? He wants to be a nurse. What would you say your biggest takeaway is from this 25 plus hour jury deliberation? What do you think that that says? I need to be more patient. Now that he has been equipped, can you look back and point to a pivotal moment that was successful for you that you think created this outcome? Getting rid of the first two lawyers. And, you know, that might be a smart alecky comment, but I mean that. And I got my best friend. Corey to join, who I trust, um, and to be able to work with somebody who you don't have to check their work, you don't worry about what they're going to be doing, you give them a project and it's done as good or better as you do yourself, it's priceless. There's been a lot of commentary on the prosecutor's performance in this case. What would you say being up there with them every day? I, you know, I, I, you must have got here a little bit late. Um, 
I, I've known Tom Binger for a long time. I knew him when he was a civil lawyer. Um, I'm disappointed with some of the things he did, um, and I've said why. Such as what? Putting on the Kandiri brothers when you know they're lying. Um, changing your prosecution, going with provocation after you say that my client chased him down and shot him in the back. Um, calling him an active shooter when he's not. You know, justice is done when the truth is reached, and I don't know that it's set up to do that, but a prosecutor is supposed to seek the truth. It's not about winning, and this case became about winning, and that's probably why it got so personal. How about the judge? What do you say about how the judge handled the case? You know, I've, I've never seen so much made of so little, and that's not to pick on you guys or anything like that, but it, I've tried cases as a prosecutor 100 years ago in front of Judge Schrader. I've tried cases as a defense lawyer, and him and I butted heads as a defense lawyer. Um, Judge Schrader gives you a fair trial as a defendant. You don't want him to sentence your client, okay? Um, but in this case, we were looking for a fair trial, and if we lost, we knew what was going to happen. So it wouldn't have mattered whether it was that judge or some other judge. He's getting life in prison. So I'd rather have a fair trial. I thought he gave us a fair trial. Um, you know, this, everybody got all crazy about the tumbler. Who cares? That has nothing to do with this. I, I mean, I, I've seen the tumbler used before. I've seen clerks pull things out and suspicious things happen. Um, Kyle pulled it out. And I'll be real honest, we had every juror scored on a, a, a sheet, and we were devastated when those th three of the six jurors were separated from the panel because we thought they were three of our st strongest jurors. And Kyle pulled their names. So I think it's a good system. Um, I, you know, I've got a trial in front of them, you know, a big case. And maybe in that one, I'll think he's unfair, but he's a fair judge. He also said something about, like, in the future, he plans on rethinking the possibility of live coverage to this extent. Given what you guys have gone through, you know, he mentioned that you guys went through a lot, you, there were threats made to you. What do you think that that should be going forward, setting a precedent about? I don't know about that. You know, I, I think... I think that I've never done a case that was televised gavel to gavel. I've had cases that have gotten media coverage. I was kind of, um, I knew this case was big. I had no idea it was going to be this big. I mean, I've gotten calls from people I haven't seen in 25 years. It, it's just bizarre. Um, and I, I'll never be able to figure out exactly what it is that caused the interest that it did. Um, I don't think it made the attorneys act different. I don't think it made the judge act different. Um, I suspect when everything cools down, if there was another big case in front of Judge Schrader, he'd let the cameras in. Mark, will Kyle say anything to the crowd that's gathering down there now over you on his behalf? I, you about, know, about, I mean, I, we don't know that there'll be trouble, but you know, there's people gathering by the time we left. There were more and more people showing up. Do you think he, anything he might say could uh, make things go better than I, I think I don't. Um, the people who are going to end up causing trouble, they don't want to hear from Kyle Rittenhouse. I, it, and it's, you know, what, remain calm? I, you know. What do you think the wider implications of this verdict are? If, if I don't, you know, I don't think it's, the, I don't think it's that kind of case. I mean, you know, when, when you want to talk about implications and precedent and things like that, is it ever going to happen again? You know, is there ever going to be just a total unrest in Kenosha or some other city, and that's going to happen? You know, I just don't see that. Um, it was a case about self-defense, the right to protect oneself from, you know, Mr. Rosenbaum. Don't want to speak ill of the dead, but he wasn't a nice person, and everybody knows why. And a lot of that didn't come in in front of the jury. So... I don't know that there's any broader implications. I don't want to make it bigger than it is. A couple of politicians in Wisconsin used the word vigilante to refer to your client since the verdict came down. How do you react to that? Maybe they should have watched the trial. 
Yeah. <laughs> I know Kyle Rittenhouse said thank you to you. You said that after the birth of Fred. Can you share any more about general reaction from him or his family in that moment? You know, it's one of those things that anything that's said at this time is kind of meaningless. We have to take it in, reflect on it, and, um, it, you know, what's he thanking me for? And I don't mean to, that it's insincere, but... It takes a while to process what happened today. I haven't processed it. I, I don't think that, I. I can't answer that question. If I had to guess, and it would be a guess, I don't think they'll stay in Wisconsin. What's next for you? I got a trial in a week. I'm going to take a couple of days off and go to the Badger game tomorrow, which I've jump, missed. Jump around. Hopefully, I've missed a couple of Badger games because of this trial, and I'm very much we were afraid we weren't going to get to go because they were going to have them deliberate on Saturday and I want to see him beat Nebraska do you have any sense that they agreed to those verdicts much earlier but maybe just took some extra time to at least leave the impression they really thought through it it wasn't a quick sudden I I don't believe that Uh, yeah (laughs) that's I don't believe that I, I mean there was the questions and I think I I said this to some people yesterday when they asked to call off at 4 o'clock. You could see the tenseness in those people, the jurors, at least I could or I sensed it, who were entering that room. And, you know, if they wanted to quit early because I think they were tense. And if there was some early verdict and they were playing all of us for fools, um, they're great actors and actresses. I don't think that was the case. Are you thinking about I, I believe so. I, you know, I have, I have clients from 30 years ago. I still talk to. I, I get my oldest, one of my oldest favorite clients. He moved out of Racine, moved to Minneapolis. Um, he texted me congratulations. I talk to him once a month. I try to stay in touch with clients who want to stay in touch with me. Um, I like to see him do well, and I hope that Kyle does. Do you think that they'll keep a low profile? I hope so. What do you think the amount of time that the jury took to do this says about how they handled it? They took it very seriously. I, it, as I said, it's the longest jury I've ever had out. Um, wow. Can I go home? Go home. Yeah. Anything else we haven't asked you? Mark, do you think he'll ever talk? Probably. I, I'm not in charge of his media. I don't have anything to do with that. Yep. Thanks, Mark. Yep. We've been watching Mark Richards, the winning defense attorney in the Kyle Rittenhouse trial, responding to that not guilty verdict, talking about the big moments of this trial, giving his own analysis, speaking on behalf of his client. Kyle Rittenhouse, after he was found not guilty on every single one of the five charges, this after almost four days of deliberations and a 14-day trial that has marked national headlines since those shootings happened August of 2020. Joining us now, former homicide prosecutor Bernarda Villalona and trial attorney C.K. Hoffler. Bernarda, it seems that Mark Richards there, um, obviously after winning a very, very big trial like this one, uh, he seemed... uh, I'll let you actually say the word, what you exhibited, uh, what he exhibited there and what you saw from him um, when it came to his reaction. Again, he said that uh, the first thing Kyle Rittenhouse told him after that acquittal was thank you. Bernardo, can you hear me? All right. CK, can you hear me? I can hear you. All right, CK, I'll ask you while we uh, connect with Bernarda again, which is uh, how would you describe that response there from Mark Richards, and how did he seem to you after winning that big verdict? Well, I think, you know, when you win a big verdict, and I've been in that position, um, when it, more in a civil case context, of course, with big verdicts, um, you feel you don't want to boast, you don't want to brag, you're really thanking God that you made it through. You know, and he had a lot of, you know, he did express that they had some doubts during times, but he was a little bit flippant, and he wanted to justify 
his position and Kyle Rittenhouse's position. He was critical of the prosecution in a way that typically when you win, you don't beat up on the other side, um, typically, even if the press is asking you that. But I think he feels a sense of vindication as well as you would expect. And he is somewhat protective, of course, of his client, Kyle Rittenhouse, and just saying, you know, he just turned and said, thank you. Well, at that point, Kyle, um, if he had lost, Kyle would have gone straight to jail and possibly would have been sentenced to life um, because this judge is tough on sentencing. I don't know if he would have been tough on sentencing Kyle Rittenhouse. We never would know. So I think, you know, he was kind of, you know, just kind of relieved, laid back, he's going to go chill. And um, he was wanting to get out of that press conference and go on and have a little bit of a break because he's got another trial coming up. Um, I Some of the things that he focused on in the trial um, gave us insight as to their strategy. Um, we saw that a lot of money was raised. Kyle has been a poster child for a lot of different conservative groups since he was arrested. And so we did get a sense that, you know, they had focus groups that we would expect. And all of that takes a lot of money. And this was a very well-financed defense, multiple attorneys, and um, and you could tell in the courtroom. A lot of money raised by supporters, um, but apparently Kyle Rittenhouse's mother also brought some money to the table, we learned there. And you're right, CK, there were a lot of behind the scenes things that we learned about listening to Mark Richards there. And again, you mentioned that he criticized the lead prosecutor, Thomas Binger, and said he was disappointed in some ways uh, with the state's case there, especially with calling Kyle Rittenhouse an active shooter. Um, and you also mentioned the fact about the big moment of the trial when Kyle Rittenhouse took the stand in his own defense broke down. Uh, we learned there were mock juries uh, that were were put together to see whether or not he should take the stand. Let's take a listen to Mark Richards and what he said. Had to put him on. It wasn't a close call. Um, at certain points, we wondered whether we would put him on. Um, we did, uh, we had a mock jury um, and we did two different juries, one with him testifying, one without him testifying. It was substantially better when he testified, I mean, to a marked degree, and that sealed it. But in Wisconsin, if you don't put a client on the stand, you're going to lose, period. That last part, Bernarda, if you don't put a client on the stand in Wisconsin, you're going to lose. Uh, that would surprise me a little bit because that seems it played into their strategy. Absolutely, absolutely. Just to show you how it, uh, how states are different. So that's in Wisconsin. I wouldn't say that that's the same here in New York or in Pennsylvania. One thing about this press conference that it definitely confirmed a lot of ideas that I had about the trial strategy. I can tell from when Kyle Rittenhouse testified that he had been put in front of possible mock juries and also has been preparing for his examination for months. I wouldn't say even for days, for months, because it was just so perfectly executed. I will say this, though, you know, a lot of money, yes, went through through the defense. And you can see it at times that it's said that the prosecution's office has all the money. They have the backing of the government. You definitely did not see that in this case. If we compare it to the trial of Derek Chauvin, you saw all the resources that was put in in that case, especially since you had the attorney general's office that flipped the bill on having a jury consultant come in to assist with jury selection and all the doctors and experts that were brought in. Here, you barely had more than two prosecutors inside of the courtroom. I commented on this before, but I found it very disheartening that those prosecutors, Mr. Binger, did not have the backing of his office in the sense of usually when there's a big trial, especially a, a trial of this capacity, you will have at least other assistants come in and watch you on trial. You'll have people help with the technology. You have people organizing your, your evidence. But you didn't see any of that here. It was like he was left on his own island to dry. And Bernarda, we're getting a lot of response in right now. We know the lead prosecutor, Thomas Binger, is saying that the jury has spoken in this trial. Um, the DA there in Kenosha also put out a somewhat, um, put out a paragraph uh, as well, talking about obviously respecting the jury. Um, 
I think President Biden essentially said the same thing. That's that statement from mm -hmm. the DA right there. We respect the jury verdict based on three and a half days of careful deliberations. Certainly issues regarding the privilege of self-defense remain highly contentious in our current times. We ask that all members of the public accept the verdicts peacefully and not resort to violence. Uh, as those reactions come in, I'm curious about what your thoughts going back to Mark Richards, who said if Grosskreutz, um, the third man who was shot and survived, um, that if he had let Kyle go to the police, there would only be one person dead, I'm assuming he meant uh, Joseph Rosenbaum there. I doubt that. That's an assumption that's being made. But I just wanted to take it a step back as to the statement that was released by the district attorney's office. It was a neutral statement. Actually, you know what? It kind of gave a little bit of jabs because it included that the jury was deliberating for three and a half days as opposed to that it was a quick verdict. Um, so it goes to show you that there was some kind of work that they put into and that the prosecutor did put some kind of case forward that was enough to go forward and they believed in their case. Also, aside from that, I see that they also address the self-defense and that self-defense is a huge issue in Kenosha, Wisconsin, and that it needs to be worked on. Taking it a step further in terms of whether whether Gage uh, would have stopped them, that, that there wouldn't have been a second homicide. I doubt that. I think that things were just so chaotic. If it weren't for him, it's possible that actually there would have been additional homicides because it was them who stopped him from continuing to run off. If they didn't continue stopping from continuing to run off, who knows how many other people he probably would have shot because there was a mob of people that were going after him. And CK, we know um, Anthony Huber, the other victim in this case, his family put out a statement saying Anthony will have his day in court. They obviously criticize um, Kyle Rittenhouse and the Kenosha Police Department. So not guilty on all charges. Are Rittenhouse's legal problems completely done here? I don't think they're completely done. Now you're going into my zone. Um, you, he really could face civil lawsuits, so could the police department and others. So that is something, I don't think his legal problems are gone. He won't be incarcerated, perhaps. He won't face life in prison, so that part is gone. But he probably will have to fight um, civil lawsuits, which I would anticipate the family, certainly of the two deceased um, victims, um, the two deceased men who were killed by Kyle Rittenhouse. So I think he should anticipate that. And I think also the police departments. I mean, there are a lot of things that could be commented on in terms of the lack of attention or what Kyle Rittenhouse was allowed to do and the failures of the police department. I think that's something that needs to be investigated. The Justice Department has already looked at this and decided that it's not going to go forward against Kyle Rittenhouse or the police department at this point, and we don't know if there's any evidence that came out that would change their mind, but I doubt that it would, because the jury, again, has spoken. But civil liability, I think Kyle Rittenhouse can face that in the future, absolutely. You mentioned the and Department of Justice. I'm and sorry, I said that one more time. And maybe even his mother. You know, Kyle hmm. Rittenhouse was 17 at the time that this happened. There's been a lot of discussion over what was his mother doing? His mother drove him. There are different accounts of where she drove him to, but she knew very clearly that he had this assault weapon and he was going to Kenosha. So there could be civil charges levied against Kyle Rittenhouse, his mother. But, you know, from the standpoint of many people, as long as he's out of jail, he can fight, um, as long as he's not going to jail for life. So even though there's civil charges and he may or may not have the resources to pay for a judgment, but I don't think his legal troubles are over. One thing we do know, it does appear that, um, according to his attorney there, Mark Richards, that Rittenhouse will not continue living in Antioch, Illinois, just over the border there um, from Wisconsin because of the death threats. He's had um, security around the clock there. We don't know if that will continue. Uh, but just moments ago, President Biden spoke from the White House lawn following a physical examination this morning at Walter Reed National Medical Center. He spoke about the Kyle Rittenhouse verdict. Let's listen in. I just heard a moment ago. Do you have any reactions? I, I didn't watch the trial, so I, you know. Do you stand by your past comments equating him to white supremacy? Well, look, I stand by what the jury has concluded. The jury system works, and we have to abide by it. Sir, what is the state of your... Again, President Biden speaking on the South Lawn of the White House, um, his brief comments about the Kyle Rittenhouse verdict that 
again, the whole nation is talking about at this point. Um, a big thanks to our panel there, C.K. Hoffler and Bernarda Villalona, uh, for speaking with us and putting it all perspective. As we heard from Mark Richards, the attorney, the defense attorney for Kyle Rittenhouse, they're sticking with us because we're going to go back to the other big trial that we're covering right here on ABC News Live, and that is the trial and the death of Ahmaud Arbery, where the judge has been listening to both the prosecution and defense as they have this charging conference and um, get those jury instructions together. You see Judge Wamsley. Let's go back into the courtroom. Ahmaud had survived, and we were having an argument about what was going on out there. But we're not having that kind of argument. Ms. Danikoski has every bit of law she needs to make her case without this piece. If, if I could put one point uh, on, on the camera. Yeah. How many people am I going to get attacked by? Well, we're, I'm not, just, a, just to have a conversation, I take it, and just to, just to add a point, and, I, I, and it's, I think it makes it clear, citizens' arrest never was completed. It, it ended. It was a, a, an attempted citizens' arrest that stopped at the point of the front of of the McMichael's truck. And then it turned, if, if it was a citizen's arrest at all, up to that point, it then turned into a self-defense case from the defense's point of view, or a self-defense case from the state's point of view. Let me tell you, I, I'm inclined to leave it there. I'll, I'll continue to think about it, because there's more that, to it than just what happened in front of the truck. There are the various interactions between uh, Mr. Aubrey and uh, the McMichaels on Burford. There is the, there are a number of interactions uh, just, well, mainly Burford is what I'm thinking about, all which is part of this larger interaction, which would be the attempt to detain or arrest, depending on how you want to say that. So if one thinks about it separate from the actual incident that resulted in the death of Mr. Arbery, and we look at it in the broader sense from the moment, for example, um, the McMichaels left the driveway and were trying to detain him or arrest him, he, he has the right to resist that in some way or run away. Um, if necessary, to prevent the arrest. That's where I'm getting hung up. So I'm going to keep it in there for the time being. I'll spend some time over the weekend thinking that through, just as there's another charge out there that we need to. And, and, but at this point, I'll, I'll plan to give it with the understanding. I'm going to spend some time thinking it through. Thank you, Judge. So right, going on. We got one standing. Oh, sorry. Your Honor, the court might consider the alternative of taking the last sentence under 316.40 and adding it to this sentence under 316.41, because respectfully to learned co-counsel, there is a third issue. The, that, that issue is assuming that the arrest of Mr. Arbery was unlawful. Does that convert or translate into a license to kill? I would submit not. It, it, the court needs to, needs to charge the jury that last sentence in resisting. The person being arrested would not be authorized to use force that is unlawful or disproportionate to the amount of force necessary to prevent the unlawful force being used against the person. Under these facts, a jury could conclude, arguably, that the arrest was unlawful, but at the same time that the force used to resist that arrest was excessive and disproportionate. Otherwise, what we're doing is we're translating the right to resist an unlawful arrest effectively into a license to kill if we don't explain to the jury what it means to say whether such force is reasonably necessary to prevent the arrest or not. You need that last sentence, if not that whole paragraph, you need that last sentence in 31640 for the jury to understand the concept that excessive, the concept of excessive force applies both to the defendants on trial and to the person that is deceased. And all this talk about whether Mr. Arbery is a defendant might be relevant on issues like how you burden shifting in charges and all. They don't apply here. But in terms of the rules, rules for the use of force, the fact that Mr. Arbery is deceased has absolutely nothing to do with the legal analysis here. Moving on. Is that OK, Your Honor? 268.32. 
two. Sixty. This is criminal trespass. I believe we all had agreed to this, and it was pre-charged. It was pre-charged. Correct. Mm -hmm. And then the state. Uh, I, agree. I don't believe I agreed to the criminal trespass charge. It was in, I think it's it was already in been charged, charged to the jury. Well, uh, that if the evidence is presented, if there's no evidence to support criminal trespass, then the court should not repeat the charge and close it. We object to that charge. Court place keep 268.32. And then the state requested um, duty owed to a trespasser. And the state is requesting this because there's a duty owed by a landowner or his agent to not willfully or intentionally injure a trespasser. And this is based on Mansfield versus Caldwell Construction, a 2000 case. And the duty owed to a trespasser is to avoid willfully or wantonly injuring that person. Even when the property owner knows that it is customary for trespassers to come upon the, pre the premises, the duty owed is merely to refrain from willfully and want wantonly injuring him once his presence is known and no duty of anticipating the decedent's presence is imposed. In other words, you can't set traps. You can't go ahead and do something to harm this person. In this case, we thought that it was appropriate to let the jury know that just because they may consider, I don't know if they will, they may consider Mr. Arbery a trespasser, that somehow being a trespasser allowed someone to commit aggravated assault or false imprisonment or shoot him. And that is why we asked for this charge. Interesting charge yeah, is Mr. English will run I was going to say, I, the Thank court you. doesn't plan to charge on it. Uh, this addresses a landowner or his agent, uh, and I think there was, I believe, through Mr. English himself, if not one other witness, discussion about whether they were acting as agents for the landowner. So. And I didn't know if that was going to come out. I had no idea if Mr. English was going to go ahead and, because I filed these in July, say that, oh, yeah, they were acting as my agent, and if they had. So, the, yeah, the court does not intend to charge them. All right, and then we had burglary in the first degree, which everyone asked for, and it is pattern. We have burglary entry amplified, which is pattern. Your Honor, before we move past 26211, we don't believe that is an accurate statement of the law. Uh, and I would remind Your Honor of the 10 million times that the state referred to the open, open secured construction site in this case. Under Georgia law, Smith v. State, 226 Georgia Appeals 9 at 11 to 12, previously cited to, in the charge submitted, a house under construction which is so completed as to be capable of sheltering people, animals, or property constitutes a dwelling under Georgia law. It's not simply whether it's uh, intended or designed. If it is sufficiently complete that it provides shelter for property, then it is a structure covered by the burglary statute. And one can see in the video that the home, while not fully dried in, as a contractor might refer to it, because the doors and windows aren't there, but the roof is there, and the, the extensive tools and building materials inside are clearly sheltered from the rain uh, and most of the wind, and therefore we're entitled to have that language from Smith v. State included when the court charges a jury on what a dwelling is. The state disagrees. Um, this is sufficient because it says, a dwelling includes any house, building, or structure which is designed or intended for occupancy for residential use. It makes no difference whether the building or structure was occupied, unoccupied, or vacant. However, you may consider occupation status in determining whether or not the structure in question was designed or intended for residential use. Um, so in this case, that covers everything. It's obvious it's a house under construction. Everybody's referred to it as a house. I don't think there needs to be any additional discussion about that. This pattern charge covers everything. Well, Your Honor, if there's no disagreement or discussion to be had about whether the open, unsecured construction site constitutes a dwelling, then why don't we just go ahead and charge the jury that I charge you that the residence of 220 Satilla at the time of these events is a structure under the burglary statute or under the laws of the state of Georgia and eliminate that so the state isn't backdoor arguing residual doubt as an excuse to convict these defendants. What's that? State asked for the pattern, Judge. Yeah, court will go ahead and charge the pattern just like I charged in the preliminary instructions. And then so the court is not going to charge the jury under Smith v. State? I'm going to charge, I just said I'm going to charge the pattern just like I charged in the preliminary instruction. Yes. So burglary 
Entry Amplified is also a pattern charge. And the next one, Burglary Intent to Steal Amplified, is also a pattern charge. And that continues from page 21 over to the top of page 22. And Your Honor, the, I, I believe we, with respect to the top of page 22, uh, we've also asked the court to charge on flight. And I think that was generally discussed earlier. But it comes up again here under the burglary statute, reminding uh, the court again that a defendant on trial, there are presumption of innocence, there's all kinds of case law and burden shifting instructions, and that's what makes charging a jury on flight challenging when a defendant is on trial. But as the state has so frequently noted, Mr. Arbery is not on trial, uh, but his conduct, again, is in question. If Mr. Arbery was on trial, could the state today, under the current law, get a charge on flight? I would think it still probably could. But all the complications involved in giving a flight instruction in the trial of a criminal defendant in a burglary case don't apply in this situation because technically Mr. Arbery is not on trial. And because he's not on trial, all those concerns expressed in the case law and in, in the adjustment of the charges don't apply here. There's no reason why the court could not and should not give a charge on flight in this case, particularly because the burglary cases themselves, there's a whole body of case law, particular burglary cases on flight. And, and that distinguishes this from any other case involving flight. Given those, those cases, including Anthony v. State, 347 Georgia Act 807, Evans v. State, 148 Georgia Act 422, and Battle v. State, 178 Georgia Act 655, the particular case law for burglary demonstrates why a charge on flight is appropriate in this case. The state disagrees that flight is appropriate in this case. As you know, flight has been disapproved. Um, flight has been approved for a limiting instruction on behalf of a defendant when the state presents some evidence of flight. Um, it doesn't apply here in this case. I understand the court has already ruled and decided, or they can argue it, um, but that it's not appropriate as a jury charge because it has only been used to limit under a limiting instruction. Yeah, no, the court doesn't, as I said earlier, the court does not intend to charge on flight. That doesn't prevent the argument. Um, again, the charge on flight, even I think at this point, would get into some of this discussion about what was in Mr. Aubrey's mind at the time. And so, again, the court is not going to charge on it. The argument based on, uh, if the argument is made based upon um, reasonable conclusions uh, made from the uh, evidence presented, uh, that, that's fine, but I'm not going to charge on it. All right, Judge. Affirmative defenses by the McMichaels. I think this is old pattern because I recognize it. Um, however, the new pattern is a little different, and that is 3.0000. And it reads this way. The defendant has raised a defense that even if he committed the act described in the indictment, there are circumstances that, and then it has parentheses, justify, excuse, mitigate it. Once this defense is raised, the state must disprove it beyond a reasonable doubt. And it's sort of just a general thing. Um, so I think the state would prefer, and while well, that's good law, 3.00.00, that it should be generically done for the defense has raised a defense that even if he committed the act described in the indictment, there are circumstances that justify it. Once this defense is raised, the state must disprove it beyond a reasonable doubt. And then, of course, we're going to go into justification in the use of force in defense of self or others. So the objection to what's in there, self-defense is an affirmative defense, which is a defense that admits the doing of an act charge but invokes a legal defense to justify it. Once an affirmative defense is raised, the burden is on the state to disprove it beyond a reasonable doubt. Yes, I prefer the wording from the pattern that I just read versus how they charged it because it only talks about self-defense. And, and the problem is they've also got the affirmative defense of citizen's arrest. And so the way I just read it is they're going to, an affirmative defense is something that basically says, I'm justified in doing what I did. And it doesn't list self-defense. It doesn't list citizen's arrest. It's a little bit more generic because it does encompass both of their defenses that way, um, as opposed to specifically saying it's a defense that admits the doing of the act charged but invokes a legal defense to justify it. The state does not think that the words but invokes a legal defense to justify it were patterned previously and are patterned now. And the state just would prefer 3.00.00. .00. I, 
I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm trying to keep up. You know, you can yeah, speak very that. quickly, and so I'm trying to figure out which part of this you say is no longer yeah, let me get to it. pattern instruction 3.0000, which was our defense request to charge number nine. Right, none of it. I'm sorry, I'll read it. This is the new pattern jury instructions, and I'll read it very slowly. 3.00.00, affirmative defense, definition, burden of proof. The defendant has raised a defense that even if he committed the act described in the indictment, there are circumstances that justify, in parentheses, excuse, parentheses, mitigate it. Once this defense is raised, the state must disprove it beyond a reasonable doubt. I like that. I'll give you a page out of this okay. if you want to take okay. a look at it. That's the charges. So. Yes, I like that. Except where does, do we then say self-defense is an affirmative defense? Oh, it's the very next thing. Okay, all right. Okay. No, I'm, I'm not fighting with you. All right. Yeah. You know, it's, it's the very next thing. I, I believe we both asked for pattern on... 3.10.10, um, and it's the pattern which starts off sometimes, well, that's not the pattern. Um, You're probably looking at the old pattern, 3.101, let's see. I must have just on that time switched back. I didn't realize yeah, there's, that. The next is, on the new pattern, the next is 3.10.10. No, 31010 is actually self defense. It's actually 3.01.10. That's right. Just okay. have a lot of fun with the number. Generally, yeah. Right. right. So justification generally. I don't think anybody's asked for justification generally. So I think we need to probably include 3.01.10 and modify it for the facts of this case. Well, I, I actually like that new language better. It okay. reads better. Ugh. Okay, so so here's the thing. I think let's look at it. I'm talking to the defense. Let's look at 3.01.10 over the weekend because like B, C, D, E, and F don't apply. And then it says when the person's conduct is justified under OCGA sections. Yeah, I, I normally tailor that to the actual, I mean, in this case, I don't think anybody's disputing what the affirmative defenses right. are, <laughs> and so it, yeah. it can be put in, let's see, the defendant has raised a defense, I guess the, really the defendant has raised defenses, or the defendants have raised defenses that even if an act was committed as described in the indictment. There are circumstances that justify it. Once such a defense is raised, the state must disprove it by a reasonable doubt, or beyond a reasonable doubt. Then 3.01.10, the fact that a person's conduct is justified is a defense to prosecution for any crime based on that conduct. The defense of justification can be claimed in the case of self-defense and citizen's arrest, or I guess it would be and or citizen's arrest. Correct, and or. And or citizen's arrest. And then you go into 3.10.10, which Correct. is justification. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I, 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 I'm not sure whether I said that, but I'm not sure whether we got that. Did we get that? Mm -hmm. Not getting anybody's attention. We followed. Did we get that? We yes, followed. Sir. All right. Just because I said it doesn't mean it was written down at the time <laughs> I said it. I just want to make sure we've got that. Um. All right, we will attempt to make sure that language then appears in the charge, okay? All right, so 3.10.10, justification, use of force. This is the self-defense charge. Um, I believe, based on Travis McMichael's testimony that he was worried about his dad in the truck that they are going to request, and correct me if I'm wrong, correct. himself or a third person. Correct. All right, no objection from the state. The state understands that. To defend himself or a third person? Correct. Okay. And then the, the problem that we have here is 
the first part, a defendant is justified in threatening or using force against another when one, two, and three is fine. Then we have a defendant is justified in using force that is intended to or likely to cause death or serious bodily injury. So the, we've got two different sections. We've got one that's just basically, hey, we're going to have a knife fight or a fist fight. And the other one is likely to cause death or serious bodily injury. So I think we take out the first subset of one, two, and three, and it just goes right into no. likely. Because there's two different acts that are alleged by the state. The pointing of the pistol would be self-defense also. Of the, uh, I'm sorry, the shotgun. I asked for A and B. Yeah. I, I love to do that because that, that's why I understood it too. There are a couple different acts which this covers, which are all arguable before the jury. And you, this allows the parties to act them, act, act, argue them um, either as use of force generally or use of force, deadly force. This just gives the jury what the standard is for both or either, depending on what's being argued. Okay. I understand. So then when we come down to a defendant is justified in using deadly force, he reasonably believes that the use of such force is necessary to prevent death or serious bodily injury to himself, a third person. Well, at that point, if we're talking about deadly force, not the pointing of the shotgun, but the shooting of the shotgun, third person doesn't apply here. It does apply. I'm sorry. It does apply. Yeah, because if the shotgun is taken out of his hands, he's testified he was afraid he was going to take the shotgun and use it to shoot himself or his father. That's an arguable fact. All right. The commission of a forcible felony, which means a felony that involves the use of force or violence against another. And, of course, that felony is blank. We would ask for aggravated assault, using fists and punching. Trying to take the shotgun. Trying to, use take, the shotgun. trying to take the shotgun would be an aggravated assault. Well, and the fists punching, because he's the evidence is he was punched all over the face and the side. There was some testimony that fists are which has been defined. I think. No, it hasn't been defined. Yes, it, it has to be been defined, defined by this point. It has to be defined. To, let's see. You, you might have to, in the definition of aggravated assault, where you define um, use of a truck, use of a gun, uh, may have to also add use of hands and fists. Well, actually, our violence against an aggravated assault is a felony, which can also be defined as. Well, actually, it actually doesn't say, it says pickup truck in one location, but it adds to the indictment. It says by objects when used offensively against another person. And so they're going to argue, well, hands and fists are objects when used offensively against another person can cause serious bodily injury. So it actually just generically says objects. Yeah, but then we get into the whole, there's language, though, that at least I use when we talk about fists right. that uh -huh. define a fist as uh, a weapon depending on how they've been used. Mm -hmm. So you would need that language, I think, if we're going to go down this path. Okay. State understands. And aggravated assault can also, because I've already defined aggravated assault as a felony. Mm -hmm. So aggravated assault can also occur with use of fists if you determine them to be a deadly weapon. I think an offensive weapon. Offensive weapon. Yeah.
Okay, so what I've got here is B, the commission of a forcible felony, which means a felony that involves the use of force or violence against another. Aggravated assault is, again, a felony which can occur by use of fists if they are used as an offensive weapon. Yes, Judge. Sounds good with us. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. And then on to the top of page 23, um, we, of course, have a defendant is not justified in threatening or using force if he, and we have our second thing, which is committing a felony, and we ask that all three felonies, aggravated assault, false imprisonment, or criminal attempt at false imprisonment, which have previously been defined for you. has been is that the defendants are doing all three of these things and the state is going to argue all three of these things they committed felonies against him they were the initial aggressors and that they attempted to provoke him but provoke his threat or use of force in order to use that against him um, because they wish to harm him I mean we're going to go ahead that we're, we're going to argue all three and we feel that the uh, facts of the case we can make a reasonable inference that that's what the defendants were doing doing all three of these things, and they're not justified. So we want all three of those in there. We feel we can make a reasonable inference from the evidence based on that. No, I don't think that sentence is included in the pattern. Which one? It says the defendant is not justified in threatening or using force. This is on 310.10. If he provokes the threat or use of force against, intending to use that threat as an excuse to harm, number two is attempting to commit Oh, a felony. Blank is a felony. Committing a felony. Yeah, I see it. I yeah. see it. It's the initial aggressor. Yeah, I removed the third, which is the combat, oh, not third, fourth, which is the combat by agreement language. That clearly has not done. Your Honor, this does bring back, though, that, that point that we were raising very early on with the court about the idea of initial aggressor and the, the law around other acts that establish who the initial aggressor is. This is sort of where, remember we were talking about 404B acts, yeah. and where you start having that term initial aggressor, this is why we were focused on that term, because the law thinks about, is it possible that Mr. Arbor could be the initial aggressor, which that evidence supports, even though it's not known by the yeah, plaintiff. No, I, I've considered that. I, to me, this is something, again, that is, is, or can be determined by the jury by looking at the video as well as taking into consideration. I mean, it depends, I realize, on the definition of how, when this started, um, but I, the court is going to include that because the way I see it is the jury can make that determination without uh, going beyond the evidence that's been presented in the case. You know, I, I got to object to this third portion of that being the initial aggressor. It's not tailored to the case. This is a, a citizen arrest case. <laughs> Anytime someone's attempting to arrest someone, they are always the aggressor. They're, they're entitled to use uh, force to do it. So uh, I mean, if the state wants to, the court to charge this, this, they're going to have to adjust it to the facts of the case. Or the court's going to have to give more specific instruction on use of force than I see in this charge. Any time someone, including a police officer, any police officer is arguably the aggressor if they are trying to arrest someone, because arrest inherently involves the application of force or potential application of force. So to just give this pattern justification charge uh, without additional or, uh, instructions or qualification of that is misrepresenting the applicable law in this case. If they're trying to make a citizen arrest, of course they're the aggressor. That makes some sense. Um, the remedy is the issue of, of how the language you use. And it would seem to me to be the initial unlawful aggressor might solve that problem. Your Honor, the 
state's position is, is that they were the aggressors. Their defense to that is, we were doing a citizen's arrest. So they're trying to put the cart before the horse by going, oh, well, you have to do, they're the initial aggressors. If they're trying to say they're not, then they get to put up citizen's arrest, and then we have to disprove it beyond a reasonable doubt. But our opinion is, it's the initial aggressor. You start this, you don't get to claim self-defense. Let them present that argument to Cobb County SO when this case is over. I mean, you can't, you're not an aggressor simply because you're trying to make an arrest. And the assumption that you're an aggressor because you're doing that, that's an affront to the entire law enforcement community, aside from being not adjusted to the facts of this case. I think it is an unjustified initial aggressor. Uh, that aggressor. Makes sense, yeah. I think that's accurate. I mean, if they're not, you see, is the initial aggressor, unju yeah, is an unjustified initial aggressor. The state respectfully asks not to put unjustified in there. And the reason for this is, once again, the cart before the horse. The assumption is, is that, I put this, someone who's the initial aggressor you go, hey, you were the initial aggressor. Well, then you step in front and you go, hey, I wasn't the initial aggressor because of these facts. To say, well, state, you have to go ahead and say unjustified initial aggressor um, really puts the cart before the horse in this case because the state's going to argue they're the initial aggressors. They're going to argue citizen's arrest. And I really would like to stick with pattern on this, Your Honor, and putting in unjustified initial aggressor. That means somehow there is justification to be the initial aggressor. This conflation of law enforcement, law enforcement officer making a legitimate arrest is completely different than the affirmative defense to a murder case of citizen's arrest. So to compare the two of them is, is not correct. That's not what's happening here. This is not for law enforcement. They're not law enforcement. The defendants aren't. This is a self-defense case, and a defendant is not justified in threatening, meaning putting up a shotgun, or using force, meaning shooting someone, if he is the initial aggressor. Not the initial unjustified aggressor, just the initial aggressor. I'm so sure. I guess what, I'm, what it really comes down to is really the issue is the citizen's mm -hmm. arrest and whether the citizen's arrest was, was proper. Mm -hmm. um, if it was, then um, this whole idea of initial aggressor, I mean, the aggression was justified. So what I'm trying to avoid is this becoming the issue as opposed to citizen's arrest, which is really the core of it, because the citizen's arrest is the justification. The citizen's arrest is the justification for being the initial aggressor. Right. Okay. The citizen's arrest is, I guess, the justification also for, hey, we committed these felonies. We're agreeing we committed these felonies. Okay. But no. my concern is that putting in unjustified initial aggressor somehow elevates this and it's going to start conflating self defense with citizen's arrest. I feel that they can go ahead and make their argument that, hey, he was acting in self-defense, and the reason he was acting in self-defense is he was attacked, we know that's coming, and he was unjustly attacked because he was making a citizen's arrest. And therefore, that takes it out of the initial aggressor category. So the state's just concerned by adding language here, it, it, it really puts an, a different onerous on the state and the state's argument. One final point, Your Honor, is, is a citizen making a lawful citizen's arrest stands in the same shoes as a police officer. In this case law, plenty of case law on that. There's no difference between them at that point. So a, a police officer making the arrest, as Mr. Goff said, would almost by definition be the aggressor in that situation, even though he's allowed to do that. So I, I do think there needs to be some modification of that, of that uh, adjective. Could the state perhaps show us a case, a precedent? Of course, there aren't many precedents in Georgia where police officers have been prosecuted for anything. But can they show some precedent where, in an arrest context, this charge is appropriate? Because I can't find it. 
All the cases I see draw no distinction when making an arrest between a police officer, a bail bondsman, or a private citizen here or anywhere else. Now, I've submitted a charge, and I know the state doesn't like it, but the state is the one conflating issues here when it comes to citizen arrest. They're the ones conflating the issues. They're confusing issues that don't matter in this case. The authority of a private citizen to investigate crime is different than that of a police officer. We agree. The circumstances under which a private citizen may make an arrest are more limited than those under which a police officer may do so. That's true. And it is certainly true that the consequences of an unlawful arrest by a private citizen are very different than the consequences of a police officer. But the application of the rules of force is identical. And we certainly want to take that up certainly today because I got my, my little layout, the child's, the, I forget what they call it, uh, from the toy store and I got my police car because that's going to be our demonstra part of our demonstrations in front of the jury. So if we're not allowed to argue that, we sure better know before the day is out. Among other things, I'd like to be able to go take the police car and the street diagram back and get a refund. Your Honor, the state does have case law. Can I, can I focus us back on where we are? Sure. We're dancing on the head of a pin. Okay. I'm going to charge it as is an unjustified initial arrest. Okay, let's keep moving. Reasonable beliefs. I believe that's pattern and everyone has requested that. No duty to retreat, pattern. Justification, use of force, defense of property. That is something the state has requested. Um, can, can I wait? I'm sorry, can I s slow down? I'm sorry. 3, 10, 13, no duty to retreat is actually not what the statute says. The statute, um, and I know there's code sections, so we don't want to necessarily use the statute, but it says a person who uses threats or force in accordance with the code sections relating to the use of force in defense of self or others has no duty to retreat and has the right to stand his or her ground and use force as provided, including deadly force. And I would ask the court to include that phrase, including deadly force. That's 16-3-23.1. We join. Agree. Uh, Talk about going too fast. I'm sorry. between the pattern charge. The pattern is 3.10.13, and it is as the court has right here, a person who is not the aggressor is not required to retreat before being justified in using force he reasonably believes to be necessary. And of course, the statute actually says, has no duty to retreat, this is the last, very last sentence, or last part has no duty to retreat and has the right to stand his or her ground and use force as provided in said code sections, okay, which are self-defense, defensive habitation, including deadly force. Can I, can I back up? I, I'm planning to charge it the way that it is, and, and let me just tell you, it, it is under 31013. 31013 is provides authority 16.323.1, but it also goes through a number of cases, including most recently Reed versus State, but we've got six or seven cases um, that this particular charge um, has been uh, tailored with, and uh, I'm comfortable that it's an accurate reflection of the law. Uh, I understand the statute's there, that the charge itself cites the statute and, and the case is underneath it. Okay, and maybe just, just streamlining purposes here, <coughs> 
Uh, the next one, 3.14.10, use of force and defense of property. But I don't see any uh, authority, uh, any factual basis for that. We'd ask that that be removed. Black flag for Jordan. Well, you know, the reason we ask for this is kind of the last part. The use of force that is intended or likely to cause death or great bodily harm in order to prevent a trespass is not justified unless the person using force reasonably believes that such force is necessary to prevent the commission of a forcible felony. Burglary, theft, and trespass are not forcible felonies. So basically what the court, what the state is asking is that you inform the jury that you can't go killing people in order to prevent them from trespassing or committing burglary or theft because this appears to be a, hey, he's a burglar, must have stolen that stuff off that boat back in November. We're justified in using lethal force at this point. So the state wishes for this charge to be given so that the jury's not under the misapprehension that burglary somehow allows lethal force. We're pretty sure that nobody yeah. thinks that there's such a thing like that, especially after the admonition. Uh, Ms. Donikowski is, is the only person who would ever um, be arguing anything like, we thought he should be killed because he might have been a trespasser. This is not somebody coming onto that property and just shooting him dead like that. That description is... It sounds like social media, not like what happened in this trial. Yeah, the court doesn't intend to charge um, use of force and defense of property. Yes, Your Honor. Excessive force, 3.16.20. This is the pattern charge. Why do I feel like this is the third time we've read this charge? It's not. We have. We. The reason you feel that way is because Mr. Goff brought up excessive force repeatedly during the resisting arrest part, which isn't part of that. So I think that's why you probably think you've heard it. But this is the first time excessive force is being used here. Well, hold on. But that gets back to the prior discussion, because how many different times are we going to charge about excessive? I mean, I want to charge once. I think some other people in the room don't want to charge at all. But to be charging it two, multiple times, the problem is we have specific rules of force that apply to the context of an arrest. And those supersede general rules that would otherwise apply in the justification charge. Justification covers all kinds of force cases. The resisting arrest and the right to make the arrest, the rules of force that apply are specific to this case. And that's the, what the jury should be charged with. There's no reason to be given this 316-20 charge at all. Actually, there is, Judge, because what we've got is we've got excessive force relates specifically to self-defense. A defendant is not justified in using excessive force while acting in self-defense. So this relates specifically to self-defense, which is why it's right here. And if you decide that a defendant used more force than was reasonably necessary to defend against the alleged victim's threats or use of force, then the defendant's actions would not be justified. So, Judge, that's, of course, the core of the state's case. You pulled a shotgun on an unarmed jogger. It's excessive force, even if we get there. Because, of course, we've got to overcome citizen's arrest, then we've got to overcome self-defense, then we've got to overcome, well, even if you think it was self-defense, it was excessive. The previous excessive force related specifically to making a citizen's arrest. So this relates to <laughs> self-defense specifically, and we ask that you give it as the pattern. If I may, Your Honor. What we have here is a situation that's comparable to what we used to call a sequential charge problem. The primary charge in the primary defense in this case is citizen arrest. Self-defense is a secondary defense. And justification in the rules of force, the rules of force allowed in a citizen arrest context take priority over the rules of force in the general justification charge. For example, if a jury finds that the McMichael defendants did not use excessive force in attempting to effectuate an arrest, then how could they be, be authorized to use that force under the citizen arrest but not authorized to use that force under self-defense? That would make no sense. If, if you wouldn't even get to, to addressing the excessive use of force under justification. You wouldn't even get to self-defense until after the jury has considered whether the defendants have, have lawfully effectuated a citizen arrest. You wouldn't get there. 
And this is implying to the jury that there's two different standards for excessive force in the one situation and the other. There, there, there isn't. The rules of force that apply in this case, which is an arrest context, are what they are. And the state doesn't get, get to come back in and say, well, maybe it wasn't excessive when they were trying to arrest him, but somehow it is excessive for, for self-defense. That's just going to confuse, confuse the jury. There's only one standard as to whether it's excessive or not. The state doesn't get two bites at the apple. I think that's my issue, Your Honor, is it's, it's confusing, and here's why. 310.10. 310.10 is called. Yeah, I'm seeing you flipping. I'm just giving the title of it. Justification and the Use of Force in Defense of Self or Others. So there's a whole charge that deals with this already. And then that charge, it tells you you can use force if you reasonably believe it's necessary, and then it goes into saying you can use deadly force if you reasonably believe it's necessary, and for the reasons that you can use it. It's explained and encapsulated in this charge. Excessive force is now another term that the jury's being asked to consider, and in a case like this, especially where the state is saying none of this should have happened, it all could have been prevented, it's all excessive, I think that that is gonna be now confusing to the jury, especially where you, it's laid out very clearly in the charge that deals specifically with it. So I think it, it's, it's not only repetitive, but now it's gonna be confusing. We ask that you please give the pattern judge. Excessive force is a central concept to self-defense because lots of people can go, well, I use self-defense, but you went overboard, it's excessive, and that is usually you know, what we've got. And here, it's essential to the state's case. Because while Mr. Goff just argued they don't get two bites of the apple, that's not what's happening here. Mr. Goff asked for 3.16.40, which is the right to resist an unlawful arrest, where the excessive force comes into play. And that's talking about the arrest. That citizen's arrest. This specifically relates to self-defense, and it is part of the pattern, and it is part of the law that goes hand in hand with the concept of self-defense. You want to claim self-defense, that's great. But if what you did was excessive and resulted in someone's death, then the defendant's actions would not be justified. And that is what the state is going to argue here. See, that's why it's confusing. If what you did was excessive and it resulted in someone's death, the state is defining excessive as something that results in someone's death. But the law allows the death of a person, and it's justified. But and that's where 31010 makes the most sense. This, this confuses the issue and now allows the state to argue that death is, quote unquote, per law, per se, excessive. No, that's not what we're arguing. Actually, the whole entire thing says, if you decide that a defendant used more force than was reasonably necessary to defend against the alleged victim's threats or use of force, then the defendant's actions would not be justified. It is not confusing at all. It's obvious the defense does not want this because their client pointed a shotgun at an unarmed jogger. So of course it was excessive. It's excessive just based on the video alone. And I understand why they don't want it, but the idea that it's confusing when it's been the pattern for years in every single self-defense case. You know what has uh, uh, Your Honor, if the, if, the, if the state wants this charge twice, then we again, sequentially, I would humbly suggest that the jury needs to be charged first on citizen arrest and the use of force in citizen arrest and then, secondarily, as to self-defense. Only after the jury has determined that, that the use of force wasn't justified in the context of the citizen arrest did they get to the self-defense issue. And it's the only way to make what the state's doing palatable and plausible where it's not reversible error. Okay. Yeah, now 31010 simply addresses when force can be used, the justification of force. Going, and I've gone back through the language. I've got the charge book in front of me, taking a look at it, and having read through it, it, it does. It discusses when you are justified in using force generally. It does not, 31010, or any of the 310s for that matter, address excessive force, which is this separate issue, which is under 31620. Let's get to 316s. Then your 
Your Honor, you've got also, don't forget, the bottom of 310.10, where it says the defendant is not justified. Right, correct. So this is now a... It's not justified, right. When, when you can't... When you can't justify the force, which is different than using excessive force when justified. Those are two different issues. Okay. That's what I'm reading. That's why I'm going through it, because 310.10 doesn't actually address... If you're justified, if you can use 31010 and claim you are justified, what if it goes overboard? And that's where we get to 31620. So it's two different concepts that I'm reading. And based on that, I'll, I'll go ahead and keep it in. Thank you, Judge. The state then asked for revenge. And we oppose that. There won't be any evidence for that one. We oppose it again. It's not supported by the evidence. Okay. Your Honor, the, uh, it states the defendants are not justified in threatening or using force against another person solely in revenge for something that the person said or did on a previous occasion, no matter how serious the past wrong may have been. On February 11, 2020, Travis McMichael testified that he saw Mr. Arbery, and Mr. Arbery, you know, lifted his shirt up or something or then put his right hand in his left pocket or, or made it seem as if he had a gun and it scared him. He got the heck out and he went on home and told his dad and they got their guns and came back down. It scared him. You could hear it in his voice and his attorneys even asked him, you know, is that you breathing there? And so at this point in time, the state's possession contention is, is that this, it's upsetting. No one wants to be scared. No one likes someone who scares them. No one likes the unknown. So at this point in time, our position is, is Travis McMichael's mad at this guy. Travis McMichael is upset and mad at Mr. Arbery. He scared him, scared him, he ran home. He had to call the police. There was this whole thing that happened and now he's out to get him. And you can't be out to get somebody and do revenge on them for what they had done previously. And I know they're going to say, well, it actually justified his behavior because he was afraid of the guy and wanted to pull the gun out on him because he was a threat. But our position is it's actually the other way around. He's mad at him. He was scared. And this is revenge. This is, you know, you can't do this. You can't come into my neighborhood. You can't go over to that house and, and trespass. You can't be doing these things where I live and I'm taking it out on you because you've been over at that house. It's only a few houses down from mine. And I don't want you here. And therefore, that is, you just can't go after somebody in revenge for previously being on a property a few houses down from your property or for scaring you one night. And that is an argument the state wishes to make. And that is why we can make that reasonable inference based on the facts of this case and the evidence and Travis McMichael's testimony here that this was actually revenge for his, the prior interaction that they had on February 11th. Yeah, there's there's nothing in this case to support it. He never testified about it. Obviously, was concerned, but to the state wants to argue. We understand what that means, but not to give a charge on revenge. Yeah, I don't intend to charge revenge. Verdict generally is the pattern. So maybe I can accelerate this. Does anybody have any objections to verdict generally, multiple defendants, verdict form, and I'll reference the fact we're getting separate verdict forms. Court has no interest, sympathy, responsibility for sentencing, deliberations, unanimous verdict, and retire to the jury room. None from the state. Oh, good. Good. A couple things came up, though, Your Honor. What? what? Still got our oh, we did? Well, just on those, because oh, we're going to take a short break. But we got two that have come up. Okay. Take well, we break. still have to go back to where the court said, uh, page 19, our request to charge on probable cause, and the one that you put in yeah. there. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm I can use a break. Okay, we're going to take a 10 minute recess. Um, Thank you. You are watching our live coverage of the trial and the death of Ahmaud Arbery happening there in Brunswick, South Georgia. What you've been hearing is Judge Wamsley and the prosecution and defense go through this charging conference as they work through the jury instruction, parsing you know, through a lot of words there that are going to be delivered to the jury uh, on Monday 
after closing arguments happen and before the uh, deliberations there. Uh, let's bring in ABC's Alex Fache, who has been following the trial for us outside that courthouse in Brunswick, Georgia, along with trial attorney C.K. Hoffler. C.K., I've been saying uh, when it comes to this charging conference, it, it appears that we're all getting a legal lesson here. We're all in law school, and thankfully we have you as a professor because you can help us go through this. Uh, things like excessive force, the state said, you know, excessive force, that phrase is essential to the state's case. Then we saw revenge, that word, out of the jury instructions there. There are going to be separate verdict forms. Walk us through what we heard just moments ago. Well, what you heard just moments ago is just really the state and um, the defense arguing back and forth about every single word in the jury instructions. This judge is being very methodical, I must say, and he's letting everybody speak because he's, he's very sensitive on people being able to use something that's being left out or something that's in as an appealable issue, a bona fide appealable issue. So he's giving one, everyone the opportunity to speak and then he's gonna rule. And he's actually even on some issues, allow them to come back and brief and give additional authority to support their position. Um, the, the excessive force is very important, of course, to the prosecution's case, because they are saying that each of the defendants, particularly the McMichaels, used excessive force. So they want to have that in the jury instruction. They want to be able to explain what excessive force is because it's important for them in prevailing and carrying their burden. Remember, the prosecution has to carry the burden. They've got to prove their case beyond, re and, and, and it's, it's, it's the burden is very high in criminal cases. You know, in civil case, in civil cases, it's the greater weight of the evidence. It's the preponderance of the evidence. In criminal cases, it's beyond a reasonable doubt because someone could lose their liberty. So what you're hearing is hard fought discussion from both sides because they know what has to be given to the jury in order for them to prevail. And it's the prosecution now that is fighting aggressively to have strong language in there. So the jury will have something to hang its hat on in the event that they, saw, they decide to convict the McMichaels and Mr. Bryan. So that's where we are. This is very normal, very standard. It could even be more heated. I've seen discussions like this, charging conferences, be more heated where the judges had to really almost separate the sides, take a little break, and come back. Um, CK, who's saying is heated. Um, Kevin Goff getting a little animated there. We'll get back to him in just a moment. Uh, but Alex, let me turn to you because we know it's been a long day there. The jury, again, is not inside that courtroom. Uh, that's right. It's a it's a pretty empty gallery inside uh, that 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 courthouse today, and actually even outside the courthouse. I mean, there's obviously a consistent media presence here, but we're not seeing the crowds that we saw yesterday. We actually, even the days leading up to yesterday, uh, there were more people here. And look, I mean, maybe uh, part of that is because. The jury is not there. We're not hearing testimony. This charging conference is, is long and, and detailed and super technical. Uh, but I imagine that, again, after this weekend, whenever we start to hear closing arguments, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get a little bit more activity out here. And CK, you know, Alex just mentioned how technical it is. And essentially, you know, I always say we do this in the world of journalism as well. We learn as much about the subject and the topic and the issue as possible, and then we try to make it um, as simple as possible for the viewer to understand. And so we've got to do this for the jury as well. They get those jury instructions, and I would think what we're hearing today could be very complex, very confusing for them. But obviously on Monday, Judge Walmsley and both sides want to make this pretty simple for the jury when they get those instructions. No, absolutely. There's still going to be something, uh, some words that are confusing for the jury, but the judge will probably, this judge, based on his performance up until this point, will probably be very methodical and read those instructions slowly and carefully. Then, really honestly, what the defense and the prosecution must do is they must take the critical jury instructions that will help support their case and explain to the jury the law that the judge is going to instruct them on. Because the closing, the closing arguments are before the jury receives the charge. So once they agree on the charge, they've got the language, which of course would happen before they do their closings, it is up to the prosecution 
and the defense prosecution will go first to explain to the jury what is meant by any of the instructions that they must have, that they must have them understand. That's the duty of the lawyers in the case. You can't just leave it to the judge to read it. You've got to tell this jury how to rule in your favor, what they need to focus on. And the prosecution is going to have to put it together for the jury because they have the burden of proof of how they can return a verdict in favor of a conviction against all three of the defendants and why based on the law that the jurors are going to receive from the judge shortly. That's going to be critically important. Otherwise, the jurors can just be confused. If they're confused, that will create this thought of maybe there's reasonable doubt. Reasonable doubt, if reasonable doubt comes into the picture, then you have acquittals. So I believe it's going to be on the prosecution to, yes, continue to fight, but then they've got to explain the critical jury instructions to the jurors in closing. I always reserve part of my closing argument, because remember, it's closing argument. It's not a statement, but it's argument for the jurors, because you can add in examples. You're arguing to the jury of why and how you, how they can rule in your favor and why this instruction is important and what they must do. And you need to use graphics. You need to draw on the board, do all the things you need to do, because implanted in their mind should be what you were saying, if you're the prosecution, in terms of how to convict these defendants. If you're in defense, you're doing the exact same thing, but from the other vantage point, you're saying to them, there is reasonable doubt all over the place. And if you follow the law, you must acquit all three of these defendants. Each of the lawyers will get up there and say that, representing the defendants. So no matter how complicated it is, it's up to the lawyers on both sides to simplify it for the jury. Otherwise, they may very well lose the jury on one word. You don't want to leave the jury to their own devices when they've never been exposed to some of this language. And let's remind our viewers that Gre Gregory McMichael, Travis McMichael, William Roddy Bryant are facing nine counts, including malice murder, felony murder, aggravated assault, and false imprisonment. CK, you mentioned there that obviously the prosecution has to meet this burden of proof here. Was there anything that surprised you about what you've heard so far that the prosecutor, Linda Donikowski, was trying to get into those jury instructions? Like... She wanted the word revenge. Did that surprise you or any other words surprise you that she was trying to get in there? No, it didn't surprise me at all. What she wants to do is get as much, I want to say inflammatory, but words that would point to the fact that the McMichaels had ulterior motives, that this was not about self-defense. This was about revenge. This was about excessive use of force. It was about everything other than following the law because they just wanted it. They saw this black man and they just assumed he was up to no good. They just assumed he was committing a crime. They just assumed that he was a thug and he was a criminal and they were determined to track him down, hunt him down, do whatever they could and then ultimately murder murder him. And for that to be the case, she needs these words in the jury instructions. You're not going to get everything that you want, but hopefully you get enough so that you can make your case if you're the prosecution to the jury so the jury can hang its hat on a jury instruction and get a conviction. So and, Alex, there was a, you're, and Alex, there was a word that Linda Donikowski wanted um, taken out, but it was left in. Uh, that's right, and that's in this phrase, initial unjustified aggressor. Uh, the prosecutor just wanted initial aggressor in here, saying that she believed that that would conflate uh, and confuse the defense, or excuse me, confuse the jury uh, with, uh, with, with, with some of uh, the, the, the tent poles of, of a citizen's arrest. Um, also, uh, that in closing, it could be something that the defense would use to throw seeds of doubt as to uh, if the actions by Gregory and Travis McMichael during that chase and ultimately pulling that shotgun uh, on Ahmaud Arbery that day were indeed justified. Wow, if we're in law school, then Alex Perche, I think you would definitely get an A while I'm getting a C plus over here. Uh, no, and again, back to our, our professor, uh, CK, uh, it, looks, it looks like there are going to be some props uh, that defense attorney Kevin Goff wants to use. He mentioned something about a toy car here. here. Um, I guess we shouldn't be surprised that potentially he'd come with some, some props uh, to his closing argument. 
Oh, yes, yes. You know, he's going to, and, and, and again, remember, he just represents Mr. Bryan. So he's going to want to demonstrate that what Mr. Bryan did with his truck, I guess maybe that's a toy car, was, was perfectly reasonable, that he was completely justified in doing that, and that it was not, it was not vicious, it was not aggressive. He felt that there was a crime being committed. I mean, they're going to have to build this case to justify self-defense. So if he has this toy car, maybe he's going to, and I don't know what he's going to do, but maybe he's going to use that prop to justify what his client did and also try to separate what his client did versus what the other two defendants did. Because remember, his position is, don't treat my client the way you treat them. I'm not saying that they were wrong and they weren't justified, but my client definitely wasn't wrong or, 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 or and my client was justified in what he did. And so the only thing that he would really want to demonstrate is the use of the truck, Mr. Bryant's truck, the actions that he took relative to Mont Arbery and his truck. And we will see what happens, what plays out during those closing arguments. Expect it for Monday. Again, let's go back into the courtroom. That quick break is over. Judge Wamsley is speaking. Cause can be based upon the collective knowledge of others, so long as there's some degree of communication between them. I also, right now, would like to add, uh, when we're, uh, if you would look on state's request to charge number 57, they have a nice quote from the forehand case, page 22. Mm -hmm. Got it. Uh, right in the middle of it, it says uh, that the officer need not see the act which constitutes that the crime takes place, but, but I like, if by any of his senses he has personal knowledge of its commission, which is consistent not only with forehand, but also the language of those other cases. So if we were to stick that clause in as well to help explain where probable cause can come from. So it could be based on the collective knowledge of others, um, you know, any of his senses, he has personal knowledge of its commission. Actually, that's very clumsy, but where maybe with, with you have it in front of you, uh, where you, however you thought that clause could come in. Because I think, you know, obviously the state and, and the defense would agree that that's how one develops probable cause. What you hear, what you see, what you smell, what you taste, what you uh, understand, uh, and what you, through all of your senses. Or just the development of probable cause through all of your senses. because you made a good point, Your Honor, between the hearing things, seeing Matt Albenzi. asking that that be dropped into the probable cause charge? Uh, the, in determining, um, when we're talking about the totality of the circumstances, where probable cause can be based upon uh, just something having to do with them. Uh, Your well, information you're... gathered through <clears throat> any of the individual senses, but it also can be based upon the collective knowledge of others, so long as there's some degree of communication between them. So, Your Honor, if I may, um, first off, by the existence of any of his senses is already going to be charged on the top of page 19. So that is up there with terms are synonymous, and it talks about if by the exercise of any of his senses he has knowledge of its commission. Oh, okay. So that's, that's already there. That's fine. Yeah. I, I was just getting late, and I, I, didn't, uh, okay. I knew I liked that line. <laughs> and it's there. Um, Your Honor, the problem the state has with this request is that the state agreed that if we were going to put this in, that we wanted it if the offense is a felony and the offender is attempting to escape. If we take out those two lines, then it's a private person can arrest the offender upon probable cause. But that's not really what the statute says. It says you have to have, may arrest the offender if the offense is committed in his presence or within his immediate knowledge. If the offense is a felony and the offender is escaping or attempting to escape, that's when the probable cause comes into play. So the state, if we're going to do the definition of probable cause, would agree with the defense that the offense is a felony and the offender is attempting to escape. 
Okay, well, maybe, and maybe looking at some of my concern then with this suspicion alone. Gets satisfied if going off the request to charge number four, I do the entire thing, including one, the offense is a felony, and two, the offender is attempting to escape, and then I'm comfortable taking it down to and including the line and determining whether probable cause existed, the totality of the circumstances must be considered. Because then you go back up to this language that the states referred to uh, at the top of 19, um, talking about use of senses and has knowledge of the commission or, or the that they accused admitted that such crime is being or has been committed and, and that final line based on the collective knowledge of others so long as there's some degree of communication between them yeah my notes I, the problem I, or the concern i have with that that's talking about police cases i know that i think goodman and burgesson were at least police cases all i don't have notes person. they're all police all cases police cases uh, judge i just want to make clear uh, for the first time maybe in 30 years i disagree with myself Get the court ported market. <laughs> we are conflating immediate knowledge, uh, presence or immediate knowledge with probable cause. There's not a single case that distinguishes what probable cause means for a policeman versus a citizen. Probable cause is the level of suspicion of a reasonable and prudent person under the totality of the circumstances. It's Fourth Amendment law. Yeah. There's uh, a. Uh, yes. and, and I think you. you I agree, I, and I was just, I, I don't know, I got caught maybe at the end of the day into a discussion um, in trying to parse this even further. I think in determining whether probable cause existed, the totality of the circumstances must be considered as appropriate language. My concern about the the, the last sentence is we start getting into these police cases that, that are very different circumstances than we have here. Um, but I think totality of the circumstances allows um, the parties to argue everything that was known, uh, appropriately known for probable cause to be developed in this particular case. Mm -hmm. Well, the other problem I'm having, Judge, with this charge is what Mr. Rubin just stood up and said is nowhere in this charge. There is no definition. No. I, and, that's, and that's a problem for me because right now, the definition of probable cause has been given to this jury by Travis McMichael and not by this court. So unless the actual words of this is what probable cause is, is in there, um, this charge doesn't provide the jury with a definition of probable cause. And, and like I said, the definition of probable cause is the same whether it's a citizen or a police officer. It's Fourth Amendment law. It's a seizure of a person. I see what you're saying. Yeah. And uh, so actually the definition that Travis McMichael well, gave it, is Fourth Amendment law. The way to solve it here then is adding the in determining whether probable cause exists, the totality of the circumstances must be considered to the end of it. I think in the middle though, where it says a private person may arrest an offender upon reasonable and probable grounds of suspicion, that is probable cause. Which is defined as the level of suspicion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now we need to decide what that language is. <laughs> well, there's plenty of cases that define probable cause. There, there are, and I, I pulled one. Oh, I pulled a whole bunch of them. Um, but yeah, this is Michigan versus D. Filippo, which is a 1979 U.S. Supreme Court case, 433 U.S. 31. At 37, probable cause exists if the arresting officer has knowledge and reasonably trustworthy information about facts and circumstances sufficient for a prudent person to believe the accused has committed an offense. Um, you know, there's a bunch of other cases out there. there it's slightly different. Um, Probable cause is defined to be the existence of such facts and circumstances as would excite the belief in the reasonable mind that the person charged was guilty of the crime for which he was arrested or prosecuted. And that's McGonagall versus Treadwell, 216 Georgia App, 850, it's a 1995 case. Um, a lot of the cases, even Adams versus Carlisle, um, which we're, we've been talking about here, 278 Georgia Appeal 777, 2006. Can we agree on a definition then? Yes. Because I, that, that then s solves the problem that I 
was working through, which is the way this discusses probable cause, it simply talks about reasonable and probable grounds of suspicion. But then if we further define probable cause, I think that addresses this mm -hmm. suspicion language to the satisfaction of the court. Um, well, if, if we could just not do it right now, because there's there's a lot of U.S. Supreme Court cases that define it under Fourth Amendment law. If we could maybe communicate. When Mr. Ho emails me this short brief, <laughs> the art of the brief is important <laughs> on Saturday. Maybe we can just email that to the court. That would be great. I will email you what I've got, Judge. Right. And I'm openly saying that I agree that Mr. Rubin was right, that we were disagreeing, but now I agree with him. We've reconciled. So there's been no, yeah, there's no divorce. Okay. So right. Judge, I want to make sure what you're saying is that once we go ahead and say the definition of probable cause is this, and we've all agreed that the definition of probable cause is that, that will be what is charged. That will be what's charged, and I do not then intend to charge this language about um, suspicion because Again, probable cause has been defined and explains when, under what circumstances, that arrest can be made. Okay. So I just want to be clear. We're not using any of this language from Defendants 4. We're just using the probable cause language. Well, the No, let me, let me read it. Yeah. Okay. What I plan to charge is a private person may arrest an offender upon reasonable and probable grounds of suspicion. That is, on probable cause, which is defined as... Black. The facts necessary to establish probable cause for arrest are much less than those required to prove guilt beyond a reasonable doubt at trial. The test merely requires a probability less than a certainty, but more than a mere suspicion or possibility. In determining whether probable cause existed, the totality of the circumstances must be considered. Excellent, with one exception from the state. And that is, of course, that is on probable cause defined as this if the offense is a felony and the offender is attempting to escape. As requested by the defense, because we're relating it back to the citizen's arrest. And so a private person may arrest an offender not just upon probable cause or grounds of suspicion. The citizen's arrest statute actually says only when it's a felony and the offender is attempting to escape. So that has to be included in here in the state's opinion. Okay, which may then get us back, though, to the debate which mm -hmm. Mr. Hogue is going to address. Right. I, I will take that into consideration. It probably depends a little bit on where we land after I get this additional brief on Saturday. Thank you, Judge. Okay. Okay. Um, two things. Two things. Your Honor, we would ask the court to define arrest. As you know, it's a term of art. It's it's not, and it's used in the statute, but it's not defined under the citizen's arrest statute. So an arrest doesn't have to, when you arrest someone, you don't have to use the term arrest, as the state has argued. It is a, it is a, if a reasonable person would believe their liberty is detained, that is essentially an arrest for purposes of the law. The UI law, it's Fourth Amendment law. Um, and the, we're getting, we're getting, we're arguing to the jury that a detention and an arrest are two different things. We're arguing it's the same thing, and I think the jury is going to need guidance on what is an arrest. And we would ask the court to define it. We're happy to provide a definition. Let's do this then. Submit it as a proposed charge. Yes, we'll do that. Saturday. Um, and I'll take it under advisement then. Um, and the other one, your Honor. Your Honor oh, I'm sorry. But momentarily on that, and the only reason I bring it up is because the fear from the state is we've got Terry stops, which apply to the police, and that is a detention to investigate. This says citizens arrest, and we understand, thanks Mr. Hogue, the origin of this in 1852, and it never got changed. So I think the we tracked it back to medieval well, England. Well, 15. No, whatever. <laughs> so the problem is, is what we've got is. 17421, OCGA 17421, where we have the duty of the arresting officer to take the arrested person before a judicial officer. And we all know that because we all practice criminal law. You gotta, you gotta arrest. You gotta put in handcuffs, you gotta transport, you gotta take him to jail, you gotta put him before a judge. So you got this whole sequence of events that happens when you arrest somebody, which is you gotta take him before a judge. It is not, hey, I'm holding you here and Doing a Terry stop to investigate, and that conflation uh, is. I agree. Big I agree with that. That's why I want to see it as a proposed charge. And, and as the state knows, and, and, and the court, I'm sure, knows by now, 
a citizen does not take the arrestee to the magistrate. All the case law says you hold them for the police, for the police to do their job. I would love to see that case law because everything I found is from the 1800s where there were no police to call on any cell phone oh, we to go ahead and play yeah, all, all of that. your shoplifting mm -hmm. cases will be okay, well, it sounds like in addition to some of the homework we have, this adds in because as you all know, one of the reasons that we try to get all the charges before the court with support at the beginning of the trial is so that we don't run into this. I mean, this is obviously something that it, I need a charge, I need support. This is not something I'm just going to shoot from the hip on. The other one, Your Honor, is um, pattern charge 3, I'll go slow, 3.16.10. Threats justifying a homicide. I'll let everybody get on the same page. Sorry, Mr. Go ahead. 3.16.10. The defendant's use of deadly force may be justified even when there has not been physical contact between anyone. If the menacing action of the alleged victim is sufficient to create a reasonable belief that the defendant's or another's life is in imminent danger, um, then the defendant's use of deadly force may be justified. We have heard the state argue that Mr. McMichael and Mr. Arbery were inches apart at the least when the shooting occurred. I'm sorry. We join in that request. I believe this fits the facts of our case where the chain of events begins with Mr. Arbery running at Travis McMichael. Um, Mr. McMichael testified. There's additional evidence that he felt threatened by his actions alone, despite Mr. Arbery not having a weapon, um, and despite there being no physical contact at that point, which led to the pointing of the shotgun. And Mr. Arbery's then, again, the chain of events running around the truck and getting shot either when he put his hand on the gun and it pulled out and he was striking Mr. McMichael, as Mr. McMichael testified, or before he ever touched Mr. McMichael, but they were within inches of each other, Mr. Arbery was menacing Mr. McMichael, putting Mr. McMichael in, in reasonable fear for his life. I think the charge applies, and so we would ask the court to give that as well. Your Honor, we ask that this charge not apply. This is verbal threats. That's the entire last line. Words alone never justify the use of deadly force, no matter how abusive or provoking. However, verbal threats accompanied by some menacing action may justify the use of deadly force. So in this case, this is all talking about verbal threats. Um, it starts off with the defendant's use of deadly force may be justified even when there has not been physical contact between anyone. If the menacing action of the alleged victim is sufficient to create a reasonable belief that he needed to go ahead and do this. Words alone never justify it. So this really doesn't apply. The evidence in this case is the man was running. And he was running for five minutes and then he was running toward Travis McMichael. There is no evidence of menacing action. It would have been one thing if Travis McMichael had testified to menacing action. All he said was the guy was running toward me. And so we don't have the facts to support menacing action of the alleged victim sufficient to create a reasonable belief about life being in danger at all. And it may be justified is what this says. And then it goes into words alone may never justify it. We have the evidence from everyone that Mr. Arbery never said a word. So this really doesn't apply to the facts of this case. And I agree that the last, the second paragraph, words alone may never justify since there were no words spoken. But the first paragraph, the menacing actions of Mr. Arbery, as testified to by Mr. McMichael, would apply in this case. I think it's this was actually covered. I think in 31010 because it says 31010 is a defendant is justified in using force that is intended 
or likely to cause death or serious bodily injury when he reasonably believes that the use of force is necessary to prevent death or serious bodily injury to himself or a third person or the commission of a forcible felony, which means a felony that involves the use of force or violence against another, and we've defined that on the request of the defense as aggravated assault is again a felony which can occur by the use of fists if they are used as an offensive weapon. So I think that covers it. Well, yes, Judge. <laughs> <laughs> look, looking this way, I'll come back. What I'm saying, Judge, is there is a point in the in the chain of events where there are no there is no physical contact between Mr. McMichael and Mr. Arbery. The state is arguing that he was shot before there was ever physical contact. But menacing actions alone can rise, can cause a reasonable belief of, of imminent death or bodily injury. And that's what this charge covers. Okay. I, I think, I mean, for the purposes of the, the charge, I think it's covered here. I mean, the, this charge, the only difference is the physical contact language, but that again is still covered under the, the language. If I could add, Your Honor, the state's going to argue that this was jogging and running. That's all it was. It was just simple jogging and running. What, what the testimony was, in fact, is that there were two passes at Mr. McMichael. The first one, where he came within 10 feet of the back of his truck, making eye contact with Mr. McMichael while Mr. McMichael was yelling, stop, stop, don't come any closer. And his actions were to continue to run, looking into his eyes, which caused him to fear and then reach inside his car to go for his gun. And that action caused Mr. Arbery to turn. Then he comes back for the second pass, and he wavers between staying on course and going around. And the state is going to argue that this jogging, that these actions were simple and were not menacing. And Travis has testified that they were, in fact, what placed him in fear. I think that, that the, the additional help from this, from this piece helps the jury understand that these types of actions can cause somebody to believe that they're about to receive a violent injury. And in fact, Travis, in his statement to No Hill, he says, Do you all have 310 in front of you? We do. Because I, I, to me, it's a, it's a, under the circumstances, it's almost a better charge than 31610. We're not saying to replace that. it. We're not saying to replace it. We're, I think it further narrows it. We think it further narrows that the kind of conduct that could justify is, is, is the kind of conduct that's been testified by. We think it aids us and also allows us to rebut the state's argument of jogging and running. And just for clarity, Judge, Travis McMichael's statement to Officer No. Hilly was never tendered into evidence. Sure it was. Uh, the recording of it and the transcript. The no, it's yeah, not. Neither one of them is actually going to the jury. No, they're not going to the jury. That's right. No. But he was questioned about it. He was shown his written. He was shown his statement. He was questioned about his statement. Those yeah. portions no, came I, in. Well, right. I just want to be really, really clear. Okay. The portions on cross-examination, because okay. the can reason I, I'm being I, really can, careful at this moment, Judge, Can I be, get you to stop? Because I've simply got a request to charge mm -hmm. 31610. Okay. The, I think that language is covered and it probably more completely and more tailored to the facts of this case mm -hmm. under 31010, which we've already discussed, which would include the definition of aggravated assault that was agreed to a little bit earlier in the day. Okay. Um, from Travis McMichael, you said there were two. I assume those are the two? Uh, arrest and 31610. Okay. All right. I'm going to get a follow-up on the arrest language as a proposed charge, and I just ruled on 31610. Yeah. Anything further from Greg McMichael? No, Your Honor. All right. From Mr. Bryan. Yes, Your Honor. <clears throat> Going back in the order as I have it, Your Honor, to page 26, unanimous verdict. We believe under in this case the pattern charge and unanimous verdict is inadequate. The jury's verdict must be unanimous as to every count of the indictment. It must be unanimous as to every element of the indictment. There's an entire body of case law 
which gets fairly complex, a bunch of Supreme Court justices, I think Justice Scalia, going back and forth uh, over how far unanimity must go. We submitted a, a charge, a special instruction on unanimity, and we're asking the court to give that charge. The, 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 this charge, the, the pattern charge, works in your typical one count felony indictment. It doesn't work in a nine count case where you've got three different defendants charged in all the counts, either as principals or parties to a crime, in different manners in which the offenses can take place. So we need a, a jury charge that has teeth in it as to unanimity, and that's why we submitted that request. And I. I will add the language to the unanimous verdict. Whatever your verdict is, it must be unanimous. That is agreed by all as to each count of the indictment and as to each defendant individually. I'll add that language. Well, that's that. we appreciate that, Your Honor. It's certainly closer to where we, we, we want it, but... We have submitted a special instruction on unanimity that requires that the jury agree, specifically with assault, as the existence of one discrete act constituting an assault. The, the jury, jury doesn't have to determine the precise location or exact time of the assault or the exact sequence of events. Those are certainly uh, issues that have been foreclosed by the appellate cases in this state. But they have to agree unanimously on an assault. And, you know, also they have to unanimously agree on false imprisonment. They can't, six can't agree to a false imprisonment on Burford. Six can't agree to a false imprisonment on Holmes. All 12 have to agree that there's a false imprisonment. So, uh, again, uh, you know, I didn't create the problem here. That was the state in their charging decisions. But we don't believe that uh, we are, the issue of jury unanimity is, it's better than it was. You've made a substantial improvement to, to the pattern charge, but we still don't believe it's adequate. Um, and so we're asking uh, for additionally that special instruction. Right. And depending on what the state's direction is or what the state's response is, we may well come back over the weekend with a more, yet another more specific unanimity request. I mean, there are legitimate questions as to what is required uh, for a unanimous verdict, what that means. But in this case, uh, we think we, we need more than we have. State request for the pattern charge. It's sufficient to cover the fact that the verdicts must be unanimous. Okay. Well, again, the court's going to charge the pattern with the added language that I've just indicated. Thank you, Judge. Thank you, Your Honor. Moving on to page 9 of the, what seems now pretty much, it's not just a proposal, it seems most of it's in place, but with respect to page nine, voluntariness of statements, we had previously submitted to the court case law with respect to third party threats. Now, arguably, the, the way the pattern charge, charge reads in the second sentence, a statement induced by the slightest hope of benefit or the remotest fear of injury is not voluntary. Arguably, that includes threats from third parties. Um, but my concern is we're going to get up and we're going to argue that the defendant's statements, without which there can be no conviction under Jackson v. Virginia, without Mr. Bryan's statements, they're, 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 that's an acquittal. Um, we're going to get up there and argue that Mr. Bryan would have, uh, was in fear for his life at the time he was making these statements. And whether or not that's induced by the police officer or the totality of the circumstances or a combination of thereof, that the statements are not voluntary. Then the state's going to get up and they're going to say, oh, no, no, it's voluntary. It doesn't matter whether there were people out there trying to kill him as long as the police officer didn't hand him a gun. And then the jury's going to come back and they're going to ask, what does it mean? And then we're going to do then what I'm trying to get done now. Uh, as long as the state's not going to challenge that, if they agree with me that third party uh, threats and fear of injury from third parties can render a statement involuntary, if they're not going to argue that the, 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 the fear has to be the product of police action, then we're good. But if they're going to get up with the last word and then throw out some theory to that effect, then we would need this charge to be more specific. 
that it doesn't have to, the threat, the fear of injury does not have to come from the law enforcement officer who's conducting the interview. Uh, so I don't mind leaving it as it is as long as the state isn't going to come back and challenge that. Because if the state's challenging that, then we need to address it now in the charge. Okay. Judge, actually, the case law on Jackson Deno when we do these arguments is one of, you can't induce the fear yourself. It can't be self-created fear. It has to be induced by another, and the other person it has to be induced by is the law enforcement officer. And we all know that from Jackson v. Deno. We all know that in motions to suppress. So it cannot be you have something else going on in your life that you're worried about, and you bring your fear in, and therefore my statement's not voluntary. And here, what Agent Seacrest actually said was that he never made threats or promises or did anything to influence Mr. Bryan. And in fact, Mr. Bryan was seated next to Mr. Goff the entire time. His lawyer was right there. So this idea that somehow he's giving his statement because of third party pressure that Mr. Bryan, by the way, never testified to, this was all Seacrest, wasn't this what was going on? And weren't there these threats out there? And weren't these, these third parties out there? Mr. Bryan never said, I'm under the influence or under the threats or I'm saying all this stuff against my will. It's basically, we've got his on-scene statements, which are his on-scene statements. There's nothing there about third-party coercion. And then we've got his statements to Seacrest. The state asks that there be no additional language about third-party threats as to the voluntariness of Mr. Bryan's statements, especially since he was seated right next to his attorney the entire time. Thank you. Uh, Your Honor, it does, uh, uh, unless they're packing, it does, respectfully, it doesn't matter how many attorneys Mr. Bryan has. The, the question is not the ability of the defense lawyers to provide physical protection. The question is what's going to happen to him when he steps out of the police station. Uh, now, as long as the state's not, not going to challenge the argument, the, the pattern charge is fine. But if they're going to get up and they're going to object during, during my closing, or they're going to get up and argue the contrary, then the jury may well come back with questions. And if the court doesn't deal with it now, it may have to deal with it then. The idea that the officer was unaware of the third party threats, which arguably are not fully third party, it was the GBI director who gave the press conference with the agent Seacrest standing there that contributed to the media storm putting my client's life in danger, putting that issue for the side, that issue to the side. The officer was well aware at the time the statement was, was made of what was going out there. Mr. Bryan doesn't have to testify to it when the officers testify to it. Uh, and that's not something that's induced by Mr. Bryan. He did ask the Artery family attorneys and their entourage, or whoever, however you want to describe them, to go out there in the media and, and call for his arrest, call for him for nasty, horrible things to be done, and other people joining I'm in on that. at this point, Judge. The soliloquy about all of this stuff, we've heard this before, we understand where it's coming from. I'm just, I guess I'm asking, can we get to the point? And the, the, the point is, Your Honor, that again, and this seems to be the theme today, where one side has one theory of the law, the other side has another theory of law, the pattern charge doesn't fully address it. And, and then we end up in a situation of jurors coming back with questions. We also end up with the reality that for most jurors in South Georgia, the state, district attorney's office and criminal defense lawyers, we're not really in an equal posture. If the state says the law is one thing and we say the law is something different, in South Georgia, it's what the state said. So it's very dangerous and precarious for a defense lawyer in this part of the state to do so that. I, I, I don't really know what you're getting at there, but let me just put this. The voluntariness charge that's there does not prevent you from arguing uh, whatever reasonable inferences you can argue. Uh, the charge is accurate, um, and I'm going to keep the voluntariness charge the way that it is. Thank you, Your Honor. I'll move on. Your Honor, with respect to page 12, fingerprints, we have no objection to the majority of that charge, but the last portion of it is troubling. The last paragraph of that charge, right above definition of crime, says, if you believe that fingerprints were found and identified, their evidentiary value, if any, would be diminished to the extent that they could reasonably have been left on the article left at another time or under different circumstances. In this case, there's been no evidence whatsoever to suggest 
that Mr. Arbery had any cause or reason to be at the Bryan residence or have any contact with the vehicle. There's been no suggestion, for example, in this case, that Mr. Arbery worked at a car wash or car detailing business and that Mr. Bryan might have been a customer. There's no suggestion that maybe he works on cars and somehow had access to cars. I'll take yes for an answer. Thank you. So there's no objection from the remaining defendants that the last paragraph be taken out? No. no. Your Honor, with respect, thank you, and thank you. It with is respect not. to paragraph page 16, we are asking that the court add, after the second sentence, that there must be some causal connection between the felony and death. Oh, We're asking, you're moving quickly enough where I know the court report is struggling. I haven't caught you yet. It's the New York coming out of me, Your Honor. I apologize. So where are we? We are on page 16. Okay. Pattern charge 2.10.30, causation and felony murder pattern. Okay. After the second sentence, the second sentence being there must be some causal connection between the felony and death, we are asking the court to insert, insert an additional sentence. The death must be a reasonably foreseeable consequence of the underlying felony. Must be a reasonably foreseeable consequence of the underlying felony. In other words, if it is not reasonably foreseeable to Mr. Bryan that the death will take place, then there is no causation under Georgia law, and he cannot be found guilty under felony murder for that count, whichever count they're considering at that time. Again, the sentence that we're asking to include would be the- I heard you. You got it. I got it. I don't think it's a mistake. Your Honor, actually under causation and felony murder, there's a bench note that says felony murder is not applicable to non-dangerous felonies unless the attendant circumstances create a foreseeable risk of death. So foreseeable risk of death only applies when you've got a non-dangerous felony where there's attendant circumstances. Here we have three dangerous felonies. Using pickup trucks to falsely imprison something, attempting to falsely imprison someone with the pickup trucks, and aggravated assault with a firearm, et cetera. So there is no question that there is a foreseeable risk when you try and falsely imprison someone using a pickup truck to do it, running them off the road, that it might result in serious bodily injury or harm, even death, and that was testified to by the medical examiner. So we don't think that this applies as a charge, the foreseeability. I'm sure Mr. Goff will argue that there's no way Mr. Bryan could have foreseen this happening, but I don't believe it's part of the pattern. When I searched the PDF, it came up only once for non-dangerous felonies. We ask that it be excluded. If I may, Your Honor, going from the bottom to the top of the indictment, criminal attempt to commit false imprisonment, with all respect to the state, is about as non-dangerous as it can be. And clearly, a charge with respect to reasonable foreseeability would be appropriate. In many states, the state doesn't even get to argue for felony murder, but certainly in this case, we should be entitled to the jury to determine whether it was reasonably foreseeable that a criminal attempt to commit false imprisonment could result or would result in death. By further extension of that, I think the same argument applies to the false imprisonment itself. And the reason I'm bringing this up, Your Honor, is any time there's an arrest, any time there's an arrest, 99% of which, 99.9% are by police officers. Theoretically, any arrest involves a use of force. Use of force is inherent to the arrest. But still, it's not reasonably foreseeable that there is going to be a crime committed in that context. For example, five police officers respond to the scene of a purported crime. One of the police officers- I'm sort of going to object to the examples and the narrative and the argument for closing. If Mr. Goff has some case law that would support a charge on foreseeability, we might be able to get to that point a little sooner. Your Honor, foreseeability is discussed in this case for a long time. I'm contending in response to the state's position. And the example of the police is certainly relevant here. If 
one person of five people making an arrest inexplicably, without warning, without any reason to, to expect it, kill somebody for no reason, without justification, which is the state's position as to what Travis McMichael did in this case, how are the other four people responsible unless that was reasonably foreseeable beyond the application of force inherent to any arrest? So with respect to the criminal attempt, I think it's very clear. With respect to the false imprisonment, I think it's clear. With respect to the aggravated assaults, I think the state has a stronger argument. But with respect to the criminal attempt and the false imprisonment, that's what we're asking for. Now, the, the court's going to charge the pattern. Um, the pattern is very clear. The felony must have directly caused the death or played a substantial and necessary part in causing the death, regardless of when the death ultimately occurred. That's the language of the um, a portion of the uh, the pattern. And the uh, court's going to rely upon the pattern. Feeling somewhat in the position of Abraham before the Lord, um, if the court's not going to give the charge on foreseeability as part of the charge on causation, I take it the state has no objection to the defense making that argument, but the court might. So uh, I'm asking the court, do I understand that even though it will not be included in the charge, that there's no problem with the defense making that argument? Reasonable foreseeability and causal, and causal connection are two different things, Mr. Goff. So what I'm asking the court essentially is the court prohibiting, is the court barring the defense, Mr. Bryan's defense, from telling a jury that Mr. Bryan could not reasonably foresee the death. Because obviously I don't want to make an argument in front of the jury and trigger an admonishment or anything else. So if the court's telling me I can't argue to the jury that they should acquit him because it wasn't reasonably foreseeable, obviously I won't do that. It, it, but it certainly created an interesting issue on, on appeal. If he committed one of the felonies that is charged, then the jury using this charge can make a determination on whether or not he committed felony murder. That's what's here. First sentence, if you believe he caused the death of another person by committing one of the felonies just discussed in the indictment, regardless of whether he intended the death to occur, there must be some causal connection between the felony and the death. You can argue causal connection, but I would suggest that you argue consistent with the law and read the charge so that you're not injecting issues that would not otherwise be appropriate. And I certainly don't want to do that. On a related note, since we're also charging the jury about aiding and abetting, I, I, the way I interpret the court's charge on aiding and abetting, the, the, and the, the charge as, as in this document I'm looking at, that with respect to the men's ray, Mr. Bryan could not aid and abet in the commission of any of these felony murders if it was not reasonably foreseeable to him that his assistance with the criminal attempt Where to are you in the pattern? I mean, not the pattern. Where are you in the proposed charge? Well, Your Honor, I haven't moved back to the other page, but the, the, the aiding and abetting charge is earlier in the court's charge. We talked about it earlier with the A, B, and C subsections. I think the court rejected the defense position on the applicability of the C subsection, but I'm going back and I'm trying to find it. It's page 13, it's parties to a crime, Judge. Page 13, parties to a crime. Your Honor, I would contend, irrespective of whether reasonable foreseeability is an issue with respect to causation, under 1.42.10, parties to a crime, where it says under B that the defendant intentionally helps in the commission of the crime, if it is not reasonably foreseeable to the defendant that the death would take place or the offense, criminal attempt to commit false imprisonment, false imprisonment, and, and even aggravated assaults, if the defendant doesn't intentionally help in the commission of the crime, then he's not guilty. And consequently, as a mens re issue in this case, if it's not reasonably foreseeable to the defendant that that is going to take place, then that is a defense not as a causation issue, but as a mens re issue. So I just want to make sure that by arguing to the jury that it's not reasonably foreseeable that I'm not going to draw an admonishment from the court. Now, the state obviously is going to be free to argue to the contrary, but I just want to make sure as far as me being good with the court that I'm not going to draw the admonishment of the court or have the jury, the court instruct the jury to disregard an argument that with respect to mens re and aiding and abetting, 
that they should consider whether what happened was reasonably foreseeable to Mr. Bryan in the course of, as alleged by the state, attempting to imprison falsely Mr. Arbery or actually imprisoning Mr. Arbery. It's a mens rea issue under 1.42.10, and I just want to make sure before I get there that I'm not going to be rebuked by the court. That would be kind of painful in a closing argument. Anything from the state? Um, the state's heard no case law that supports a charge on this, so we ask that you not do it. Yeah, the whole reason for foreseeability under parties to a crime, if you've got a case out, then go ahead and get it to me. But uh, the way the court understands it is, I mean, you're, it, it's whether they intentionally, whether they directly commit the crime, intentionally helps in the commission of a crime, or intentionally advises, encourages. Reasonable foreseeability may have actually come up. I had a case a while back about that where we didn't get into it. And I won't get into the facts of the case. I, I, I'll look at it, but I don't think that necessarily comes into play under the parties to a crime statute uh, or parties to a crime charge. Your Honor, we'll, uh, we'll endeavor to find uh, a case that might satisfy I would Your suggest, Honor. But I, would, we... I would suggest before you make any, I'm not going to charge it. Um, I would suggest very, to very carefully consider the argument unless you have some support for it. Well, we will look, but what I understand the court to say that is unless and until we come up with a case that says we can do that, that we are prohibited from arguing uh, that Mr. Bryan didn't have the mens re based on a lack of foreseeability. I think what the court said, if I understand what the court's telling me, if I use the words reasonable foreseeability with respect to his mental state with respect to aiding and abetting that I'm going to draw the rebuke of the court. I don't want to do that. I just suggested that you've got some time to find some cases that would allow you to make that argument. I'm looking at the charge, and nowhere in the charge does it talk about reasonable foreseeability or any other type of limiting factor. So if you're going to argue that, I would suggest that you have some support for it before you do that. Thank you, Your Honor. May I continue, Your Honor? Yes. Your Honor, we submitted a number of charges, uh, actually some of them twice, <coughs> and I just want to make sure I haven't missed any of them. Um, Your Honor, specifically with respect to use of force, we submitted four charges. The first one is the charge that with respect to the degree of force that a private citizen may use to effectuate an arrest, that a private citizen has the same right and authority to use force as does a police officer. And we have cited numerous authorities to that effect. Uh, and we believe that charge should be included in the court's charge in this case. It's kind of a pivotal, pivotal charge. The uh, charge that you're referring to was submitted to the court on November 8th. Now, I do point out that requests to charge were requested by the court by October 18th. Uh, we looked at the request to charge. I've gone over them and understand the requests. The court has already put together the charge and has gone through what the court intends to charge with regard to use of force. The charge as is currently drafted by the court, um, again, is what the court intends to charge. I have considered these. They were untimely. Um, and I don't intend to modify the charge as is currently proposed. Well, if the court's refusing to consider them because they're untimely, I, I won't discuss it any further. If the court's willing to entertain the untimely jury charges, then I'll continue. Um, Mr. Goff, what issue do these charges raise beyond what is contained in the charge that we have spent a good amount of time today reviewing with you adding in your position as we went through the charge already? So what, what new exists in these charges that is not currently contained in the charge that I just went over with the parties? Well, maybe, Your Honor, I misunderstood, and if so, my apologies, but it was unclear, at least when we started the process, whether we were bringing up our own charges during that process or waiting to, we went through the, the court's draft and the state's response to it. 
So if, if I've waived these, either by being untimely or not raising them earlier today, then I'll just sit down. But if the court will hear me out, I don't intend to take a lot of time on it. But I, I do specifically am asking the court to, to give use of force supplemental charge number two, number three, and number four. And I'm not going to belabor the issue. If the court's going to prevent me from doing that based on their being filed. Kenneth Moten, it is day 11 in the trial and the death of Ahmaud Arbery. The, the attorneys in the courtroom spending the day in a charging conference where they go over the wording they will present to the jury when they give, give them charging documents after closing arguments that could begin Monday. They will use these documents to make their verdicts. Joining us is ABC News correspondent Alex Perche, who has been outside that courtroom since day one of our coverage. Trial attorney also C.K. Hoffler joining us as well. CK, I want you to weigh in, please, on this process as we've seen it develop this afternoon. Absolutely. Well, they're coming towards the end of the charging conference. They've been working very diligently all day. The prosecution has won some points. The defense have won, has also won some points. There's going to be additional briefing, briefs submitted on issues over the weekend. The judge has said he'll be available and open to doing that. He's pretty much sticking to his guns with respect to previous rulings, as we would expect. And then hopefully by Monday morning, before closing arguments, this will all be tied up with a nice bow, and we will have the charging jury instructions. The instructions for the jury and closing arguments will begin as planned Monday morning. And just moments ago, Alex, we saw Judge Walmsley going back and forth with defense attorney Kevin Goff, who is bringing another motion for mistrial to the judge and followed it up with some pretty incendiary comments this morning. Well, and then you heard the, the prosecution basically re rebuff him, saying that, look, you know, he's complained about the presence outside the courtroom. He's complained about the presence inside the courtroom from civil rights leaders such as Jesse Jackson and Al Sharpton. But this was something that he himself created with his own incendiary remarks last week, uh, first misidentifying Jesse Jackson and then saying that uh, they should have a limit on black pastors in the courthouse uh, and then drawing analogies to to, you know, well, what if there were, you know, a whole bunch of folks dressed up as Colonel Sanders with white masks? Uh, and how would the Arbery family then feel about that? And I will say, can it, that's something that um, he's not just been rebuked by uh, members of the, the Arbery family and their representatives, but also uh, by other members of the defense. We actually got a chance to speak with Jason Sheffield, who uh, is the attorney for Travis McMichael in this case. He was reflecting uh, on a uh, Kevin Goff's com latest comments today talking about concerns. He handed out pictures showing uh, what he said was a perceived threat yesterday. This large gathering outside the courthouse of faith leaders uh, offering their prayers and in and, and support of the Arbery family. He called it uh, an intimidation tactic, uh, and again, motion for a mistrial, something that Judge Walmsley denied. But, but uh, 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 Jason Sheffield today, the defense attorney again for Travis McMichael, basically said that look, we uh, totally support uh, the First Amendment rights and uh, of these folks, and 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 certainly uh, want to respect and 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 keep that intact. They, uh, he defined it as sacrosanct. And CK, right here on ABC News Live, you've been very good at breaking down this process we've been watching play out here um, of this jury instructions, creating those, going through those motions as Sorry, well. Gonna... You know, why is it so important to get this right? It's important to get this right because justice mandates it. This is a very important case. There's so many issues. So many different communities are watching what happens in this case. The jury instructions really literally make the difference between a victory or, or a loss. So for the prosecution, it's got to be right. For the defense, it's got to be right. Every word has to fall into place. It has to be these jury instructions have to be in conformity with Georgia law. And it's very important to ensure for the integrity of the judicial process that it be done correctly and not in a in a ill-advised way as to create strong appealable issues. As we see there from what happened inside, we know there were they were parsing over words um, like excessive force, and, which is essential to the state's case, according to lead prosecutor Linda Donikowski. We saw that the word revenge is out. 
what struck you from what you saw during that charging conference today? Well, just in terms of the, I, I believe that the prosecution is, is a little bit upset because they didn't get everything that they wanted, and understandably so. But I do think that despite that, that the prosecution can prevail in meeting its burden beyond a reasonable doubt. So there can be convictions across the board, but it's going to be important for the prosecution, as I said before, and the defense to explain these critical jury instructions to the jury so that they know how they can render a verdict in their favor. Both sides have to do that. But again, I can see why the prosecution probably was a little bit upset. And Alex Roche, before we um, leave you outside that Brunswick um, courthouse there, uh, a big day ahead on Monday with those closing arguments. That's right, Kenneth. We're expecting closing arguments to kick off Monday, uh, which means that it is possible that this jury uh, could be deliberating uh, before Thanksgiving. They could render a verdict before Thanksgiving. Now, the timing, how that will come together, if it's something that, uh, you know, will they'll, they'll hold for, for, for after, after Thanksgiving, you know, the judge hasn't quite yet weighed in on that. I will say that uh, this afternoon when we heard from uh, defense attorney Jason Sheffield, he was asked about the timing of all of this and he even said it was kind of up in the air and that, you know, we'd see, I know a couple of the defense attorneys here have Thanksgiving plans, so we're not anticipating uh, court to be in session then, but it is possible that that Friday or the following week uh, could be in play here. All right, Alex Perche, right there since day one outside that courthouse there in Brunswick, South Georgia. Alex, thank you. CK, please stick around because we are still following that other major development and other big trial of the day. That Kyle Rittenhouse verdict, not guilty on all charges after almost four days of deliberations in, 14, in that 14-day trial that has marked national headlines since those shootings happened August of 2020. CK Hoffler, let me get right to it and ask you your key takeaways from the entirety of this trial that led to this big not guilty verdict? Well, what's important for everyone to know is that you should not read too much into jury deliberations the length of time that a jury deliberates. That's very important. What is critical, a critical takeaway from the Cal Rittenhouse case is that the jury did speak. The jury has spoken. We have to accept their verdict, even if it's painful to do so. But we also have to remember that this is one case it is my sincere hope and desire that there are not be people in this country that will look at the acquittal of Kyle Rittenhouse and feel empowered or emboldened to insert themselves in, in protests throughout the country, peaceful protests, create havoc with a gun, with an assault weapon, and shoot to kill. It is my sincere hope that that is not the interpretation of the lessons that we learn from the Kyle Rittenhouse verdict. We got to respect the, the jury's verdict, yes, but not read into it a license for people to randomly, young 17-year-olds, 16-year-olds, 15-year-olds, or older people to just go and break up protests with an assault rifle and feel emboldened to do so because of this verdict and thinking that they will get away with it. I pray that that is not the salute, that that is not the answer and the takeaway. And I also am reminding people that there's a lot of work that needs to be done in terms of leveling the playing field in our criminal justice system. All right, C.K. Hoffler, trial attorney, you've been there with us much of the day we, and much throughout this trial. We really appreciate your perspective. And um, we obviously saw this other big trial with Ahmaud Arbery um, that we are still covering gavel to gavel. So we appreciate you so much. Thank you again, CK. And as we continue following reaction to the Rittenhouse verdict and await closing arguments in the Ahmaud Arbery murder trial, we continue our deeper dive into the wider impact of these cases when it comes to race relations in this country. Joining us is civil rights attorney Nakima Levy. Armstrong, Nikima, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me, Kenneth. Nikima, first, your reaction to the verdict in the Rittenhouse trial today. I was deeply disappointed in the verdict, although not surprised. We know that there are two systems of justice in this country, one for white folks and one for black people and other people of color. That was on full display throughout this entire trial. Um, I understand that the jury had a very difficult decision to make, 
albeit their jury instructions were complex and difficult to decipher, which I think may have contributed to the outcome. Uh, in addition, of course, uh, there's a matter of Wisconsin law, which allows someone to open carry uh, in a situation like what um, Kyle Rittenhouse was on trial for. But the problem has to do with people like Kyle and other militia type individuals who insert themselves in protests where we are standing up and demanding a change to our justice system that typically allows police officers to kill people with impunity. I mean, that was the whole purpose of people being out on the front lines in Kenosha, standing up for justice for Jacob Blake, who was unjustly shot multiple times by uh, Kenosha police officers and asserting their First Amendment rights to freedom of speech and declaring uh, that they wanted to see a change. And so we've had folks like Kyle show up at protests, brandishing um, artillery and, and weapons and creating an even more volatile and dangerous situation. It's unacceptable. What message does all of this send to the civil rights community, in your opinion? And so many people are asking, does this all set a precedent? I think that it sets a very dangerous precedent for those of us who are on the front lines protesting and demonstrating and standing up for black lives. We are not protected um, from police violence when we're on the front lines. We often already have to face tear gas and arrests and other hostile and traumatizing behavior. And now there's a whole other dimension, primarily of white men showing up armed to the T and allowed to roam freely uh, through the streets. And so it, it sends a message that we will not be protected. So we have to be prepared to protect ourselves. Uh, in Minneapolis, in the aftermath of George Floyd being killed, many of us felt the threat and the presence of white supremacists who came into town, threatening people in the community, writing notes on people's cars and windows if they had a Black Lives Matter sign, and even chasing people with weapons. This issue was undercovered in our media, and it, it made us, many of us, feel unsafe. So many of us went and got our license to carry, our conceal and carry permit uh, to protect ourselves and to arm ourselves because of this additional danger that we face out on the front lines. And Akima, what do you think this case and the pending verdict in the Ahmaud Arbery trial tell us about where we are as a society? Um, do you expect a big national response, you know, massive protests uh, in these streets? Because many would say yes, while we're waiting on a verdict, um, some would argue that, you know, years ago it was just tough to get to this point of getting someone charged uh, in these types of incidents and cases. Well, I think that this demonstrates yet again that we have a long way to go in terms of addressing the unreconciled racial issues in America. What we saw from Kyle Rittenhouse and what we saw from the McMichaels, as well as Roddy Bryan, is this mindset of a white male privilege and white male entitlement and being able to unjustly use the Second Amendment to attack and harm those who are jogging like Ahmaud Arbery was doing or those who are standing on the front lines um, of a protest. And so at the end of the day, we have to be honest about where we stand as a country with regard to race relations. We have to look at a lot of the white supremacy that was uh, brought to the surface during the Trump administration. And looking back at what happened on January 6th, it shows that there are factions in this country who are willing to assert themselves and their rights by any means necessary, even if that means shooting and killing people who do not pose a threat to their existence. And with the trial and the death of Ahmaud Arbery, clearly a huge national conversation around race happening with you know, hundreds of black clergy and people from around the country rallying this week. The defense argues that their presence creates a problem for them. Um, we've heard those complaints ag again today. So what do you think? Uh, does it hurt the defendants to have black pastors and Black Lives Matter activists in and around the courtroom, especially considering that defense attorney, Kevin Goff, the attorney for William Roddy Bryan, could likely use all of that as an appeal if his client is convicted? Well, I've been highly disturbed by the conduct of uh, Kevin Goff 
in this case, number one, drawing attention to the presence of black pastors and then trying to use the attention that he brought as the grounds for requesting a mistrial in this case. And then today he took things even a step further and he called the rallies by the black pastors and activists outside the courthouse a modern day lynching. That was completely absurd and unconscionable for him to utter those words. What Ahmaud Arbery experienced was actually more akin to a modern day lynching than having black folks and black clergy in and outside of the courtroom simply praying and standing up for justice. That's what they should be doing. What hurts the defense is the conduct of the defendants in this case that opened the door to this trial to begin with. In both these big trials, Rittenhouse and the one involving the death of Ahmaud Arbery, armed defendants are claiming self-defense after shooting unarmed people. They say the threat came from the possibility of their own gun being taken and used against them. What do you think about that? Well, I think, number one, when you look at the circumstances surrounding those two cases, in both instances, white men inserted themselves into the lives of black people as well as uh, protesters and allies and created a hostile, volatile, and dangerous situation. Those individuals need to understand that they are not above the law, that we have licensed police officers for a reason, and they should not assume that they have the power and the privilege of accosting someone, even trying to um, hold someone under arrest or pulling a gun on someone in the name of protection of property um, and justice. It is it's unacceptable that these things are continuing to happen. And as advocates, we have to continue to take a stand. We have to continue to call out these injustices. And I would urge parents, particularly white parents, to have conversations with their children about these issues. Kyle Rittenhouse was only 17 years old. And rather than his mom teaching him about the historical issues of racial injustice in this country and what led to the protests in Kenosha, she actually drove him across state lines and it opened the door to these atrocities that we now have to contend with. So white parents must do a better job of instilling a different set of values in their children surrounding race relations. And we know that it's not all white parents, but we, at the same time, there are enough white families who are embroiled in these um, underlying racial issues and who perpetuate white supremacy that it needs to be talked about. Civil rights attorney, Nakima Levy Armstrong, thank you so much for your time. We appreciate it. Thank you for having me. That does it for this hour. We'll have continuing updates right here on ABC News Live throughout the remainder of the day and a complete wrap-up tonight at 7 p.m. Eastern on ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Thank you for joining us. I'm Kenneth Moten. Let's go back now to the trial of the three men charged in the death of Ahmaud Arbery. Which is on page 13. Going over to page 14.
uh, they would not be appropriate to the reasonable apprehension aggravated assault, but they would be appropriate to the other, and we're asking the court to charge all four of them, or as many of them as the court is willing to give. Well, if that's the case, then you can't give any of them, because the aggravated assault with a motor vehicle is based on reasonable apprehension. The aggravated assault with a shotgun is based on having a deadly weapon and causing, attempting to cause a violent injury to somebody. So, I'm confused. Is the, well, all I know is what I heard in opening and the evidence that was presented by the state. If the state is agreeing to withdraw from the jury's consideration the allegation that Mr. Bryan intended to strike Mr. Arbery with his vehicle, and we're only proceeding with respect to the motor vehicle count seven aggravated assault. If we're only proceeding on reasonable apprehension that the state is not going to be arguing that there was any intent, then we're okay. No, no. I'm, I'm pretty sure I have to argue he intentionally did an act that placed Mr. Arbery in reasonable apprehension, so I have to prove intent, and that is an essential element that's in the charge. Your Honor, this is not actually splitting hairs. This is an important distinction. Um, the intent to commit the act that places Mr. Arbery in reasonable apprehension is different than the intent to strike him with the vehicle, the intent to assault on behalf of Mr. Bryan. If the state is willing to concede and have the court charge the jury that the, the state is withdrawing, the allegation that Mr. Bryan attempted to strike Mr. Arbery with the vehicle, then we're good. But if the state wants to pursue both theories of liability, then we're entitled to have the lesser offenses. If the state elects to proceed only under a theory of reasonable apprehension and give up the theory that Mr. Bryan intended to assault Mr. Arbery with the vehicle, then we would not be entitled to the lesser offenses. But if they're pursuing both theories, then we are. It's There's an intent required for aggravated assault either way, but it's a different level of intent. It's a different level of intent, uh, and it makes a difference in this case. Now, I thought I heard the state say several times in their opening and the presentation of evidence that Mr. Bryan intended to strike Mr. Arbery with his vehicle. We're entitled to the lesser offenses if we're still there. If they're only contending that Mr. Bryan as a principal or as a part of the crime intended to place him in reasonable apprehension of injury without not actually, not intending to strike him but only intending to scare him then we would not be entitled to the lesser offenses but the state has to choose the theory elect the theory that it's presenting to the jury the state and disagrees. That's, what, that's the reason Mr. that we've Mr. got Goff, to murder you got to give the other side an opportunity to speak I will shut up and sit down. Thank you. The, the, the state does not have to elect. It, it, you do an intentional act. If the intentional act is trying to hit somebody, and that intentional act then puts them in reasonable apprehension of receiving serious bodily injury, that's what we're intending. And yes, Mr. Bryan intended to try and hit Mr. Arbery. He tried to run him off the road and into the ditch, and Mr. Arbery actually did go into the ditch. So. That is the reasonable apprehension because Mr. Arbery had to jump out of the way because his truck was coming at him. The state understands the lesser included. The state's not opposed to the lesser included except simple battery um, because simple battery is that the person intentionally makes physical contact of an insulting or provoking nature. Okay, nobody touched we'll anybody else's. If we have the other three, we'll let simple battery go. Reckless driving, I, I assume that's what he was going to argue, and reckless conduct as lesser included of, I'm assuming, of the aggravated assault with the motor vehicle is what you're seeking. Yeah, so. so what I understand is under aggravated assault on Mr. Bryan's verdict form, you're going to be requesting lesser included of simple assault, guilty, not guilty, reckless conduct, not guilty, guilty, reckless driving, not guilty, guilty. Yes. Ag assault mm -hmm. under seven. Correct. Under count seven. Mm -hmm. Don't think it falls under 
count not the lesser's under count nine. Mm -hmm. It's just. Well, yeah, I think I, I think they would be properly lesser's under count nine as well. Yeah, false imprisonment, criminal attempt at false imprisonment, criminal attempt to detain him in violation of his personal liberty. It's not going to be simple assault, reckless conduct, and reckless driving. The state well, disagrees. If he was attempting to stop or block his path to travel, he might not be guilty of a false imprisonment or an attempt, but he might well be guilty of these offenses. Again, the jury is the ultimate de determiner of the facts in the case, and they may well conclude that Mr. Bryan did not have the intent to confine and detain, but may have had the intent to stop or block his path, which could well be reckless conduct or reckless driving. So th these are also appropriate lesser offenses uh, of those latter counts. Certainly nine and arguably eight. Then from the state. State disagrees on the false imprisonment and criminal attempt at false imprisonment. State sees what Mr. Bryan's asking for um, for the underlying aggravated assault with the motor vehicle to simple assault, reckless conduct, and reckless driving. Um, and we leave it to the discretion of the court. Thank you, Judge. All right. I'm inclined it's late, and so I it's getting harder and harder to think through this, but I believe at this point, uh, count seven, I'll go ahead and charge on the lesser simple assault, reckless conduct, and reckless driving. That would, I'm trying to remember where I normally put them in the charge. I think that would just go underneath the, um, in order to make sure that it's clear, I'm gonna need to put some language in on the lessers, only applying then to Mr. Bryan, and I'll probably drop them in around the aggravated, probably at the end of the aggravated assault charge, and just do it that way, and make sure that it's clear on what those apply to. Okay. Okay. One more. Easy one. on carjacking, uh, which we believe is adjusted to the evidence in the case, especially given the testimony of Travis uh, yesterday. Um, under 16.544, a person commits offense of carjacking that is hijacked a motor vehicle in the second degree. When without the use of a firearm or a weapon, such person attempts to obtain a motor vehicle from an individual without his consent. Now, the court's already going to charge what it is to attempt to commit a crime. Uh, and the offense of hijacking a motor vehicle, the jury probably needs to know, uh, is, a, is the in the second degree is a felony, whether or not the attempt is successful. Again, at 16544, uh, if opposing counsel or co counsel are opposed to that charge, I mean, I, I would be open to suggestion, but I think it's adjusted to the evidence in this case. point in time did anyone say Mr. Arbery was attempting to obtain a motor vehicle from an individual without his consent? All Mr. Bryan ever said was he started reaching for my door handle and I sped off. There's palm print on the side of the car. This is after he's already tried to run him off the road into the ditch. This is after he's already tried to hit him with the car. And now we're on like the third aggravated assault with the motor vehicle and he's reaching for the door. <laughs> The state's argument, of course, is that, of course he's reaching for the door. You got so close to him, he's trying to push off away from this truck so that you don't hit him so he doesn't get hurt. And this idea from his perspective of, oh, my window's open, and now I'm starting to think, oh my gosh, I'm actually getting really close to this person. I should speed off. To claim that that's carjacking is, is well, ludicrous. Um, but on this one, I'm gonna leave it to the discretion of the court. Uh, to determine if there was sufficient evidence. All Travis McMichael said was, I wonder why that guy's attacking that truck. Once again, no indication of an intent to obtain a motor vehicle from an individual without his consent. Obviously, Mr. Arbery never said anything. There was no weapon ever shown. Um, and this isn't a slider crime. As we all know, 
uh, hijacking motor vehicle in the second degree was all designed for slider crimes. Uh, gas stations, you pull up, you slide in, you drive off in the car uh, without a weapon. So without a weapon, attempting to obtain the motor vehicle from Mr. Bryan, there's actually no evidence that that actually took place. Um, and Mr. Bryan, of course, never said that. So the only thing I can see is just Mr. Sheffield from the top of his shoulders up. <laughs> that, that slider is a meat yeah, sandwich okay. that's a smaller <laughs> version of a larger <laughs> sandwich. I, that's what I know. I figured it was something like that. Sheffield has a slider. Yeah. All right. Um, we, we, I think there is evidence that there's been an attempted carjacking or something. I mean, Travis McMichael testified to it twice, that he saw him trying to get into the truck and it caused him apprehension. And he testified that he looked down the street he saw Mr. Arbery trying to get into the truck. He thought one of three things, that this was somebody confronting him from 220, that this was somebody who was with him, that he was going to try to get in the car, or that he was trying to take this person's car, and that it, he looked angry and aggressive when doing it. So I think there is evidence to support it. it no, it's, not, it, it's not an insubstantial matter. If the jury, and it's for the jury to decide. It's second degree, not first degree. But if the jury were to decide that Mr. Arbery, uh, reason, uh, the, the probable cause existed in the presence and immediate knowledge of Mr. Bryan and the presence and immediate knowledge of the McMichaels, if they were to conclude that the evidence supported the carjack, then at that moment, they are independently authorized to effectuate a citizen arrest. And it's up to the jury to decide whether Mr. Arbery was justified in committing a violent property crime under the circumstances in order to uh, escape or elude capture, whether by law enforcement or by these defendants. To, you can't take that issue away from the jury. And it's a critical point in this case. Now, th there's some dispute okay. in I'll, I'll uh, sit down. I'll think that through. Uh, it, it's too late in the day for me to make that decision. Okay, I will think that through. And when I get back on the issues that I'm going to receive some emails on, I will uh, clarify where the court is on it. Your Honor, did you leave the conspiracy issues on page uh, 14 I just did. for your? Did you? You didn't. My notes indicate you don't need anything more from I, us I than we've already provided. I don't. I just got to finish thinking that through, and I just haven't had an opportunity to do that yet. Thank you. I don't dare go around the room one more time. <laughs> I will go ahead and address the matters that I need to address. I will look for the information that council has promised me uh, by tomorrow, and I will try to get you a clean draft of the charge late Saturday or sometime Sunday. Um, we will then reconvene at 9 o'clock tomorrow, not tomorrow, Monday morning. And, um, you yeah, know, sheriff's deputies almost fell out of the chairs. <laughs> um, we'll reconvene at 9 o'clock Monday morning and hopefully be able to move into closings at that time. I don't dare ask, but does anyone have anything pressing for the court before we recess? No, Judge. No, Your Honor. No. Thank you, Your Honor. All right. Thank you, everybody. We will see everybody on Monday. Thank you, Judge. being live is all about this is abc news live all right we're gonna move back let's move back we're surrounded by no people squeezing into this bomb shelter run urgent delivery run with not afraid to go there so my question mr president what are you so afraid of breaking news live events this is the moment Lift off. Okay, this is streaming straight to you anytime anywhere you just met one friend right here you're watching abc news live thanks for streaming with us it was an extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed to report to prison to begin a 17-year sentence. They let him turn himself into jail with no escort. No one thought he would run. How do you evade capture for 25 years? How do you do that? Now, join the search, following the U.S. Marshals as they uncover new leads in a global manhunt. Can you help catch this fugitive? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Listen and join the all-new hunt wherever you get your podcasts. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. 
What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. The ladies you love. The hottest topics happening now. There's only one place to find it all. You guys are having the hard conversations. I love The View. The most watched number one daytime talk show is The View. Now streaming on ABC News Live. Choose ABC News, America's number one news source. This is American history, a violent white mob, a brutal attack. 300 black Americans killed right here in America. Now, it is time to uncover Tulsa's buried truth. The gripping story brought to light in a new podcast from ABC News. Available now on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. Right now, with so much at stake, Sunday mornings, this is the place. Taking on all the tough questions. Straightforward reporting. No spin, no hype, no bull. See why Sunday mornings, more and more Americans are now turning first to ABC's This Week with George. Stephanopoulos. Welcome to this week. I risked my life. I put my family in danger. If I was caught, they would have put a bullet in my head. But it was the right thing to do. It was the only thing to do. Terror plot foiled in Garden City, Kansas. That would have been one of the most deadly acts of domestic terrorism ever in the United States. It would have been Oklahoma City. Where the sky. He put his family himself in jeopardy for us. The mysterious boyfriend. What does he even do over there? Tell me everything. You'll be okay. No one knows about us. He's the chief executive and she's a kid. You have committed multiple federal crimes. I want to talk to my lawyer. The White House disposed of me like a piece of trash. And they will do the same to you. Impeachment American Crime Story. Tuesdays at 10, only on FX. Available now on demand. Just 15 years old, actress McKenna Grace is already a veteran performer with dozens of roles to her credit. Wow. And now she's joining her even more experienced co-stars, uh, Paul Rudd, Carrie Coon, and the real OGs, Bill Murray, Ernie Hudson, and Dan Aykroyd, in the brand new and long-awaited Ghostbusters Afterlife. Take a look. Is that a free-floating metal muncher? Definitely class five. Okay, uh, what do we do? Keep the candle. What? We get a photo first. Oh, it has a gunner seat? So, uh, please welcome the very talented McKenna Grace. Here we go. I think my seatbelt buckles came undone. I saw. Yeah, it's, it's fine. You did a good Hi. walk. Though. I came bearing gifts. Oh, oh I like gifts. <laughs> <laughs> He's oh. oh. I love it. I love that. So sweet. Oh, I love this. Look at this little guy. 
Oh, my grandson will love this. I'll put I it love in. it. This is a good Christmas oh, stocking. It is. So yes. Thank you. And it's I'm another of those iconic mine. movies that I know oh, this oh, is. <laughs> yeah. No one ever yeah, brings right? gifts on this I know. set of really? guests. Yeah. No. Okay. Thank Sonny, you. you have the first I question. do. I'm sorry. I was all wrapped up in the gift. Okay, so you just walked out to the original Ghostbusters theme uh. song from 1984. <laughs> um, fans have been waiting for the sequel forever, to the, um, for, for decades, really. And it's such a big deal. I watch it with my 15-year-old daughters, your same age, yesterday. <laughs> um, and you're starring in it. That's so huge. What happens in this continuation of the story? And um, were you really nervous to take on something that's just so beloved? Oh, of course. I'm, I'm always nervous. <laughs> um, I was very nervous walking out here. I'm so excited. Thank you all for having me. Oh, and I love you. your eyeshadow. But Oh, thank um, you. <laughs> In this one, it's really nice because it's not a remake, it's not a redoing, it's a yeah. direct continuation of the second film. Yeah. Uh, and it's so fun because it really takes, uh, it picks up where the <laughs> Ghostbusters left off yeah. 30 or years ago, yeah. um, which is so fun because it's a completely different era and it's introducing this whole new idea of Ghostbusters. Yeah. But it's still very reminiscent of the first one. And it's um, great when the big, when the car comes. You know, yeah. Uh, it's amazing. It's so fun because this movie really is for the fans. It has a really wonderful story, but at the same time, everybody, I, I watch it with 3,000 Ghostbusters fans at Comic-Con, and every single time anything closely related to the original film happened, everybody just burst out screaming and cheers. Oh, wow. And it's well, such a special film for everyone who loves really the original. Cool. Well, and you were at the premiere on Monday. I and, was. and you said that a lot of people came up dressed as Ghostbusters, <laughs> but you also, uh, three of the original Ghostbusters, Ernie Hudson, Dan Aykroyd, and Bill Murray were there, and you brought your family to go with you to the premiere. What was that all like? I did. <laughs> it was very fun. It was so cool. I always like lose my mind whenever I see so many Ghostbusters fans all dressed up as the Ghostbusters and it's just so cool to meet them all and I have like a jacket covered in the patches that they give me um, but it was really fun that I got to bring like my family and friends because I got to bring my grandma I got to bring my great-grandpa and, wow. and some friends Aww. but that we were great. we were that. taking oh look, look at that, that. Oh, wait, wait. if you see that Picture, Bill, that's, that's Bill Murray and my great grandpa. Aww. For, for some reason, my great grandpa was standing behind the photographer as we Aww. took a group picture, and Bill Murray goes, Who's the guy with the stick? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he, he looks like he lives in a cave. And I went, Sir, that's my great grandpa. <laughs> and then he goes, Does he live in a cave? And I go, How dare you? And he goes, You can pull it off. Sounds like he yeah. and Joy would get along quite well. Yeah. <laughs> Bill Murray's a very funny guy. My yeah. great grandpa just started walking out onto the carpet. And I was like, Grandpa, back up. No, we're taking a group picture. You can't come out. And he has a hearing aid. He couldn't hear very well. I was like, Papa, back up. <laughs> And he just kept on coming out, and Bill Murray was like, "Get him in the picture!" And now he's in the picture, so now and now like, he's Bill on the Murray view too. And my great grandpa. Hi, great grandpa. Oh, they must be so. Oh, oh they've got to be well, so proud of me. Oh my gosh, I bet all my grandparents are watching. Hi, grandma. Hi, grandma. Oh, great grandpa. Grandpa. And my great grandparents. Everybody. Well, you are also a singer, a songwriter. By the way, you have a beautiful, beautiful voice. Oh, thank um, you. You have a new song out now, which runs in the end credits of Ghostbusters, fittingly called Haunted House. <laughs> and you co-directed the new music video. You're so talented. Um, let's take a look. I think we have a clip. Oh. No, it's not healthy. It doesn't help me. I do it anyways. Looking at photos, reading the letters that you gave me. I could never throw them out. Because a ghost never leaves a haunted house. You do. What can't you do? Um, but you, you wrote the song during the pandemic, and as I mentioned, my daughter Paloma is is your age. Um, I know this time has been really difficult, actually, um, uh, for for a lot of young people. What was your inspiration for the song? Um, well, like you said, I think that uh, the pandemic was really rough on a lot of people, and I, too, went through a lot of uh, situations with people I knew uh, mm -hmm. during my personal life. But uh, the great part about this song is that it's not about one certain person. It's about a bunch of situations that I had just kind of melded into one song that sounds mm -hmm. like a breakup song. But yeah. it's great because <laughs> it's not really that much about a breakup with a significant other, more as just 
a breakup with a person whenever you don't really talk to someone anymore and you have all these memories that you're never really going to forget. And you're like, what do I do with all of these? Mm -hmm. uh, so it could be about a family member, a friend, or a significant wow. other. But I, it's kind of oh. more of a love song towards those memories that okay. you'll never forget. The, the memories that never leave you, a ghost that never leaves a haunted house. You Wait know? till you're 50. You're going to forget the memories. <laughs> <laughs> Time takes care of everything. <laughs> you're just such a you're such a beautiful talent. Like you are yeah. such a gift, and you've had a career already for like ten years. You're Fifteen, and you've had like a ten year career. I loved you in Fuller House. You played a young Tanya Harding. Yeah, yeah. Handmaid's that. Tale. Oh, the yeah. list goes on. I remember <laughs> How did you get that into when you were like, yeah, she was great in Handmaid's Tale. When you were you were five, right? When you first got into wow. performing or acting. How did that even begin for you? <laughs> Uh, I was. Isn't it crazy? You were I, really I, spooky in Handmaid's Tale. Oh, thank you. I yeah, tried. That was good. Um, I <laughs> honestly, I don't know how it stuck so for, for so long, for 10 years now. Um, it's crazy that I get to sit here and talk to you guys in New York and such. I mean, it just kind of started out. I, I, Whenever I was little, I always loved watching Shirley Temple, and I wanted to be just like her. Oh, wow. So I, I would beg my mom. But my mom was like, no, McKenna, you've, you've gotten like fixated on, like, you want to do gymnastics, you want to do dancing, you want to go and do all these things. I can't put you in this, too. She was like, that's so weird. I'm not going to make you an actress. Like, what? We live in Texas. And I begged her and begged her and begged her, and I never let it go. And then she was finally like, fine, I'll put you in acting classes. Yeah. She told the instructor, she was like, you know, she really does love to do this. I think and, it's going to stick. And now you're, like, <laughs> now you're directing and working on something with your dad? Like, so exactly. I think it's like to be such a late bloomer. <laughs> <laughs> Man, it's rough. Sit. I hope you're enjoying the ride, McKenna. Oh, I am. You have to enjoy it. I'm so thankful for all of this. Yes. I, I love what I do. Well, Thanks our, for the gift. We'd like to thank Yay. you for coming. Thanks to McKenna Grace. Go see her in Ghostbusters Afterlife in theaters today. We'll be right back. <laughs> an extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed to report to prison to begin a 17-year sentence. They let him turn himself into jail with no escort. No one thought he would run. How do you evade capture for 25 years? How do you do that? Now, join the search, following the U.S. Marshals as they uncover new leads in a global manhunt. Can you help catch this fugitive? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Listen and join the all-new hunt wherever you get your podcasts. Whitney Houston. I'm not a person who wants to die. Kobe Bryant. No matter what happens, the storm eventually ends. John Ritter. There was so much beauty in his life. Richard Pryor. The funniest person on the planet. Robin Williams. He was a meteor that came to the world. Superstars. Unbelievable lives gone too soon. Sunday, watch the Superstar Marathon event special. Streaming only on ABC News Live. World News Now. And America This Morning. The best new video. The breaking news overnight. Emergency crews called to the town of Surfside. U.S. airstrikes hitting targets in Iraq and Syria. The stories people are talking about. You don't want to shave your legs? Don't. I was going to say. Oh my. Got it. And what to expect in the day ahead. ABC World News Now and America This Morning. Starting at 2 a.m. Eastern. Up all night to keep you up to date. Right now, with so much at stake, Sunday mornings, this is the place. Taking on all the tough questions, straightforward reporting, no spin, no hype, no bull. See why Sunday mornings, more and more Americans are now turning first to ABC's This Week with George Stephanopoulos. Welcome to This Week. I risked my life. I put my family in danger. If I was caught, they would have put a bullet in my head. But it was the right thing to do. It was the only thing to do. Terror plot foiled in Garden City, Kansas. That would have been one of the most deadly acts of domestic terrorism ever in the United States. It would have been Oklahoma City. He put his family himself in jeopardy for us. Mr. President, do you know a woman named Monica Lewinsky? I do. How long has this been going on? Huh? We have to be really careful. Someone needs to go public. I want to say one thing to the American people. These allegations are false. This is my real life we're talking about, and I'm scared. Impeachment American Crime Story, Tuesdays at 10, only on FX. Available now on demand.
This is what being live is all about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded by people squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Lift off. Oh, this is the moment. Streaming straight to you anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. Right now, with so much at stake, Sunday mornings, this is the place. Taking on all the tough questions. Straightforward reporting. No spin, no hype, no bull. See why Sunday mornings, more and more Americans are now turning first to ABC's This Week with George Stephanopoulos. Welcome to This Week. It was great to have you here again, Abby. Um, that was did fun. you have fun? It's like I never left. See? <laughs> right. It really does feel like I'm, And thank you guys for having me. This has been so fun. Check out her new podcast called I Wish Somebody Told Me. Uh, so uh, everybody should go out there and get that vaccine because it's a nightmare. Let's end it. Yeah. And get also a vasectomy if you want. Have a great, have a great I know what happened. And I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? and figure out what's really out there. It's an extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed to report to prison to begin a 17-year sentence. They let him turn himself into jail with no escort. No one thought he would run. How do you evade capture for 25 years? How do you do that? Now, join the search, following the U.S. Marshals as they uncover new leads in a global manhunt. Can you help catch this fugitive? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Listen and join the all-new hunt wherever you get your podcasts. Whitney Houston. I'm not a person who wants to die. Kobe Bryant. No matter what happens, the storm eventually ends. John Ritter. There was so much beauty in his life. Richard Pryor. The funniest person on the planet. Robin Williams. He was a meteor that came to the world. Superstars. Unbelievable lives gone too soon. Sunday, watch the Superstar Marathon event special. Streaming only on ABC News Live. Is that the gun? That's not the gun. What is it? I won't ask you again then. <laughs> the deeper you go into black markets, <laughs> the darker it gets. Why hasn't anyone come out and spoken? It's about the money, that's all we do. I risked my life. I put my family in danger. If I was caught, they would have put a bullet in my head. But it was the right thing to do. It was the only thing to do. Terror plot foiled in Garden City, Kansas. That would have been one of the most deadly acts of domestic terrorism ever in the United States. It would have been Oklahoma City. He put his family, himself, in jeopardy for us. The most powerful stories of our time, anytime. Nightline. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues. The hunt. True crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. I know what happened, and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart that he did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it.
This is what being live is all about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by people no squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Lift off. <laughs> Streaming straight to you, anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. This is American history. A violent white mob, a brutal attack. 300 black Americans killed right here in America. Now, it is time to uncover Tulsa's buried truth. The gripping story brought to light in a new podcast from ABC News. Available now on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. What you need to know right now on GMA3. New concerns over COVID-19. Austria with low vaccination rates now going on lockdown and mandating vaccines as more than half the U.S. sees a rise in infections. Those boosters get the green light to offer extra protection. All aboard. The president of Amtrak joins us as Americans get ready to hit the rails for the holiday with news on how President Biden's infrastructure rehaul may show up on the tracks. And look what's percolating during National Entrepreneurship Month. We sell 100% real, single-origin Vietnamese coffee. We do not use any additives, fillers, or artificial ingredients. The business owner jolting coffee lovers with her Vietnamese specialty brew and new ideas on sustainable farming. Plus the Diane Sawyer 2020 special event. It's been four years since the day in January 2018 when they were rescued, treated at a hospital, and given new life. Escape from a house of horror. The children held captive for so long in such harrowing conditions, finally speaking out. And everybody give thanks on this Faith Friday. Minneapolis pastor Angela Kabeb, friend of GMA, she is here in person in studio with words of wisdom for all of us. And she shines in Miracle in Motor City. Guys. I just got an email from Smokey's office. Yes, what does it say? Well, it's not his personal email. I'm on the mailing list. Tia Mori on her new Lifetime holiday movie. Now from Times Square, TJ Holmes and Amy Robach with what you need to know. And hello, everybody. The GMA3, what you need to know, as Robach has been out in Antarctica, we've had special guests here with us on this show this week. They don't get any more nope. special. Than who we have with us today, Diane Sawyer. Everybody yeah. here with us. Legend. Oh, legend. I thought you'd never ask. Oh, God. Sitting by my phone. Oh. How many years? <laughs> Waiting on the call. Hi. Yeah, I like that. How it's great are to be you here. doing? It is I'm so great. good to see you. I'm so glad to bring this story to this you. Story, and again, we call it a, a house of horror is, is what mm -hmm. we're talking about in this story, the special, 2020 special. But you said incredible light and hope and courage really is what the story is about. A hundred reasons to hope and believe. Yes. And so that's coming up tonight. And again, you, um, these young ladies, just put the Turpin family we were talking about here. Uh -huh. but. Put into terms, how would you describe um, these kids and what they went through and how they came out of it? Just in, in a few words, how would you describe them for what they went through? Well, I think we can't imagine yeah. the way they were living. Mm -hmm. I think we can't imagine what it was in the middle of that to invent a light that would shine and yeah. take you out of a window sill on a dark night, having yeah. no idea what the world outside was like. Yeah and have the courage to do that, to get in that window and make a run for it to save your brothers and sisters. When you showed that clip this morning on Good Morning America, you could hear a pin drop mm -hmm. in the studio. And what was so astounding is that that girl, that young woman, didn't even know words mm -mm. to describe what she had gone through. No, they wanted an education so much they had no education. Mm -hmm. So that when she's going out, she's going out on faith. And as I said, her the only thing equal to her terror was her courage. Wow. So we are looking forward to hearing more about that. I just love that line. They had to invent their own light. They had to create their own light to get through that. But Diane, it's so good to have you. Stay by the phone. I will call more <laughs> often, okay? I'm sorry. I didn't know. But Dr. Ashton here is always, as you know, uh, covering. I'll uh, send you whiny little emails. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you don't write, you don't I, call. I will <laughs> answer them. But uh, we're going to have more about that 2020 in just a bit here with Diane Sawyer. But uh, we're going to talk about our big number following developments as we always do. The number is 27. Doesn't seem like a big number, but when we're talking about 27 states, that's more than half the country seeing a steady uptick in COVID-19 daily cases. 
Thanksgiving right around the corner. That is not good news. We don't need to hear that, Dr. Ashton. No. But uh, a lot of kids are starting, the young, young ones are starting to get vaccinated. Some of them maybe only have one dose right, right. now. Supposed to get a second in 21 days. But if you got the one... That's better than nothing. It is better than nothing, and it's something, um, Diane and TJ, that, that we're hearing from pediatric epidemiologists, in particular one at the Harvard Chan School of Public Health, saying that parents who are thinking of having their children ages 5 through 11 get COVID vaccinated, they shouldn't say, well, they're not going to have the full dose before the holidays, so therefore it does no good. We know from our data, both in children and in adults, that one dose absolutely about 10 days later starts to give you some degree of immune protection. Obviously, you need the full regimen, which right now is two doses. Some groups, like pregnant women, that second dose is critically important, but one dose better than no dose. So it is not too late to get your child vaccinated in time for some of those holiday gatherings. All right. Well, we'll continue to check in with you. As always, Dr. Ashton, let's turn now to Elwin Lopez. Oh, you got a good, you got a good day here on GMA. Oh, you just tell you. <laughs> good to be here today for this one. Got Dave and Muir yesterday and yes. Diane Sawyer today. Mm -hmm. All of my colleagues are going to be like, what? <laughs> <laughs> How did I not get this chance? Well, I got the headlines. Yes. It's always good to have you here with us. Thanks though. for having me. And we begin here today with a delayed vote on Capitol Hill. President Biden's sweeping social bill held up as Republican Kevin McCarthy talked all night long, breaking Speaker Nancy Pelosi's previous record throughout his eight-hour monologue. The top House Republican chewed on candy and mints, but only held up things temporarily. Pelosi took the podium again today before lawmakers take a vote on that historic measure. And now to the optimistic holiday season forecast. Macy's CEO saying they do not expect a big impact from supply chain issues and BJ's wholesalers predicting growth in all sectors. Walmart and Target also boasting strong numbers and good sales. And across the country, celebrations for Julius Jones, Oklahoma's governor, commuting the prisoner's sentence at the 11th hour to life imprisonment without parole. Students seen walking out in class in support of the case catching the attention of athletes and celebrities. Jones maintained his innocence for years. His spiritual advisor telling ABC's Nightline that Jones hopes to see sunshine for the first time now that he's finally off death row. And now let's go overseas. Amnesty International now calling on China to prove tennis star Peng Shui is safe and to investigate those sexual assault allegations she made against a former Chinese official. Shui has not been seen publicly since she made those accusations. The tennis world demanding answers. China's foreign ministry says it is not aware of the controversy. And Adele drops 30, her fourth album after six long years, saying it has helped her out of sadness. Many critics praising the album as her best album yet. Oh, Adele going easy on us as we head into this weekend. You probably heard me singing some of her songs. Yes, that was me. Sorry about that. <laughs> I won't do it again. <laughs> but Ellen, it's been great having you here thank in you. studio with us this week. So Thanks thank for you so me. much. Thank well, coming up here, of course, we're going to have more on Diane's very special 2020. Again, a story of hope and courage uh, coming up in just a bit. But also, we're talking Thanksgiving travel tips up next from a man who keeps the trains running. Literally, Amtrak CEO will join us and how the huge infrastructure infusion may change train travel for the better for millions of folks. And then, Cool Beans, the business owner, caffeinating America with her Vietnamese special coffee and her advice for other entrepreneurs out there. You all stay with us on a very special Friday, Diane Sawyer edition of GMA3. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you too. This is what being live is Three all seconds. about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by people no squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not them. afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Lift off. <laughs> Streaming straight to you, anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. 
How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. This is American history, a violent white mob, a brutal attack, 300 black Americans killed right here in America. Now, it is time to uncover Tulsa's buried truth, the gripping story brought to light in a new podcast from ABC News, available now on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. Sex, gambling, fraud, betrayal, and murder. Cutthroat Inc., the podcast. Me the a family truth. on a mission to find their son. A year's worth of conversations with the killer. Cutthroat Inc., subscribe for free now on your favorite podcast app. Assault on the Capitol, the ABC News original, exclusively on Hulu, now streaming. Now with so much on the line, more Americans are turning to David Muir and ABC's World News Tonight than any other program across all of television. I risked my life. I put my family in danger. If I was caught, they would have put a bullet in my head. But it was the right thing to do. It was the only thing to do. Terror plot foiled in Garden City, Kansas. That would have been one of the most deadly acts of domestic terrorism ever in the United States. It would have been Oklahoma City. He put his family himself in jeopardy for us. Whitney Houston. I'm not a person who wants to die. Kobe Bryant. No matter what happens, the storm eventually ends. John Ritter. There was so much beauty in his life. Richard Pryor. The funniest person on the planet. Robin Williams. He was a meteor that came to the world. Superstars. Unbelievable lives gone too soon. Sunday, watch the Superstar Marathon event special. Streaming only on ABC News Live. Is that the gun? That's not the gun. What is it? I won't ask you again then. <laughs> the deeper you go into black markets, the darker it gets. Why hasn't anyone come out and spoken? It's about the money, that's all we do. You never know what you're going to get on this show. That's all I'm going to tell you. Yes, Whoopi! This mic on? Can you hear me out there? Behind the scenes is always a better show. Absolutely. 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 That's what people don't see during the commercial break. Right. They don't. What happened? I had no idea really what I was getting myself into. That day that we walked out, I, I treasured that day. I just, I couldn't sit there. You're doing good, Joy. You're doing good. Oh, yeah, baby. It was crazy. Behind the table. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back to GMA3, everybody. This week, President Biden signed his $1.2 trillion infrastructure plan, which includes a historic $66 billion investment in Amtrak. So what does that mean for the future of rail travel in this country? Let's turn to the person who knows right here in Times Square with us, President of Amtrak, Stephen Gardner. Sir, uh, good to have you here. $66 billion. Is that enough to transform rail travel? What is that $66 billion going to do? Well, thanks, TJ. It's really going to allow Amtrak to modernize a lot of our core assets. So new trains, rebuilt and new infrastructure and expanded stations, improved stations all over the country. Uh, it is a long time coming. We turned 50 this year wow. and it, uh, it's, we've been waiting as a company for a long time for this type of investment so we can modernize the system for the 21st century. We call the 66 billion historic. Put it in some kind of historical context. How big of an infusion is this? Well, over five years, the 60, 60 or so billion for passenger rail is the equivalent of 
entire amount of funding for Amtrak over 50 years. Oh my goodness, that is historic then. So a, a long time coming there. Um, you're going to, you said, modernize. Um, how would you describe the system now? I mean, how far behind, uh, if you will, um, are your trains, your technology right now? We've got a deficit of billions of dollars of investment, not only here in the Northeast where we own infrastructure that's over 150 years old. We've got tunnels from the Civil War. We've got stations that were built back before automobiles. We've got a huge deficit of investment that over the last several decades, we've been working on incrementally improving and planning for this moment, but a lot of work to do. And our equipment, our rolling stock, these are our trains, our locomotives, our passenger cars. Many of them were delivered to us in the 70s. They're, oh they're as old as I am, and, and it's time to replace <laughs> them. And we've got a bunch of things on order, and we're going to replace them all here in the next uh, several years. And now, have you all keep uh, looking at your, your account app and waiting for that money to come in? Is the money there? How Soon before you can actually yeah. start implementing some of this stuff and, and passengers start to see a, a difference? Well, all of this work that we're, we're going to do is going to be done in partnership with the uh, Secretary Buttigieg and, and the Department of Transportation. And funds will come to them and then they'll uh, provide them to us. We'll work in partnership with them to both invest in our core assets and partner with the, the Department of Transportation in the states to hopefully expand service to new corridors all over America. Where? Where do you want to go? Uh, and where should uh, rail travel be in this country? Yeah, well, so Amtrak was formed 50 years ago. Since that time, 1971, we've added about 120 million people to the country. But yet our network still looks basically like it did in 1971. Mm -hmm. And a lot of those people have been uh, added in the southeast, in the south, in the mountain west. So places like Atlanta, cities like Columbus, Ohio, where we don't even serve. It's a two million person metropolitan area. Denver, uh, front range growth has been massive. And these are the types of cities that we think Amtrak can make a big difference in and connect not only cities, but those towns and intermediate areas to those places of growth. All right, one other thing here. What are you seeing numbers wise in terms of people and holiday travel? Uh, where is it now compared to where we were? Or where it was last year when we were right smack dab in the middle of the pandemic. Yeah, so TJ, we've come a long way from there. We're about 65 to 70 percent of our pre-pandemic demand levels overall, but we're looking actually at a pretty busy Thanksgiving. So uh, we've already got some 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 trains that are really quite full. I'm hoping everybody will uh, book uh, their tickets <laughs> soon. Uh, so it's going to be a busy Thanksgiving for us, and uh, we look forward to continuing to grow uh, over the course of the year as people get back to traveling. And a reminder as well, in the train stations and on the trains, masks are required. Absolutely. Masks are required, and uh, we, we appreciate everybody's cooperation there. Uh, keeps that trip safe, comfortable, and convenient. All right, we will let you get out of here. Now you got a train to catch. Amtrak President Stephen Gardner. It is good to have you here in studio with us. We all hope to catch up. Let us know when that uh, when those funds start coming in, all right? Thank you. Right. Yeah. My <laughs> well, pleasure. Up next here, folks, on GMA3, uh, did you know November is the month to celebrate entrepreneurship? Yes, we're going to meet the Vietnamese-American business owner who is literally perking things up with her specialty coffee. Stay with us on GMA3. We're we'll right back. It was an extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed to report to prison to begin a 17-year sentence. They let him turn himself into jail with no escort. No one thought he would run. How do you evade capture for 25 years? How do you do that? Now, join the search, following the U.S. Marshals as they uncover new leads in a global manhunt. Can you help catch this fugitive? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Listen and join the all-new hunt wherever you get your podcasts. I risked my life. I put my family in danger. If I was caught, they would have put a bullet in my head. But it was the right thing to do. It was the only thing to do. Terror plot foiled in Garden City, Kansas. That would have been one of the most deadly acts of domestic terrorism ever in the United States. It would have been Oklahoma City. He put his family himself in jeopardy for us. Whitney Houston. I'm not a person who wants to die. Kobe Bryant. No matter what happens, the storm eventually ends. John Ritter. There was so much beauty in his life. Richard Pryor. The funniest person on the planet. Robin Williams. He was a meteor that came to the world. Superstars. Unbelievable lives gone too soon. Sunday, watch the Superstar Marathon event special. Streaming only on ABC News Live. Is that the gun? That's not the gun. What is it? 
I won't ask you again then. Are you a night <laughs> The deeper you go into the black market, the darker it gets. Why hasn't anyone come out and spoken? It's about the money, that's all we do. You never know what you're gonna get on this show. That's all I'm gonna tell you. Yes, Whoopi! This mic on? Can you hear me out there? Behind the scenes is always a better show. Absolutely, always. absolutely. That's what people don't see during the commercial break. Right, they don't. What happened? I had no idea really what I was getting myself into. That day that we walked out, I, I treasure that day. I just, I couldn't sit there. You're doing good, Joy. You're doing good. Oh, yeah, baby. It was crazy. Behind the Table. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. World News Now. And America This Morning. The best new video. The breaking news overnight. Emergency crews called to the town of Surfside. U.S. airstrikes hitting targets in Iraq and Syria. The stories people are talking about. If you don't want to shave your legs, don't. I was just saying. Oh my. Got it. And what to expect in the day ahead. ABC World News Now and America This Morning. Starting at 2 a.m. Eastern. Up all night to keep you up to date. Right now, with so much at stake, Sunday mornings, this is the place. Taking on all the tough questions, straightforward reporting, no spin, no hype, no bull. See why Sunday mornings, more and more Americans are now turning first to ABC's This Week with George Stephanopoulos. Welcome to This Week. being live is Please all about this is abc news live all right we're gonna move back let's move back we're surrounded this by so people squeezing into this bomb shelter we're on an urgent delivery run with not afraid to go there so my question mr president what are you so afraid of breaking news live events this is the moment Lift off. <laughs> Streaming straight to you anytime anywhere you just met one friend right here you're watching abc news live thanks for streaming with us Welcome back to GMA3, and we are back now with the National Entrepreneurship Month. And the business owner is perking things up with the coffee world and her Vietnamese coffee brand. She's a daughter of refugees, and she's opening eyes one cup of coffee at a time. Take a look at this. Win Coffee Supply is America's first specialty single origin Vietnamese coffee importer and roaster. We import Vietnamese coffee beans through direct trade relationships in Vietnam. We sell 100% real single origin Vietnamese coffee. We do not use any additives, fillers, or artificial ingredients. When I was first starting to do research for the company, I was so shocked to find all of these negative perceptions around Vietnamese coffee. Today, we're talking about why Vietnam, as a coffee producer, is rarely talked about. People were using really, really, really mean words to describe Vietnamese coffee. What that does is it traps producers and people and communities who are behind this product into economic exploitation. I set out to change the narrative I actually grew up pretty ashamed and embarrassed of who I was and embarrassed of my parents' like refugee immigrant background. My connection to my culture went from shame to pride when I was so fortunate enough to join a youth activist organization that was housed in the Asian American Studies program at UMass Boston. I began to develop a deep sense of pride for my culture, for my parents' journey, and everything that they went through. When I discovered that Vietnam is the second largest coffee producer in the world, I was so shocked. And it's because of lack of transparency and lack of visibility and lack of representation. To the hardest working guys in the coffee biz. Yes. <laughs> it is such an incredible feeling to see people enjoying Vietnamese coffee now. What's also been really special is when I meet other people, whether they're other Vietnamese Americans or other Asian Americans, or other, you know, folks of color who come up to me or write me a message and say, I feel seen 
to your company. Excuse me? It's so gratifying and exciting to see that we are creating a culture shift and we are creating a narrative shift. For anyone looking to start their own business, get really clear on your intention. As long as you know your why, when things get difficult, just go back to your why as your North Star and you can be confident that you're always making the right decision. That's some good advice. Well, stay with us here on GMA3. When we come back, Dr. Ashton is answering your medical questions today. And then, of course, we have the one, the only, Diane Sawyer here in studio with us. She's previewing a remarkable ABC News exclusive, the first conversation with the Turpin children held captive by their parents for so many years. Stay with us on this very special Friday edition of GMA3. It was an extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed to report to prison to begin a 17-year sentence. They let him turn himself into jail with no escort. No one thought he would run. How do you evade capture for 25 years? How do you do that? Now, join the search, following the U.S. Marshals as they uncover new leads in a global manhunt. Can you help catch this fugitive? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Listen and join the all-new hunt wherever you get your podcasts. I risked my life. I put my family in danger. If I was caught, they would have put a bullet in my head. But it was the right thing to do. It was the only thing to do. Terror plot foiled in Garden City, Kansas. That would have been one of the most deadly acts of domestic terrorism ever in the United States. It would have been Oklahoma City. He put his family himself in jeopardy for us. Is that the gun? That's not the gun. What is it? I won't ask you again then. Are you an IT? <laughs> the deeper you go into the black market, <laughs> the darker it gets. Why hasn't anyone come out and spoken? It's about the money, that's all we do. You never know what you're going to get on this show. That's all I'm going to tell you. Yes, Whoopi! This mic on? Can you hear me out there? Behind the scenes is always a better show. Absolutely. 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 That's what people don't see during the commercial break. Right. They don't. What happened? I had no idea really what I was getting myself into. That day that we walked out, I, I treasured that day. I just, I couldn't sit there. You're doing good, Joy. You're doing good. Oh, yeah, baby. It was crazy. Behind the table. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. powerful stories of our time anytime nightline now streaming on abc news live 2020 true crime cinematic real life drama stunning the unthinkable follow the clues the hunt true crime 2020 now streaming on abc news live admit it these days what you need to know seems to change just about every day what is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. I know what happened and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart that he did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it. This is what being live is Three all seconds. about. Five, this is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by people news. squeezing into this bomb shelter. Run, urgent delivery, run with Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Lift off. Streaming straight to you, anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. Welcome back to GMA3, everybody. Dr. Ashton here now with some important information. This is, we, we've talked often and we have put it up here plenty of times with GMA3, the, the, 
the lifeline, if someone needs yes. help, uh, the suicide lifeline. But there's now going to be another way, a new way, there's maybe an easier way an to e get help. That's the hope, and yeah. I think that is the good news, the silver lining, if you will. Um, you know, it's un very unfortunate that we're still facing a suicide epidemic mm -hmm. in this country. Um, but this is one major step in battling that. Uh, there is a lifeline number. We talk about it all the time, 1-800-273-TALK. Now the FCC has unanimously voted to change that to add a three-digit number, 988 to text or call um, with the goal of really making it easier, making it more accessible. We teach children when they see an emergency to call 911. Uh, I think it's really time that we start teaching everyone 988 starting in July of, ne of next summer. Uh, some people saying too late, but um, to let people know who are in crisis that there is a number Everyone should know it, and there's help available. And in particular, TJ, there's a troubling rate increasing prevalence amongst black youth. Mm -hmm. We don't understand why, but over the last 30 years, there's been almost an 80% increase in mm -hmm. suicide attempts amongst black youth. Uh, they may have unique risk factors. They may need to be approached differently. So awareness is key. But again, the 988 will replace the lifeline number is going to be in addition. It, there'll to be a transition, okay. but 988 going for that. Yeah. But that's next summer. That's going to be up. But for now, we do want folks to know that help is available. Again, if you or a loved one struggling, you can call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. As she said earlier, 1-800-273-8255. Or you can text talk to 741-741 for free emotional support 24 hours a day. Stay with us. This is what being live is Three all about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by people this squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run with Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Let's go. Streaming straight to you anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. It was an extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed to report to prison to begin a 17-year sentence. They let him turn himself into jail with no escort. No one thought he would run. How do you evade capture for 25 years? How do you do that? Now, join the search, following the U.S. Marshals as they uncover new leads in a global manhunt. Can you help catch this fugitive? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Listen and join the all-new hunt wherever you get your podcasts. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. The ladies you love. The hottest topics happening now. There's only one place to find it all. You guys are having the hard conversations. I love The View. The most watched number one daytime talk show is The View. Now streaming on ABC News Live. Choose ABC News, America's number one news source. Welcome back to GMA3, What You Need to Know, Sign of the Times. Did you see this sign last night? That spectacular partial lunar eclipse was overnight, but this was the longest we have seen in hundreds and hundreds of years. We've seen all across the American skies. The best sighting, I think they said, was somewhere around 4 in the morning on the East Coast. Did you all, is everybody up checking no, this out? No, TJ. We're up, yes, on our way into GMA at 4 in the morning, and I saw oh, it. Really? Yeah, it was you great. did? It was great. Oh, uh, did you see it this morning? I was sleeping. At four? <laughs> yes. Oh my goodness, I was still. Diane, we this is an ongoing thing with yeah. TJ. Okay. He does not get enough sleep. We're trying to work on that, but mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Oh, I'll call you at night and see if you're sleeping. Oh, oh yeah. I'll check on you. <laughs> this is what you do. I'll help. We have a lot of That's calls good. to make to each other, apparently. <laughs> um, well, Dr. Ashley, we have one question here from viewers as often they send in, but this is the one they had today about the uh, Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Said, I only received the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, but my doctor said I had the highest level of antibodies possible? Why is that? Where this is a great about? question, and I'm glad we're tackling this issue of antibody testing and how to interpret that. I want to emphasize this is not ready for prime time mm -hmm. yet. We do know that we can measure a number, and it's called a titer in an antibody level in a lab, but we don't yet know how to use that information. So I'm hearing from patients, people alike, that they're getting their antibodies tested and their level is good. We don't know what good is. Mm -hmm. Just one point in time without a perspective, a point of comparison, or without published data to say this number is protective, this number reflects waning immunity, means nothing. It's a waste of time and money. In the future, I absolutely believe we will be able to use this as we do with other tighter levels, but right now, that kind of comment is is not useful and it really has no data behind its use in in the practical world yet all right yet all right we keep learning all right dr ashton we thank you as always to our viewers please keep your questions coming to dr ashton on her instagram at dr j ashton want to turn now to diane sawyer here and this uh, abc news exclusive story this is a a story where i guess hope comes out of hell we're talking about the turpin family 13 children mm -hmm. uh, this has been what four years since mm -hmm. they were essentially saved from captivity and they were held captive by their own parents. You got mm -hmm. to meet the, the incredible young lady who essentially escaped and made the phone call for her own rescue. And these were extremes of captivity. Right. As we know, they, they were, when they walked out, they were emaciated. They had not been outside. So you have to imagine, I had no idea what to expect when I met them the first time because the only fresh air they would get would be when they'd stick their heads out the window when their parents weren't looking. So uh, I was wondering, what was going to come around the corner down the hall right. when we said hello. Watch out, here they come. I can't believe the two young women walking toward our cameras. Travelers from a dark world who invented their own light. It's been four years since the day in January 2018 when they were rescued, treated at a hospital, and given new life. Jordan Turpin, now 21 years old. Her sister who helped plan the escape, the oldest Turpin child, Jennifer, now 33. How are you? Awesome. I'm <laughs> doing really good. January 14th, 2018. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Big day. <laughs> What's the first thing you did that you look back on and think, that was my first moment of real freedom? Actually being in the hospital. When music was playing, I got up and I made sure there was a little bit of a floor cleared out and I danced. The first place we went, we went to a park with two of my sisters, and I was so excited because I could smell the air, I could smell the grass. I was like, how could heaven be better than this? Oh my gosh, this is so free, like, this is life. They are speaking for the first time, ready to talk about their lives, but respecting the privacy of the siblings they love, and the stories written on all their bodies when they arrived at the hospital where doctors and nurses wept at what they saw. Children so emaciated they had difficulty walking, stunted growth, heart damage from a lack of nutrients, a preteen whose arm was the size of a four-month-old baby, their speech, their language limited by the isolation and neglect. All of us went through a lot and all of yes. us went through our own things. And to be honest, not even all of us know every single thing each one of us went through. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And nothing's ever going to be that bad. And, and nothing's going to be as bad as 29 years in what the only word I know to call it is hell. You know what, you said you didn't know what to expect when they came around mm -hmm. the corner. What did overcome you in that moment when you finally laid eyes on them, finally heard their voices? It's that thing called wattage. Mm. It's the life force. And I thought, there it is the will to live, the will to explore. They had only fragments of things they'd seen on TV occasionally when their parents were out, and yet they were putting them together into a world that, that gave them hope and gave them expectation. And you know, one of the most amazing moments in this story is when Jordan, 
who is the one who escaped, tells us that she used to go in a bathroom and she used to hide out and she had taken a phone from one of her older siblings who had a, an old phone and she punches up something that becomes a kind of flame lighting the way to freedom oh, and it's Justin Bieber. Wow. And she hears Justin Bieber singing and she says, well, I think he's nice. And he has nice things in his house, and he believes in God. She watches his interviews. And it's one of the small things, the miracles along the way, mm. that she puts together and decides that she's going to try to make this break for freedom. Well, you've done a lot over an incredible career, but you've been working on this story for months and months and months. And it kind of, look, these things can have an impact on us. And have you've, all the stories you have done, it's hard to maybe put this one in there with some perspective for what you have seen throughout your career? I have seen a lot of yeah. amazing life come out of unexpected and unexpected and great suffering. But, but these girls and their whole and their siblings as well have a story to tell that's going to teach us something. I know they do. And we're going to explore, by the way, as well, what has happened to them in the years since they left this system. Mm -hmm and what California and the services have done and not done, mm. and also where they're headed next. So but you'll see them do that, and then you'll see them imitate me doing an interview. Oh, wow. <laughs> yes, which may be one of the more <laughs> sobering experiences of my life, but they are so hilarious. Oh, the, they pick up on everything, they miss <laughs> nothing, and they spend every day looking to make up for the joy they didn't have. Oh, Diane, so many of us for so many years are trying to imitate you doing an interview. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but it is so good to have you here on this set with us. We look forward to this tonight. And again, there's a story of hope all of us can take from it. And everybody, please watch tonight special Diane Sawyer event. It's Escape from a House of Horror. This is at 9 o'clock tonight and stream it afterwards on Hulu. Diane, thank you so, so much. It's great to be here. And it's I will, really great to be with great you. Great to have and you. I will call you to come back. Mm, sure, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, Heard it before. <laughs> well, up next, folks, right here on GMA3, a moment we love around here, of course, our, one of our favorite segments here, Faith Friday. And look who we have here with us from Minneapolis, a good friend of the show, Reverend Angela Kabeb. She is in the building. Also, the woman revving up the holidays with her new Lifetime movie, Miracle in Motor City. Tia Mari will join us as well. Stay with us on this very special Friday, GMA3. being live is Please all about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by people no squeezing into this bomb shelter. Run, urgent delivery run. With Not them. afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Let's go. <laughs> Streaming straight to you anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. I risked my life. I put my family in danger. If I was caught, they would have put a bullet in my head. But it was the right thing to do. It was the only thing to do. Terror plot foiled in Garden City, Kansas. That would have been one of the most deadly acts of domestic terrorism ever in the United States. It would have been Oklahoma City. He put his family himself in jeopardy for us. Is that the gun? That's not the gun. What is it? I won't ask you again, then. Are you a Nazi? <laughs> the deeper you go into the black market, <laughs> the darker it gets. Why hasn't anyone come out and spoken? It's about the money. That's all we do.
never know what you're going to get on this show. That's all I'm going to tell you. Yes, Whoopi! Is this mic on? Can you hear me out there? Behind the scenes is always a better show. Absolutely. 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 That's what people don't see during the commercial breaks. Right. They don't. What happened? I had no idea really what I was getting myself into. That day that we walked out, I, I treasured that day. I just, I couldn't sit there. You're doing good, Joy. You're doing good. Oh, yeah, baby. It was crazy. Behind the table. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. This is American history, a violent white mob, a brutal attack. 300 black Americans killed right here in America. Now, it is time to uncover Tulsa's buried truth. The gripping story brought to light in a new podcast from ABC News. Available now on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. Now, with so much on the line, more Americans are turning to David Muir and ABC's World News Tonight than any other program across all of television. This is American history, a violent white mob, a brutal attack, 300 black Americans killed right here in America. Now, it is time to uncover Tulsa's buried truth, the gripping story brought to light in a new podcast from ABC News, available now on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. Welcome I'm back to GMA3, everybody. You know it as our favorite segment of the week, Face Friday here. And look who we have in studio with us. Yes, you probably know uh, this face. You've seen it plenty here. Friends of the show here at GMA3. Uh, but since the murder of George Floyd, she has faithfully provided support and words of healing to our audience and her congregation, Holy Trinity Lutheran Church in Minneapolis. So it is so good Reverend Angela Kabev, to have you, not just back on the show, but in studio. Always good to have your presence, your voice, but your energy uh, is just so delightful. How are you doing? Thank you. I'm doing pretty good. Doing How, pretty good. How's your community doing? We, we spent so much time talking about the murder of George Floyd, the, the Chauvin trial, the uh, sentencing, um, but it's been a, a long period of healing in Minneapolis. How, how are you all doing? You know, healing is a journey. Mm. Nothing is instantaneous with, when it comes to coming back from such a deep tragedy. So there are still three officers who have not been sentenced. And also, we're not an island. We see these cases unfolding around the nation, mm -hmm. right? So we are still reeling from what's going on around our country. So it's a slow process. And our the George Floyd Memorial Square is now open. Mm -hmm. So that sacred spot is no longer uh, uh, reverend, reverent. It's just open. So, mm -hmm. so it, it, it's a journey. It's, it's a lot of back and forth. You know, it sounds like a long way to go. Long uh, way to still, go. Still, but you've been a part of it from the very beginning, and your church has been very involved in the community. I know this is something you're incredibly proud of. And how, how have you all continued to help rebuild? Oh my goodness, our church is is trying to move toward the theology of abundance. Mm. And so we have received um, a, a, a generous windfall, if you will, from the sale of a property. And so we are doing all we can to help rebuild the neighborhood that was nearly decimated after the uprising. So we're making a conscious effort to rebuild uh, uh, BIPOC businesses that were uh, harmed and immigrant businesses and to increase generational wealth. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't stop working. You've been at it uh, and I know you are not going to stop. Uh, it's been so great having you on, um, really, over the past uh, couple years now here at the show. You've been such a friend of the show, but you know this is the moment where, Faith Friday, we hand it over to our guest. And as we're going into the weekend and really going into the holidays, and a word of encouragement and hope going into the weekend. The floor is yours. So, you know, hey. We have the whole nation, the whole world even, we've been through a crazy 18 months, mm. not knowing what to expect. So hey, give yourself a break. <laughs> it's okay if the turkey is a little dry or the cookies <laughs> don't get baked or we don't get to see all of our relatives. Cause you know, a couple of them you don't want to see no right way, there. okay? <laughs> so all those things are okay. It's okay if we don't uh, agree on the politics. It's okay if this side is not vaccinated and that's a, all of that is okay. What we should hold on to is that we have hope and our hope is indestructible. It's bulletproof. It cannot be buried. It always resurrects. For people of faith, hope is like oxygen and we should inhale deeply. <laughs> and all God's people said, 
Amen. Amen. You know what? We, we don't get to do this usually because you're, you're remote. Um, but where is our shoe cam, everybody? Where is the shoe cam? Well, when, you know, when you I really walked should. out here, she, she didn't even want me to make eye contact. She mm -mm. said, look at my feet, son. That's right. <laughs> the Bible it. says beautiful are the feet of the one that bring good news. Uh, where, where, is, where is that in the Bible? Uh, it is. Where is it? It's in where? the Bible. I believe what, it's what, Isaiah. What, uh, you, oh, I'm so serious oh, really? right now. I am so serious right uh, now. I thought she's making Look it up, baby. Person. Beautiful. Okay. All right. It's the truth. <laughs> this is why we love her. You are so real. You are so <laughs> wonderful. I love your energy here all the time. It's good to have you in studio. My pleasure. All right, My everybody. Pleasure. That's Reverend Angela <laughs> Cabell. It's good to have you. Well, up next on GMA3, when we come back, Motown's leading role in his new Lifetime movie star, Tia Maury, is here to tell us about it. Stay with us here on GMA3, folks. We are right back. Ah, uh, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> It was an extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed to